Section 1 of Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morell. Section number one, introduction by Sir Harry H. Johnston. In June 1905, I took the chair very unwillingly at an important meeting held by the Congo Reform Association, which was intended to bring before the British public the need for a drastic reform in the government of the Congo Free State. My unwillingness was due at that time partly to a belief that the King of the Belgians, not having then received the full report of his committee of inquiry, was still loath to believe in the results of his commercial policy, and in the effect produced on the natives of the Congo by the methods which his officials adopted to produce a revenue. Also I entered the arena of strife with great reluctance, because I realized that our own past colonial history, and that of other European nations in Africa, was very far from being stainless. And on the other hand, I had known Belgians on the Congo, and had seen them at work, whose efforts to introduce stable and civilized government were altogether praiseworthy. I was unwilling to join in any movement which might be directed against Belgium or Belgian enterprise, and only accepted the disagreeable position of chairman at this meeting because I was perhaps the only survivor of the band of Congo explorers who, between 1879 and 1884, had visited the interior Congo regions, and had seen them when they were utterly uninfluenced by the white men, and before and after they had been threatened with Arab domination. My attitude at the meeting in question was that of one desiring to find a way out of a difficult position for a sovereign whose name was still associated in my memory with some of the best intentions ever expressed on paper regarding Africa. Not long afterwards, the report of the King's Sovereign's Commission was issued. Whether the report was published exactly as sent in by the commissioners is open to question, but taking it in the form in which it received the imprimatur of King Leopold himself, it was a sufficient justification of the accusations leveled at the Congo Free State by Mr. Morel, by various British missionaries and travelers, and by Swedes, Frenchmen, and Italians. But in Owen's desire to judge as charitably as possible a man who might have been misled, one saw that a logical corollary to the publication of this report would be an attempt made by King Leopold to sweep away a system which has been one of the most shocking, one of the few shocking results of white intervention in Negro Africa. A year has passed since the publication of this report, and creditable testimony tends rather to show that the evils complained of in Congo territories have been intensified, while the direct utterances of the King of the Belgians on the subject of his work on the Congo are deplorable in their sardonic indifference to the real condition of the natives of the great African Dominion which Europe entrusted to his charge. So far as I am aware, if Mr. Morel had consulted his own interests, he would never have undertaken, and he certainly would not have maintained, his long crusade against the work of the Congo Free State. Neither was it to the interest of the English Baptist missionaries to put before the world the damning evidence they have supplied on the evils of Congo Free State government. In the early stages of their mission, I can speak as an eyewitness, they afforded the infant Congo state the most wholehearted support. When I first visited the western regions of the Congo, it was in the days of dawning imperialism, when most young Britishers abroad could conceive of no better fate for an undeveloped country than to come under the British flag. The outcome of Stanley's work seemed to me clear. It should be eventually the Britannicizing of much of the Congo basin, perhaps in friendly agreement and partition of interests with France and Portugal. But Stanley himself was working really toward the creation of a larger Liberia, and the secretary of his committee, the Belgian Colonel Strouch, like his compatriot Colonel Wavermans, was eagerly in favor of this international solution of the question. With them again sided the Baptist missionaries, Comer, Grenfell, and Bentley, who anticipated troubles and bloodshed arising from any attempt on the part of Great Britain to subdue the vast and unknown regions of the Congo, not even then clearly threatened by Arabs. They indeed resented the coming of the French or of the Portuguese. 
a larger liberia devised on more practical lines was the ideal which they believed the king of the belgians was pursuing as a pure philanthropist it was known that the king by shrewd investments in the suez canal shares and in other directions had made by most respectable methods a considerable fortune he had also spoken publicly of devoting the money that had belonged to his dead son to some noble purpose in the world he had in fact attempted the regeneration of negro africa by a kind of international board before stanley's discovery of the congo one of his agents captain storms had reached tanganyika and had effected wonders in arming the natives against the arab slave traders the work of storms had been most generously appreciated by the missionaries of the london missionary society on tanganyika and news of it had just reached their colleagues of different denominations who were at work on the congo in short every one who was any one in the missionary world or in that section of london society devoted to philanthropic ideals such as the baroness burdett Coutts, the present earl grey cardinal manning sir harry verney sir william mckinnon decried any attempt on the part of great britain to import base commercial ambitions into the political settlement of equatorial africa and hailed king leopold as the man who would gradually raise the millions of central african negroes to a condition of peaceable self-government free on the one hand from the curse of the arab and on the other from the alcoholizing european these men of the baptist missions of america and great britain so frequently ranged themselves on the side of the congo free state in its early days that it must have cost them much to testify in later times against that form of government i wished on the occasion of the public meeting already referred to and i wish again in these few introductory words to testify to the good work which has been done by belgians in the congo free state and to disassociate the country of belgium from the odium with which her monarch is now regarded by educated people in europe africa and america the names of nihilus von gel urban coquelat hansons Mura, storms and many others with whom i was not personally acquainted should be recorded as those of men who attempted to do great things for the congo people and on whose records there has been no stain if there have been bad belgians on the congo there have been bad englishmen ruthless frenchmen pitiless swedes cruel danes unscrupulous italians belgium has only to bear the brunt of the movement which is now threatening the existence of the congo free state in its present form because the sovereign of that misgoverned state is also king of the belgians many of us have felt and still feel that when the king's autocratic rule as sovereign over this american dominion had been proved to be such an appalling blot on the history of european intervention in africa as to be no longer tolerated that the individual sacrifices made by belgium and by the belgian people should be recognized by the handing over of the congo free state to belgium as a belgian protectorate a region which belgium might endeavor to administer as england germany and portugal administer eastern africa and france england and portugal deal with western africa the creation of a huge independent african state in the basin of the congo is felt to be an impossibility in the present state of negro development in those regions to divide this vast country between the colonial dominions of the limitrophe powers might be productive of jealousy and other embarrassments belgium we thought fully deserved a share of the undeveloped surface of the earth as an outlet for her energies let her then said many take over the congo and govern it as a constitutional monarchy does govern a foreign dominion but it would seem as though belgium was unable to take up the burden either because her public men and institutions are too much under the control of the present sovereign or because she is not rich enough in men or money to undertake such a mighty task if this is the case then there would seem to be no escape from the present deadlock an international conference should once more be summoned to meet at berlin the hague or paris and the congo state must be remodeled by its original creators whatever its fate may be let us hope that it will not be an international enterprise there is as yet no international conscience though such a thing is beginning to come into existence the state of what is now the anglo-egyptian sudan under the nominal rule of the Kedives between eighteen fifty and eighteen eighty two was somewhat analogous to the present condition of the congo free state though the Kedive was titular lord 
the agents he employed to conquer and administer the basin of the nile were of many nationalities and their doings did not appeal singly to the conscience of any one state some of gordon's most trusted lieutenants relate in the reports of military action against the arab slave traders and their native following or against the independent native sultans of the bar al ghazal how their cannibal levies from regions which have subsequently furnished troops to the king of the belgians found their commissariat in the bodies of the slain many of the congo horrors were anticipated under the rule of british italian american french german greek and turkish officials in the pay of the egyptian Kedive. in like manner there has been no national conscience to appeal to other perhaps than that of belgium indirectly concerned in the government of the congo free state crimes and mistakes have been committed by the french in their adjoining territories some episodes in the early history of the uganda protectorate in the creation of rhodesia in sierra leone in ashanti have been written up in the world's ledger against great britain germany has had to reveal face and erase many a scandal in the cameroons in southwest and in east africa portugal is now confronted with serious charges against her administration of inner angola but in all these instances there is the conscience of a nation to appeal to the country at fault is one governed by constitutional methods and the voice of the people when once they are acquainted with the wrongdoing attributable to their fellow countrymen insists on amendment but in the case of the congo free state there is only one conscience to appeal to that of king leopold a conscience which seems indurated against evidence against shame against the terror of an immortality of bad renown i am still anxious that this question should be treated without hysterics let me say therefore for the consolation of any who may be wringing their hands over the present condition of the congo free state that the congo basin was not a region of ideal happiness and peace for the negro before the white man or the arab broke in upon the life of the stone age burst upon primitive peoples who had lost all contact with the caucasian for two thousand years before eighteen seventy nine the congo basin west of the longitude of stanley pool was a region fairly well populated by negroes in a very low state of civilization some like the pygmies had not left the hunter stage others were agriculturists and fishermen keeping few domestic animals and cultivating but few plants they were not so much subject as at the present day to the ravages of epidemics like smallpox and sleeping sickness because each cluster of villages each small tribe of a few thousand people was usually at war with the rest of the world and communications between one congeries of settlements and another were uncertain and interrupted it was in fact a region of isolated tribes and communities almost the whole of which except in the south were confirmed cannibals in the northern half of the congo free state incessant wars and slave raids took place not with a view to supplying labor but with the intention of obtaining wives and above all victims for the cannibal feasts in the southern half of the congo basin the slave trade was in full swing had been for one or two centuries prompted chiefly by the british portuguese and americans portuguese half-castes ranged right across the congo basin from angola to tanganyika and to the borders of what is now rhodesia through their supplies of guns and powder one tribe conquered another and empires were built up containing a degree of civilization approaching that of modern uganda cannibalism may have been wiped out by this rise in civilization but a slave trade for the supply of labor in distant countries took its place as an incentive to constant wars in advance in religious ideas accentuated cruelties connected with fetish practices and a belief in sorcery then of course many of the people lost their lives from the attacks of lions leopards elephants hippopotamuses and crocodiles no the condition of man in the congo basin was very far from a state of happiness before the arab penetrated those regions from the east coast and the european from the west the arabs did much to suppress cannibalism and to introduce a far higher standard of comfort and many important articles of food but they carried the ravages of the slave trade further and further depopulating a district before they settled it anew with their domestic slaves the king of the belgians stood forward as the champion of what was best in european civilization and all that was to regenerate this vast region of potential wealth 
too thickly inhabited by a vigorous race to be regarded as a no man's land and yet devoid of any indigenous government which could establish law and order it is no excuse for the evil doings of the congo free state that the congo basin was a land of much misery before king leopold took it in hand neither is it any palliative to point to the mistakes which the principal countries of europe have made in their attempt to better the african's condition on his own continent most of the countries of western and central europe embarked on african enterprises with no protestations of high philanthropy they wanted an outlet for their manufactures a colony for their superfluous population or a field for national aggrandizement i do not hesitate to say that the general results of their work even if it was undertaken from no higher motive have on the whole produced regions of greater happiness denser population and a higher standard of human life than could be ascribed to those portions of africa prior to european control but the genesis of the congo free state was vastly different from the general standpoint of the european partition of africa to judge of this one has only to read the speeches and letters of the king of the belgians himself between the years eighteen seventy five and eighteen ninety four over and over again he declared that his one object in entering on this african enterprise was disinterested at the outset he only desired to get back his out-of-pocket expenses if ever there was a portion of africa in which a ruler's private profits from state monopolies were precluded by an honourable adhesion to first principles it was the congo free state a few words as to the logic of my position as a critic of king leopold's rule on the congo i have been reminded in some of the publications issued by the congo government that i have instituted a hut tax in regions entrusted to my administration that i have created crown lands which have become the property of the government that as an agent of the government i have sold and leased portions of african soil to european traders that i have favoured or at any rate have not condemned the assumption of an african state of control over natural sources of wealth that i have advocated measures which have installed the european as the master for the time being over the uncivilized negro or the semi-civilized somali arab or berber all these charges may be true without the admission constituting any sort of apology for the results of twenty-one years of king leopold's government in the congo free state as regards the negro or any other backward race i am not a sentimentalist i have no pity in retrospect for the sufferings of the celtic and iberian inhabitants of great britain during their conquest by the romans i do not regret the norman remodelling of england these movements have done much to make the united kingdom one of the foremost amongst the civilized free nations the greater part of africa has got to submit to a similar discipline there are many tribes of negroes at the present day who are leading lives not much superior in intellectual advancement to those of brutes but there is not an existing race of men in africa that is not emphatically human and capable of improvement yet i do not think that they are to be improved by european tutors without some effort on their own part they should contribute reasonably and with due regard to the happiness of their own lives to the public resources of their country taxation which is not oppressive must be imposed if the adult native cannot pay his contribution in money he can furnish it in labor but the assessment of his contribution to the income of his own country must be strictly proportionate to his means in other words to that share of happiness and enjoyment in life to which he is entitled like any other human being the crown lands the control of which is assumed by the british government or by the government of any civilized state in africa are or should be administered first and foremost in the interest of the community in which they are situated for example revenue derived from the crown lands in british central africa or in uganda goes to meet the cost of the administration of those countries and the maintenance of law and order therein of the construction of public works the prevention of disease the improvement of communications the advancement of education the utmost gain to us that is derived from this administration of state monopolies is the easing of the pocket of the british taxpayer even if which is not the case the administration of these public lands gradually repaid to the british taxpayer the monies he has invested in founding these new protectorates i should think the principal an unjust one 
since a good deal of the work done by england france italy portugal and germany in africa has been purely philanthropic money and valuable lives have been spent in putting down devastating wars amongst the natives or in repelling cruel invaders like the arabs or the tarawek abyssinians or fulas a fairly safe and happy existence has been guaranteed to the natives of the soil and it is only fair that by degrees the resources of these countries should provide the means for the upkeep of a civilized government which more and more is tending to become the native government of those countries where the land is absolutely waste land without indigenous human inhabitants i have counted it no sin that such a wilderness should be allotted to foreign settlers of our own or of any other race seeking a home beyond the seas but i do count it a sin to oust one race to put another in its place unless and until any such race has shown itself the foe of humanity in general but the crown lands the public forests the natural resources of the congo free state instead of being administered as a national fund for the maintenance and improvement of that state and the promotion of the welfare of its inhabitants are actually diverted to the personal profit of king leopold and some of his associates it is this that is the inherently false principle in the scheme of the congo free state the public revenues collected from these regions are not publicly accounted for the danger in this state of affairs lies in the ferment of hatred which is being created against the white race in general by the agents of the king of the belgians in the mind of the congo negroes the negro has a remarkable keen sense of justice he recognizes in british central africa in east africa in nigeria and south africa in togoland dahomey the gold coast sierra leone and Senegambia, that on the whole though the white men ruling in those regions have made some mistakes and committed some crimes have been guilty of some injustice yet that the state of affairs they have brought into existence as regards the black man is one infinitely superior to that which preceded the arrival of the white man as a temporary ruler therefore though there may be a rising here or a partial tumult there the mass of the people increase and multiply with content and acquiesce in our tutelary position were it otherwise any attempt at combination on their part would soon overwhelm us and extinguish our rule why in the majority of cases the very soldiers with whom we keep them in subjection are of their own race but unless some stop can be put to the misgovernment of the congo regions i venture to warn those who are interested in african politics that a movement has already begun and is spreading fast which will unite the negroes against the white race a movement which will prematurely stamp out the beginnings of the new civilization we are trying to implant and against which movement except so far as the actual coastline is concerned the resources of men and money which europe can put into the field will be powerless h h johnston end of section one Section 2 of Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo by Edmund Denny Morell. Section number 2. Preface to the Second Edition in concluding the preface to the first edition of this volume i asked will the british public which in the ultimate resort has compelled exposure of a crime unparalleled in the annals of the world compel the cessation of that crime nothing which has taken place since is of a nature to induce me to alter that question which dominates the situation the belgian parliamentary debate is not over as i write these lines and it may possibly reserve some surprises for us but i doubt it the cabinet that is the king will triumph probably even though the majority may be very small and what is the policy of the king it was laid down by monsieur de smet de Nair on the opening day of the discussion the belgian government may begin the discussion during the present session of the annexation bill which monsieur de smet de Nair deposited in the government pigeonholes in 1901 
the government will take into consideration the question of discussing details as to transfer with the congo state but it will only do so when it thinks the time has come for that preliminary negotiation precisely we are where we were before if the debate closes on those lines with this exception that british diplomacy will have received yet another rebuff at the hands of the sovereign of the congo state who has declared that in regard to annexation he has nothing to say at present the debate threatens to close with an unending vista of procrastination and meanwhile as the times which has been doing a real service to the cause of the helpless congo natives by the very full reports of its continental correspondence and by its able leaders says the part of regular mystification played upon the belgian people and upon europe continues after a careful perusal of the many reviews which have appeared on this book i see no reason to modify one line of what it contains notably in regard to the last chapter in which i sketch out the action which great britain is able to adopt one or two papers appear in doubt as to the practical value of establishing councillor courts the alarm expressed at the suggestion by the henchmen in parliament and in the press of the sovereign of the congo state should induce them to alter their views above all things this is what the sovereign of the congo state dreads and fears caveat councils it is the one decisive step synonymous with a firm declaration of policy of the kind below mentioned which will break the back of the atrocious system he is introduced on the congo and he knows it well far from being a mere irritant as it has been somewhere said councillor jurisdiction would be the first plank in the constructive policy of the future which is absolutely required by the circumstances of the case as i have said in this volume other signatory powers to the act of the west african conference of berlin possess the same right and were we to accompany our exercises of it with a clear intimation that we should rejoice if other powers did likewise what could other powers say by way of protest the treaty moreover which confers upon us this right is a treaty of our own with king leopold no other power is concerned in it for the rest i can only repeat here what i have stated in this book until some power or powers insists upon the integral application in the congo of the fundamental principles of the berlin conference principles which obtain everywhere in the african tropics except by a strange irony in that vast portion of them to which the act applies the horrors of the congo will continue on an ever-increasing scale whether under the congo or under the belgian flag the congo native like the native of every part of the african tropics must be protected in his rights in land property and labor all those rights have been swept away from him by the most colossal act of spoliation ever imagined by mortal man the right of trading freely in the produce of his soil and in the fruits of his labor must be restored to him what is trade surely it is the most elementary function of humanity we are all traders in one form or another it is the right to dispose of one's labor it is the recognition of the possession of property it is the essential basis of economics it is the common link which unites all the branches of the human family to remove from a primitive community the right to trade is to strangle forever the economic development of that community to reduce it to perpetual sterility or to enslave it but king leopold has done this he has done so juridically by claiming that a state which he calls his enterprise is empowered to appropriate the entire merchantable products of the land in which the citizens of that state dwell and in practice by appropriating the entire labor of the country for the juridical claim is worthless without its practical accompaniment in this manner he has destroyed the normal or commercial relationship between the european and the negro throughout the congo valley he has reduced juridically the millions of natives inhabiting it from possessors of merchantable products and from ownership over their own labor 
to tenants upon his property he has reduced them in practice wherever he has been able to enforce his claim to things mere things chattels of his own articles of potential value for himself his partners and his heirs and in so doing he has enslaved the whole population for what motive power remains with which to acquire the products of the congo except compulsion since the commercial relationship has been eliminated with the claim to prior possession over those products and how can compulsion be exercised in the african tropics save by arming one black man and stationing him with a loaded rifle in his hand over his unarmed brother of this conception one of the most experienced of west african legislators and administrators has said and said truly that it requires a soldier behind every producer i repeat again and yet again that until the congo native is reinstalled in the right enjoyed by all black men under european overlordship in tropical africa outside the congo basin to buy and sell with the european which necessitates the restoration of his rights of land tenure and the disposal of his labor there will be no change in his lot surely if this great truth is burned into the brains and hearts of our countrymen we can afford to disregard the taunt of working for material ends and the taunt of interested motives launched at us by the subsidized organs of the leopoldian press bureau British interests in this connection mean nothing more than the right provided under the Berlin Conference for the subjects of Britain, as for the subjects of the fourteen contracting powers, neither more nor less, of commercial intercourse with the natives of the Congo. If that commercial intercourse is re-established between the natives and Europeans of every nationality, Americans and Asiatics, and, if you like, South Sea Islanders, the inhabitant of the congo ceases to be a slave in his own home and becomes once more a man with a man's rights because with its re-establishment the inhabitant of the congo enters once more into his own is once more owner of his land of its produce which he alone can gather and of his labor what the british government will do i do not know as to what ought to be done i have no doubt whatever the government should proclaim before all the world its unshakable determination to repudiate absolutely and entirely these claims to the land the produce of the soil and the labor of the congo natives set up by king leopold it should decline before the world to even discuss any pretensions founded upon such impossible and utterly immoral claims it should declare them to be a negation of the most vulgar conceptions of civilized and uncivilized usage opposed to all the legitimate interests of commercial nations and a violation of the berlin act it should declare its unalterable determination not to recognize these claims in practice when the legitimate interests of british subjects white or black in the congo or in the territories adjacent to it are affected by them and coupled with these declarations it should provide in the shape of an increased councillor staff furnished with powers of jurisdiction and with independent means of conveyance the machinery whereby its declarations can in practice be rendered effective in so doing it would have a united nation at its back and what is the power which could or would oppose us in this matter there is not one which could do so without repudiating the signatures of its own representatives to the act of berlin there is not one which could advance the shadow of a moral right or a material interest against such a policy the legitimate material interests of all the commercial and industrial communities in the world would be served by such action on our part including that of belgium the fear of foreign complications is a bogey which would only become a substance if england developed territorial ambitions and it may be safely said that not one solitary human being in this country entertains such an idea at the conclusion of sir harry johnston's introductory note to this volume that eminent authority has given a clear and definite warning to the governing statesmen of the world as to the consequences which will ensue if the present system remains in force on the congo 
it may be specially recommended to those among us who are inclined to falter and hang back at the slightest signs of international friction accompanying positive action on the part of england those of us who are essentially men of peace and all honor to such i venture to remind those men that the continuance of the present system is synonymous with the carrying of desolating war throughout the congo basin in conclusion i would also venture to utter a note of warning at the present moment this huge evil is comparatively easy to deal with the longer action is delayed the greater the perils of eventual interference and interference must come it is utterly impossible that matters can remain as they are by bold courageous straightforward action now the evil can be cauterized if action is long delayed what is today an african question may tomorrow become a european question as well let our governing statesmen be well assured of this there is in the atmosphere of england at this moment a singular determination to liberate with god's help the natives of the congo from their unspeakable bondage and to save europe from shame of tolerating by consent the revival under worse forms of the african slave trade it is a force to reckon with it is a force which finds expression in these words of the bishop of southwark words noble and true on the attitude and action of this country in reference to the congo will depend in a great degree england's own moral future the statesmen who comprehended this feeling of determination based not upon unreasoning sentimentalism but upon a sober realization of responsibilities historically incurred upon the clearest common sense and the soundest political wisdom would create for himself in the annals of this country an immortality to paraphrase sir harry johnston of good renown next march marks the centenary of the passage through both houses of parliament of the total abolition of slavery bill the statesman who introduced that bill into the house of commons was lord howard first earl grey and sir edward grey is that nobleman's collateral descendant e d morell how warden december first nineteen o six postscript december eighth as the belgian debate proceeds we observe a perpetual insistence upon the king's sovereign rights over the congo the nature of those sovereign rights is strictly defined and limited by international treaties the interpretations he has since placed upon them are the very negation of those definitions and limitations End of section two. Section 3 of Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo by Edmund Dene Morel. Section 3, Author's Preface this book is written with the object of putting into the hands of the british public at a cost which places it within the reach of many a brief and up-to-date narrative of the congo tragedy avoiding side issues and dealing with the main features of the story much of it will be new to all save those who have followed the congo question as students and even as regards the latter it is hoped that the cumulative force of recent revelations here presented in their natural sequence may lead to an even clearer perception of the problem a crisis in this history has arrived the report of the commission of inquiry wrung from king leopold by the pressure of british public opinion professor cotier's volume and the five days debate on these two publications which took place last february in the belgian house of representatives have removed the last doubts which remained as to the accuracy of the charges publicly brought against the personal uncontrolled and unfettered management of the congo territories by king leopold contention as to facts has disappeared the controversial stage has in that respect gone forever the truth in all its international dangers its greed its 
disordered ambitions above everything in its horror stands out naked will the british public which in the ultimate resort has compelled exposure of a crime unparalleled in the annal of the world compel the cessation of that crime it has the driving force to do so if it will e d morell hawarden october nineteen o six End of section three. Section four of Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mickey Lee Rich. Red Rubber, The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morrell, Section 4 The History from Behind the Veil How came England to be mixed up in this Congo business? How did King Leopold come to hold the position he now does? How is it that all this oppression and atrocity has only begun to be realized within a comparatively recent period by the general public? Those are three questions which are constantly being asked us. Detailed answers to the first two are to be found in one or two publications. They will be restated here. The answer to the third question is a more difficult and a somewhat delicate one to handle, but as a great deal of misconception exists on the subject, misconception which has done harm to the cause of the Congo natives here at home, and especially abroad, it seems advisable to deal with it frankly and at once, not from the standpoint of the critic, but from that of the recorder of facts. People who suppose that the atrocities of King Leopold's African enterprise are a relatively new phase in the history of that enterprise are mistaken. But the mistake is natural. Those atrocities have been recorded in one unbroken stream since 1892 and even earlier, but they have not, in the main, been publicly accessible until recently. Slowly have they emerged into the light. Some are still coming out. Others continue to be hidden. Nothing even approximating to the whole truth will ever be known. The reasons for this are various. Parliamentary apathy, comprehensible from the absence of information. Sir Charles Dilk, who as everyone knows, takes a deep interest in the welfare of the African races, brought the general treatment of those races, and especially the Congo races, before Parliament in April 1897. He suggested an international conference and was supported by Mr. Sidney Buxton, Sir George Baden-Powell, and Mr. John Dillon. From then to the great debate in May 1903, a space of six years, I cannot find that the Congo was mentioned in Parliament otherwise than by some chance and rare question and answer. The Attitude of the British Government In that interval, the British government received a number of reports from British officials and officers in or adjacent to the Congo, both as regards the general treatment of the natives in the country and as regards the treatment of British colored subjects employed in different capacities on the Congo. So numerous were the latter reports that a year previous to Sir Charles Dilke's early initiative, Mr. Chamberlain, replying to Mr. J. A. Pease, stated in the House that he had prohibited the recruiting of laborers by King Leopold's agents in the British West African colonies. The nature of the reports may be gauged from Mr. Chamberlain's own words. Complaints have been received of these British subjects having been employed without their consent as soldiers, and of their having been cruelly flogged and in some cases shot. I have been told, and I believe the statement is true, that Mr. Chamberlain, as a consequence of the frequency and nature of these reports, did his utmost to induce the cabinet, but without success, to assume the rights of extraterritoriality on the Congo secured to Great Britain under the convention with King Leopold of 1884. In its notes to the powers of August 8, 1903, arising out of the resolution passed by Parliament in the May debate, the government referred to both classes of reports. The note says, Moreover, information which has reached His Majesty's government from British officers in territory adjacent to that of the state tends to show that notwithstanding the obligations accepted under Article 2 of the Berlin Act, no attempt at any administration of the native is made, and that officers of the government do not apparently concern themselves with such work, but devote all their energy to the collection of revenue. 
The natives are left entirely to themselves so far as any assistance in their government or in their affairs are concerned. Begin footnote. That is to say, assistance in their own internal administration. End footnote. The Congo stations are shunned, the only natives being seen soldiers, prisoners, and men who are brought into work. The neighborhood of stations, which are known to have been populous a few years ago, is now uninhabited, and the immigration on a large scale takes place to the territory of neighboring states, the natives usually averring that they are driven away from their homes by the tyranny and exaction of the soldiers. In connection with British colored subjects, the note, after referring to the disadvantage under which His Majesty's government have further labored, owing to the fact that British interests have not justified the maintenance of a large consular staff in the Congo territories, goes on to state that a consul of wide African experience, Mr. Casement, was appointed to reside permanently in the state, but that his time had been principally occupied in the investigation of complaints preferred by British subjects, and that he had not been able, therefore, to travel in the interior for the purpose of studying the general condition of the natives of the country. Mr. Casement's advices, the note proceeds, disclosed in connection with these complaints, examples of grave maladministration and ill-treatment occurring in the immediate vicinity of Boma, the seat of the central staff. The whole of these official reports were suppressed lock, stock, and barrel, and they have never been made public, although Mr. Alfred Emmett pressed for the production in the parliamentary debate of 1904. Begin footnote. I should say here that Mr. Alfred Emmett and Mr. Herbert Samuel have rendered the greatest services to the cause of the Congo natives. Humanity owes them a great debt of gratitude. End footnote. The British government contented itself with making private representations to King Leopold through H.M. Minister in Brussels, the farcical Commission for the Protection of the Natives, and sundry bogus judicial reforms, coupled with an intensified period of oppression being the sole results. The Silence of the Missionary Societies As will be shown in Section 2 of this volume, there had been an accumulating in the decade 1892 to 1902 in some of the Protestant mission stations of the Upper Congo records of a comprehensible and appalling character. Enough information was available to have stormed every religious platform in this country. The home executives of the missionary societies took no public action. However, and for many years one Congo missionary, and one only, dared to confront with the righteous indignation of a spirit stung to passionate anger by the fearful evidence of his own eyes, King Leopold's agents in Africa, and King Leopold himself in Europe. He was a Swede. His name was Hia Bloom, and he stands out an apostolic figure in those early days. His pendant of later times in energy and determination is John Harris and Mrs. Harris, of whose courage in Africa and self-sacrifice in Europe it would be impossible to speak too highly. Two other missionaries followed in his footsteps, a Virginian and an Irish-American. With those three exceptions, no missionary appears to have given expression to his experiences in a form available to the general public until October 1903 when Mr. J. H. Weeks, with whom I had come in touch through a mutual friend, sent me the first of his powerful communications. A number complained locally to the officials and did and have always done all they could do for the natives. The home executives, or some of them, made private representations to King Leopold. So far as the Roman Catholic missions are concerned, neither the home executives nor the missionaries on the field made any public statement until this year after the publication of the report of the Commission of Inquiry. We know now that some of the Roman Catholic missionaries, like some of the Protestant brethren, complained locally to the officials. The home executives may have made representation to the king. Begin footnote. That great pressure was brought to bear upon the Roman Catholic missionaries to keep silence is not, I think, doubtful. Speaking in the Belgian house in March 1st, M. Kolfs, a Catholic member of the Parliament, said, Our missionaries are expected to keep silence, as the Bien public has so well put it, optimistic statements are alone tolerated from them. There is therefore a gag. The gag is only placed in the mouths of Belgian missionaries, and it was to ensure this result that the Congo state urged the Vatican to agree that Catholic evangelization on the Congo should be confined exclusively to Belgium. 
This utterance is the more notable since M. Kolfs was the spokesman in the debate of the religious missions. End footnote. From the end of 1903, when the testimony of British and American missionaries became continuous, detailed, and insistent, the organs of the Roman Catholic missions and the Roman Catholic religious press generally attacked the former with great bitterness. This attitude was dictated by the Vatican Direct, doubtless under the influence of King Leopold's assurances that the British movement disguised an attack upon the Roman Catholic Church, a legend which the king's agents were particularly active in propagating through the Roman Catholic world in the United States. Begin footnote. When in the fall of 1904 I visited the United States with the dual mission of addressing the International Peace Conference at Boston on the Congo question and presenting a memorial to President Roosevelt signed by a number of public bodies and influential public men, which mission I carried out, I found myself, greatly to my astonishment, opposed by Cardinal Gibbons, head of the Roman Catholic Church in that country. The open correspondence which passed between His Eminence and myself is published in the official organ of the Congo Reform Association for November 1904. End footnote. This attitude was maintained until the appearance of the report of the Commission, when it underwent a complete change, at least as regards the Belgian religious orders and organs. I have said that this is not a criticism, but a statement of fact and I pass no opinion on the silence thus observed, either in defense or stricture, contenting myself with the remark that, as in the case of the British government, it delayed by many years the manifestation of the truth. Begin footnote. The Italian government also possesses an enormous number of reports from its officers in the Congo army, but they are of more recent date. The German, French, Danish, and Swedish governments also possess reports. End footnote. King Leopold's Active Opponents Until the parliamentary debate of May 1903 found all political parties so impressed with unofficial testimony and exposition as to be united in demanding from the British government a definite invitation to the powers for the convocation of the International Conference, the active opponents of the existing regime on the Congo were to all intents and purposes the Aborigines Protection Society and myself. Who says Aborigines Protection Society? Says Mr. H. R. Fox Bourne. So that there were only two men really to reckon with. When Mr. Fox Bourne, under the auspices of his society, organized a public meeting at the Mansion House in 1902 and to hear the American missionary Morrison in 1903, he could always count upon Sir Charles Dilk, whose pen was not inactive in the cause, and other distinguished members of the society. But the persistent hammering at the public, without which no movement can hope to make headway, and indispensable individual proselytizing, this was left almost entirely to Mr. Foxborn and myself. Mr. Foxborn a long way ahead in point of time, for I only came on the scene in 1899 or 1900 while he, tired of making representations to King Leopold, had approached the British government in the name of his society as far back as 1896. Mutually convinced of one another's integrity and purpose, but working on wholly independent and slightly different lines, we were terribly handicapped. Begin footnote. Mr. Fox Bourne, emphasizing more particularly perhaps the atrocious nature of the deeds committed, while my endeavor from the first was to show that given certain premises, the repudiation of native rights in land and in the produce of soil and the destruction of trade as the basic factor in a relationship between the European and the native in tropical Africa, of which this repudiation was the logical accompaniment those deeds must of necessity take place. End footnote. The name of Foxborn is synonymous with unselfish devotion on behalf of subject races which cannot protect themselves. But I shall not, I feel sure, be causing offense if I submit that the Aborigines Protection Society is not a public body in the enjoyment of very wide popular support. It is respected by a number and disliked probably by a much larger number. As for myself, I was known only in a restricted circle through occasional signed articles on African questions, which I used at the time to contribute to the Pall Mall Gazette chiefly. The odds were therefore severe. We had against us a king who was a multimillionaire with a then misguided nation at his back and all that this implies, and 
a government at home which did not want to be bothered, whose policy had been a policy of silence. It was perfectly natural for the public to approach the terrible charges launched at the Congo state with a skepticism, proof against all but the most overwhelming demonstration. That skepticism had to be overcome, and that demonstration made step by step, by slow, laborious, and painful degrees, while the forces at work to stop it grew in activity and unscrupulousness with its progression. The marvel is that headway was made at all. That success attended these efforts is owing in the main to the British press, for whose support I have been personally indebted beyond words, especially when the campaign of charges, innuendo, and vilification against myself was set on foot by King Leopold's press bureau, and editorial offices were flooded with the most extraordinary fabrications concerning a humble and unknown individual, dragged by the force of circumstances into a notoriety that was anything but welcome. Begin footnote. I was the head of, or the agent of, a syndicate of rubber merchants, jealous because the rubber from the Congo went to Antwerp instead of Liverpool. The tool of the British government, which masked territorial ambition behind my agitation, a vulgar adventurer with a shady past seeking notoriety, the possessor of large sums of money wherewith I bribed witnesses to manufacture stories of atrocity, an unsuccessful blackmailer, etc., etc. End footnote. Consul Casement's famous report published early in 1904 and the mass of missionary evidence which was then coming to hand suggested to my mind the formation of an association which could concentrate its energies upon one direct and simple issue, that of thrusting the Congo question to the front rank among international problems in urgent need of solution, and which could on those lines not only combine all individual effort, but appeal to a wide public on a platform divorced from politics, creed, or even nationality. This association came into being with Earl Beaucamp, its first president, in April 1904. Footnote. Mr. Alfred Emmett, Mr. John Holt, Dr. Guinness, head of the Congo Balalo Mission, and two other personal friends gave me their early and invaluable assistance. End footnote. This plain and unvarnished recapulation of events will, I venture to hope, suffice with the summarized evidence in Section 2 to clear up some points which have remained obscure to the majority. End of Section 4, The History from Behind the Veil Recorded by Mickey Lee Rich. Section 5 of Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morell. Section 5. The History. What Britain Did. As to the question of the natives, the whole anti-slavery world has been swindled by the administration of the Congo Free State. Right Honorable Sir Charles W. Dilke, Baronet, MP, September 1903. I now propose to deal as briefly as the subject permits with the two first questions placed at the head of the last chapter. In the sixties and seventies of the last century, Central Africa, which had been a closed book to the world, became the scene of notable exploring feats which excited in the highest degree the scientific, commercial, and political interests of the Western powers. To the scientists in geographical and ethnological research, an immense field for activity loomed upon the horizon. To the commercial nations was suddenly revealed enormous possibilities in the creation of new markets, and that revelation was accompanied by a desire, especially among the protectionist powers, to acquire as much of the African El Dorado as possible as an outlet for their own manufactures. This desire led to what has been termed the scramble for Africa. England, France, and Portugal were owners of African territory already. Germany and Italy became attracted by the African magnet. And so did King Leopold II, constitutional monarch of Belgium, which since 1831 had become a separate kingdom, owing primarily to the action of Great Britain, 
who led the way in recognizing the series of events resulting in the secession of the southern provinces of the netherlands from holland king leopold's imperialistic tendencies were at that time regarded without approval by the belgian people of all the exploring feats which had caused the western world to focus its gaze upon central africa stanley's discovery of the congo was the most sensational and in that direction king leopold bent his steps he formed a company styled the international african association and sent several investigating expeditions at his own expense into the congo region mostly commanded by englishmen and germans taking particular care to assure the world that his intentions were purely scientific and severely disinterested france dispatched de Braza to the congo region on a political mission of a definite character and portugal revived her historical claims to the territory lying behind her possession of angola king leopold's plans were not nearly so altruistic as he professed and fearing that they would be checkmated either by france or by portugal he appealed privately to england for support what was the position of the king's international african association at that period it was a private enterprise anxious to secure international sympathies and calling itself international to that end whose managing director was nursing political and other ambitions from the standpoint of international law it had no status whatsoever while conducting a long private correspondence with lord granville working american opinion through mr henry sanford united states minister at brussels and canvassing by various means the different european courts king leopold was meanwhile posing before the world as the self-appointed philanthropist and savior of the african race he proposed to convert his association into a state with freedom as its watchword thus providing a neutral field for the legitimate activity of all commercial nations whence rivalry should be de facto excluded and where the native would benefit by the blessings of even-handed justice and good government he repudiated with scorn the very notion of pursuing material ends either for himself or for belgium which in point of fact continued to view these schemes on the part of her monarch with distaste and apprehension so admirably did the king play his cards that public opinion was captivated the king captured the british chamber of commerce by declaring that if the british commercial community supported his proposals the congo trade would be free to all the world and would be exempt from such irritating restrictions as for instance characterized portuguese fiscal policy the chambers plumped for king leopold he captured the protestant missionary societies of england and the united states by his fervid philanthropic protestations and his promise to give every conceivable support to their propaganda the protestant missionary societies plumped for king leopold he captured the aborigines protection society of which he became a member and the philanthropic world of great britain entire what was the attitude of the british government sir robert morier had some years before submitted a scheme to lord beaconsfield to place the congo river under some form of international control on the model of the danube navigation committee according to this scheme great britain was to recognize the claims of portugal northwards from ambris to the southern bank of the congo while the northern bank was to become british lord beaconsfield did not favor it and when in eighteen seventy five council lieutenant cameron issued a proclamation on his own initiative taking possession of the basin of the congo his action was repudiated by lord carnarvon portugal whose explorers had discovered the lower congo in the fifteenth century which had spent large sums in the coastal regions north and south of the river was the only power which historically speaking could lay claim to political rights in the congo basin she was our old ally and she was pressing ardently for british support the british cabinet entertained the greatest objection to the placing of protectionist france with her hostile tariffs directed at british trade in control of the mighty congo basin and lord granville did not believe in king leopold hence a friendly ear was turned to the portuguese proposals mr gladstone wrote to lord granville december eighteen eighty three i should be disposed to yield to the portuguese proposal still with the intention of appropriating no exclusive advantage 
those proposals were that great britain should recognize the sovereignty of portugal on both banks of the river up to a certain limit inland and to draw an interior line which without expressly limiting portuguese sovereignty forever in those regions would put an end to the indefinite extension of her ancient claims leaving the interior to be dealt with by conventions from time to time it was proposed to declare the river open to the trade of the world and to place it under an anglo-portuguese navigation commission to which the accession of the great powers would be welcome these proposals were accepted clauses were introduced protecting international trade against exaggerated tariffs protecting religious teachings of whatever denomination and the rights of the native chiefs of the coast who had concluded treaties with british consuls and merchants and the treaty was signed but king leopold had not been playing to the gallery for nothing the treaty was denounced by the british chambers of commerce and by the british philanthropic world the british government was accused of betraying national interests the portuguese government was accused by its subjects of a similar crime france encouraged by the clamour in england fanned into stronger flame by stanley's impassioned diatribes took up an attitude of resolute hostility and bismarck who in a fit of spleen had flung himself into competition with england on the dark continent and who desired on the other hand to keep french eyes from the rhenish frontier was only too glad to kill two birds with one stone by administering a sly kick at the anglo-portuguese instrument france was now seemingly the mistress of the situation and central africa ran the risk so thought the british government of becoming a french preserve whence foreign trade would be barred this great britain wished to prevent king leopold quickly realized the danger from his point of view and stanley acting on his behalf renewed the advances previously made to lord granville the only course left open to the british government was to support the king's enterprise but mistrusting the scheme and foreseeing its dangers lord granville determined to bind down the new state by conditions as stringent as those in the defunct anglo-portuguese treaty to secure freedom of trade and the protection of the natives bismarck's proposal for an international conference on west african affairs was assented to End of section five. Section six of Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morel. The History The International African Association recognition was accorded not to the congo state but to an association professing an international character and proclaiming before the world as the object of its being not the accumulation of rubber at the infinite cost of human life and suffering but to the protection and civilization of the natives of africa lord percy 1904 on october twenty first eighteen eighty four stanley on behalf of king leopold communicated to the british public a manifesto on behalf of the international african association it is a long document in it the association states that the sole object is to enable commerce to follow the association's advance into inner equatorial africa and announces that the sympathy and recognition of the government of the united states have been secured on these grounds throughout the congo states over which the association will exercise supervision the european merchant may freely enter into commercial negotiation with the natives absolute freedom of trade is ensured the association proposes to govern these native states on the congo on the principles of law recognized by civilized nations and upon philanthropic principles it aims to civilize africa by encouragement given to legitimate trade the congo region is therein said to abound in produce of various kinds now lost to the world but 
which thanks to the trade will enter into circulation. The natives of the Congo states will be enriched thereby because thanks to European commercial activities, which the association's policy, by granting them encouragement and protection, intends to promote, they will receive European merchandise in exchange for the produce of their country. Thanks to trade, the counterpart of its value, that is, the value of the produce collected by the natives, will return to Africa, for which it will prove a source of prosperity. So anxious is the association that nothing shall be allowed to restrict in any way whatsoever the development of trading relations between the white man and the natives on the Congo, that it will not even impose customs dues on European merchandise entering the country, believing such to be restrictive, a doctrine which is also that of Richard Cobden and John Bright. Author's Note This was specifically for Manchester consumption. The document concludes with the assurance that the association will never part with any of its possessions without stipulation that the buyer shall maintain the absolute freedom of trade and the complete individual liberty of trade which it has established. On December 15, 1884, declarations were exchanged between the British government and the association. The declaration of the association opens as follows. The International Association of the Congo, founded by His Majesty the King of the Belgians, for the purpose of promoting the civilization and commerce of Africa, and for the other humane and benevolent purposes hereby declares. The declaration thereupon sets forth that by treaties with certain native rulers, legitimate sovereigns, it has established and is establishing free states in the Congo region, whose administration, by virtue of these treaties, is vested in the association that foreigners, will be guaranteed in the free exercise of their religion and the rights of navigation, commerce, and industry, and the right of buying, selling, etc., that everything possible will be done to prevent the slave trade and suppress slavery. The declaration of the British government is laconic and to the point. The government of Her Britannic Majesty declare their sympathy with and approval of the humane and benevolent purposes of the association, and hereby recognize the flag of the association and of the free states under its administration as the flag of a friendly government. On the same date, a convention was signed between the British government and the association. It consists of ten articles, of which the most important are the second, fifth, and tenth, which read respectively as follows. Article 2. British subjects shall have at all times the right of sojourning and of establishing themselves within the territories which are or shall be under the government of the said association. They shall enjoy the same protection which is accorded to the subjects or citizens of the most favored nation in all matters which regard their persons, their property, the free exercise of their religion, and the rights of navigation, commerce, and industry. Especially, they shall have the rights of buying, of selling, or letting and of hiring lands and buildings, mines, and forests situated within the said territories, and of founding houses of commerce, and of carrying on commerce, and a coasting trade under the British flag. Article 5. Every British consul or consular officer within the said territories who shall be thereunto duly authorized by Her Britannic Majesty's government may hold a consular court for the district assigned to him, and shall exercise sole and exclusive jurisdiction, both civil and criminal, over the persons and property of British subjects within the same, in accordance with British law. Article 10. In the case of the association being desirous to cede any portion of the territory now or hereafter under its government, it shall not cede it otherwise than as subject to all engagements contracted by the association under this convention. Those engagements and the rights thereby accorded to British subjects shall continue to be in vigor after every session made to any new occupant of any portion of the said territory. The Great West African Conference opened its sitting 
in the name of Almighty God at Berlin on November 25th, 1884. It closed them on February 26th, 1885. Fourteen powers were represented. Count Bismarck began his opening speech with these words. In convoking this conference, the imperial government has been guided by the conviction that all the governments invited share the desire of civilizing the natives of Africa by opening the interior of that continent to trade. He defined the program of the conference as limited to the freedom of trade in the basin of the Congo and its mouth. Sir Edward Mallet, the British representative who spoke immediately afterwards, read a long address in the course of which he said, I cannot forget that the natives are not represented among us, and that the decisions of the conference will, nevertheless, have an extreme importance for them. The principle which will command the sympathy and support of Her Majesty's government will be that of the advancement of legitimate commerce, with security for the equality of treatment of all the nations, and for the well-being of the native races. Throughout the discussion, which took place before the final drafting and signature of the act, we find the British delegate constantly making suggestions on behalf of the natives, in regard to their freedom in commercial matters, in regard to slavery and the slave trade, in regard to the importance of alcoholic liquor. A perusal of these discussions shows that in accordance with the inaugural statement of the president, all the delegates were at one in considering the freedom of the natives to trade as the primary guarantee of their collective and individual liberty, their principal safeguard against oppression and injustice. Baron Lambermont, the senior Belgian delegate, opined that this freedom in commercial transactions would prove itself to be an impediment to the temptation of imposing abusive taxes. Baron de Courcelles, the senior French delegate, was emphatic as to the need of guarding against the fundamental vice of 16th century colonization, which looked upon native peoples in the light of suppliers of revenue for a European metropolis. Count Lanet, the delegate for Italy, was anxious to secure that freedom of trade should be protected from interference not for a specific period of years, but for all time. Herr Vermin, the great West African shipowner and merchant of Hamburg, one of the experts consulted by the conference, explained the nature of West African trade, for example, the barter of forest or agricultural produce by the native owners and gathering of such for imported European merchandise. A special committee was appointed by the conference to prepare a report on the subject, and this report, signed by the delegates of Belgium and France, was submitted to the conference and adopted. All monopolies or exclusive privileges in matters of trade were prohibited. The words monopoly and privilege were analyzed etymologically. In short, every conceivable precaution was taken to ensure Lord Granville's determination that freedom of trade and the protection of the natives should be secured throughout the Congo Valley. The last sitting but one of the conference on February 23rd was noteworthy. The president opened it by reading out to the assembled delegates the contents of a letter communicated to him by the representative of King Leopold, in which the writer, Colonel Strauch, after notifying to the president in the name of the King of the Belgians that the International Association had concluded separate conventions with the delegates of all the powers represented at the conference save one, went on to say, The meetings and deliberations of the distinguished assembly sitting at Berlin under your high presidency have materially contributed to hastening this happy result. The conference to which it is my duty to render homage, would I venture to hope, consider the ascension of a power whose exclusive mission is to introduce civilization and trade into the center of Africa as a further pledge of the fruits which its important labor must produce. Then ensued a pathetic scene. The delegates, figuratively speaking, fell upon each other's necks and wept with emotion. The new state, declared Baron de Corsella, France, has been dedicated to the exercise of every liberty. Sir Edward Mallet of England followed with a panegyric of King Leopold. 
the whole world, exclaimed Count Lanay of Italy, can but testify to its sympathy and its encouragement for this civilizing and humanitarian work which honors the 19th century and from which the general interests of humanity benefit and will continue increasingly to benefit. The Count of Banamar of Spain shared the views of Count Lanay as to the humane and civilizing work of His Majesty the King of the Belgians, and likewise M. de Vind of Denmark and the representative of Sweden and Norway, M. Stanford of America, rendered homage to this great civilizing work. Count von der Stratenpontus of Belgium was grateful. He added, the Belgian government and nation will adhere, therefore, with gratitude to the labors of his high assembly, the thanks to which the existence of the new state is henceforth assured, while the principles have been laid down from which the general interests of humanity will profit. The general act of this West African conference, as agreed to, provides Article 1 that the trade of all nations shall enjoy complete freedom. Article 5. No power which exercises or shall exercise sovereign rights in the above-mentioned regions shall be allowed to grant therein a monopoly or favor of any kind in matters of trade. Foreigners without distinction shall enjoy protections of their persons and property as well as the right of acquiring and transferring movable and immovable possessions and national rights and treatment in the exercise of their professions. Article 6. All the powers exercising sovereign rights or influence in the aforesaid territories bind themselves to watch over the preservation of the native tribes and the care for the improvement of the conditions of their moral and material well-being, and to help in suppressing slavery and especially the slave trade. They shall, without distinction of creed or nation, protect and favor all religions, scientific or charitable institutions, and undertakings created and organized for the above ends, or which aim at instructing the natives and bringing home to them the blessings of civilization. Christian missionaries, scientists, and explorers, with their followers, property, and collections, shall likewise be the objects of a special protection. Freedom of conscience and religious toleration are expressly guaranteed to the natives no less than to subjects and foreigners. The free and public exercise of all forms of divine worship and the right to build edifices for religious purposes and to organize religious missions belonging to all creeds shall not be limited or fettered in any way whatsoever. Articles 13 to 25 deal with the navigation of the Congo, of which more anon. On August 1st, 1885, King Leopold notified the signatory powers that the International Association would be henceforth known as the Congo Free State and himself as sovereign of that state. Let us summarize these facts. 1. Sir Robert Moyer proposes to Lord Beaconsfield that the regime of the Congo should form a leading chapter in a large settlement of African affairs. Author's note, the life of Lord Granville, Lord Fitzmaurice. One feature of this scheme is that the river be placed under some form of international control. Lord Beaconfield rejects the idea that Lord Carnarvon repudiates Consul Cameron's proclamation taking possession of the Congo Basin in the name of Great Britain. 2. Stanley's discoveries of the mighty fluvial system of the Congo bend all eyes toward Central Africa. 3. The King of the Belgians founds an international association ostensibly to promote civilization and trade in Central Africa. 4. France and Portugal take alarm and put forward political claims in that direction. 5. King Leopold, fearing for his enterprise, which has already begun to assume a political and, we may presume by subsequent events, financial complexion, appeals to the British government privately for support. 6. Portugal appeals to Great Britain likewise. She proposes that the River Congo shall be thrown open to the trade of the whole world, 
that the river itself shall be placed under an Anglo-Portuguese river commission to which the successive adhesion of the powers would be welcome. 7. King Leopold's scheme is not trusted by the British government, which favors the Portuguese proposal, and Mr. Gladstone recommends agreement while making it clear that England has no intention of securing an exclusive advantage for herself. 8. King Leopold is meanwhile making desperate efforts to capture British public opinion and influence it against the Anglo-Portuguese treaty. To the philanthropic section of the British public, he represents his enterprise as a great humanitarian undertaking. To the commercial world of Great Britain, he describes its main purpose to secure forever Central Africa to commercial liberty free from vexations, imports, and tariffs. He succeeds in raising a storm of opposition in England against the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty. 9. Germany is in a grumbling mood, and France, encouraged by the home opposition in England, protests against the treaty. 10. The British government, in view of these attacks, at home and abroad, abandons the treaty with Portugal, and henceforth supports King Leopold's scheme for the same reason which led it to support Portugal, but still mistrusting the king's intentions, determines that stringent conditions for the good treatment of natives and the freedom of commerce shall be secured. 11. Agrees to participate in an international West African conference suggested by Bismarck to settle the question. 12. Exchanges declaration and signs a convention with King Leopold's association on the lines above indicated. 13. Takes a leading part in the conference at Berlin, which results in freedom of commerce, prohibition of monopoly or privilege, and just treatment of the natives being solemnly proclaimed. A good many morals might be drawn from this record, but it will suffice to accentuate three conclusions, and these are a. King Leopold's International Association would have dissolved into thin air but for the separate and collective action of the powers in allowing it to blossom from a private undertaking into a great free area under the trusteeship of the sovereign of a small neutral European state. b. Without British sanction, cooperation, and assistance, no such agreement would possibly have been arrived at. c. But for the influence exercised by King Leopold and his agents upon British public opinion, the British government would never have given its sanction to the arrangement. End of section 6。section 7 of Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morell. The History, a program in three parts. It appears to me that the facts I have stated afford amply sufficient proof of the spirit which animates the Belgian administration, if indeed administration it can be called. Lord Cremier, White Book, Africa, number 1, 1904. The first five years of the Congo Free State's existence were devoted by King Leopold to the maturing of the vast financial, military, and political program he had been caressing, as must now be clear to the average intellect, if not from the very commencement of his undertaking, at least very shortly after its inauguration. There were many things to accomplish in the interval. One of the most important was the establishment on a solid foundation of the claim to philanthropic motive, which later might be contested by pestilent critics, animated, of course, with the most unworthy motives. Large drafts were therefore made upon public credulity, and the resources displayed in this regard was elevated to a fine art, Royal decrees, laws, and regulations followed in rapid succession, breathing the very quintessence of philanthropy. Those which breathed another sort of essence, the king, as we shall see in a moment, thought fully refrained from publishing. 
friendly relations were established with the unspeakable Arab, whose ill deeds were shortly to be trumpeted all over the world. Very great activity was displayed in dispatching, exploring, and reconnoitering expeditions throughout the country. Yet towards the end of this first period of King Leopold's enterprise, ugly rumors were already gaining currency. A policy of veiled antagonism had been set on foot in the lower Congo towards European merchants there settled. Trade, instead of being encouraged, was in process of being throttled by heavy taxation. A decree was issued claiming all vacant lands as the property of the state. Subsequent decrees whittling down the rights of the native to the area upon which his hut was built, or his cultivated patch of farmland. Another decree prohibited the hunting of the elephant throughout the whole extent of the state's territory, three-fourths of which had not at that time been trotted by the white man's foot, without special permission, special permission being withheld. Yet another decree prohibited the trade in Indian rubber and gum copal. For example, in the only articles except ivory in which it was impossible to trade, in the Aruwimi district, and so on. More astonishing than aught else, perhaps, was the feverish haste with which a large body of troops, recruited from the most savage tribes in the upper Congo, was being raised and equipped with modern rifles of precision. By 1889, 2,200 regulars had been recruited. An official report of that year foreshadowed the recruiting of 5,000 in this Bangala country and 3,000 more in the Arurimi district. Confidential circulars, which only became known last year and this, and with which not a dozen people in this country are probably acquainted, were dispatched to the king's officials on the Congo. Here is an extract from one of these circulars signed by the then principal secretary on the King's Brussels staff. The Congo State will allot for each recruit obtained a bonus on the following lines. 90 francs for every healthy and vigorous man considered fit for military service, and whose stature exceeds 1 meter and 15 centimeters. 65 francs for every youth whose stature is at least 1 meter 35 centimeters. 15 francs per male child. The male child must be at least 1 meter 20 centimeters in height, and must be sufficiently strong to be able to support the fatigues of the road. For every married man, the bonus will be increased to 130 francs. The bonus will only fall due when the men have been handed over to the headquarters of the various districts. Author's note, official shorthand report, Belgian Parliamentary, debates February to March, 1906. The children were drafted to the camps of military instruction to be made soldiers of in due course. Author's note, these were a portion of the Libihere so-called free slaves, see section 2. The recruits were obtained by armed raids upon villages, differing in no degree from the raids of the Arabs except that they were accompanied by greater loss of life. In this way, the Bangala country has been drained of its lifeblood, and the population reduced in the last 15 years by about 75%. As Mr. Weeks will tell us in the next chapter, similar results have followed in the Bakusu and Batetla country, Indeed, I believe the Batetlas are practically wiped out. Another confidential circular dated October 1891 and signed by the acting governor general in the Congo, M. Felix Fuchs, informs the district commissioners that the government has set aside a sum of 100,000 francs, which sum it is free to distribute, partly or wholly or not at all, with the object of rewarding the district commissioners and their subordinates, who show exceptional zeal and devotion in accomplishment of all the duties which are incumbent upon them. The circular goes on to explain that the sine qua non of the allotment of these bonuses is the rigorous fulfillment of the decrees bearing upon recruiting. 
it must be well understood that no bonus will be granted in districts which do not carry out recruiting operations provided in the decrees of July 30, 1891. The maximum of bonus will be allotted only to those district commissioners who recruit at least the number of men above mentioned for 1902. These recruiting operations are distinct from voluntary enlistment, which will continue as before. The balance of the credit not allotted will be distributed among the districts which recruit more than the number of men here mentioned. Author's Note Official Sorthand Report Belgian Parliamentary Debates, March 1905 So direct and explicit a command to raid slaves necessitated extreme secrecy, and we find the acting governor-general recommending that the circular must under no pretext be removed from your archives. You will convey your subordinates such explanations as may be necessary in connection with this circular verbally. These instructions led to a further crop of circulars, of which the following may be considered a type. Coculateville, May 1st, 1896. Chief Ngulu of Wangata is sent into the Maringa to buy slaves for me. The agents of the ABIR are requested to inform me of the depredations he may commit en route. Signed, Captain Commandant Sarazin, District Commissioner of the Equator. Author's Note. Official Shorthand Report. Belgian Parliamentary Debates, March 1905. The humanitarian undertaking began to wear a curious aspect. In 1890, King Leopold broke with the Arabs and appealed to the powers to allow him to impose import duties on merchandise in order to raise money with which to fight the wicked Arabs. Those inconvenient competitors in Ivory, the Congo Free State, had already imposed an export duty of 80 pounds per ton of ivory and 20 pounds on rubber. Author's note. The West African Conference had prohibited the levying of import dues, but had not prohibited the imposition of export dues, ostensibly to crush their slave trading operations. This demand, coupled with the acts previously referred to, for example, exorbitant taxation of trade, prohibition of elephant hunting, partial prohibition of rubber trading, etc., was too much for the Dutch government, whose subjects drove a considerable trade in the lower river. It shook the faith of the British Chambers of Commerce, and disgusted a section at least of the philanthropic element. Mr. F. W. Fox, for instance, made what has since become, in the light of subsequent events, a most remarkable prediction. At a public meeting held on November 4th of that year in London, he said, There is an impression, very widely existing among the people in the Congo state, that when this money is voted by the Brussels Conference, there will be war and raids instead of any beneficial result, and that great evils will grow far greater than the slave trade as existing at present. Hear, hear. We contend that it ought to be suppressed by judicious efforts, by the extension of legitimate commerce, by fair consideration for the natives, by being just to the Arabs and enlisting their sympathy, and not by exterminating the natives or the Arabs in a series of wars. But the same old tactics were resorted to which had been used to such advantage to hound on British opinion against the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty. Public and press were flooded with inspired articles and pamphlets representing the Dutch government and all who shared its views as friendly to the slave trade. Finally, King Leopold got what he wanted, a mandate from Christendom to exterminate the Arabs, and on the strength of it obtained one million pounds from Belgium as a cash-down recognition of his generosity in leaving the Congo to her in his will. Author's Note, Vide Section 5. Thus doubly fortified, the sovereign of the Congo Free State brought his plans rapidly to head. The royal program was divided into three parts, between which there existed a close correlation. 
1. The extermination of the Arabs. 2. The conquest of the Sudan. 3. The conversion of the Congo Basin, its economic riches, and its human inhabitants into the private property of the sovereign. The disappearance of the Arab had a twofold advantage. It would strengthen King Leopold's reputation for his philanthropy in the world, enabling him to pose more than ever as the Godfrey de Bouillon of the 19th century crusade, and incidentally would place in his hands not only the ivory markets occupied by the Arabs, but the vast stores of that article held by them. This was accomplished. The second was on the high road to success, when at the last moment it fell to pieces. 4,000 rifles, 1,000 irregulars armed with lances and hundreds of porters, together with a considerable force of artillery, marched Nilewards after concentrating at Dungu. There were two columns. The first, under Charlton, had only 750 rifles. Nevertheless, it occupied the left bank of the Nile up to Rajaf, driving the dervishes before it. The second, under De Hainish, met with complete disaster owing to the mutiny of the greater part of the force. Had this event not taken place, the history of the last few years might have undergone no small change, for King Leopold's objective was Khartoum, his ambition to play the part of the honest broker between France and England for the settlement of the Egyptian question. The ambition was a large one, but it was seriously entertained, and the chance of success was not at all remote. As it was, his partial triumph lured Lord Rosebery into the unfortunate agreement of 1894 over the Barel Ghazal, which alienated us from Germany in Congo matters and nearly brought us to war with France. The third part of the program needs to be handled in greater detail, for like the first, it has been carried out only too completely and to its realization is primarily due to the abomination of desolation into which the Congo territories have been plunged. Before the birth of the Congo Free State, a brisk trade with the natives of the Upper Congo was carried on by European merchants established on the lower river through the native middleman, the Bakongo. These Bakongo caravans transported goods from the European factories to the interior by the caravan road passing level with the 200 miles of cataracts, which prior to the construction of the railway by Colonel Tice, author's note, Vide section 5, separated the lower river from the upper. At the head of the cataracts, Stanley Pool, they disposed of their goods to the natives who awaited them in canoes, some of which hailed from enormous distances in the interior, receiving in exchange produce, chiefly ivory and rubber, which they brought down again to the European factories. With the advent of the Congo Free State, Belgians, Frenchmen, and Englishmen in the employ of a powerful trading company registered in Belgium, La Société Anonyme, Belge Polet, Commerce du ou Congo, started trading stations on the upper reaches of the river, dealing direct with the natives of the country. They pushed inland along the banks and purchased ivory and rubber with European goods. They laid the foundation of legitimate business transactions with the enterprising, high-spirited, as Stanley called them, races of the Upper Congo, the nucleus of a trade which would have gone on expanding, as has been the case everywhere, in West Africa, in Nigeria, Senegambia, all down the coast, in fact gradually penetrating inland as native enterprise grew with the improvement of ways of communication and the increased accessibility of native markets. Stanley, in referring in the course of his public speeches in 1884 to the future possibilities of the Congo trade if placed under the auspices of a philanthropic monarch had been positively lyrical in his enthusiasm and there is no doubt that had that trade been allowed to develop its proportions today would have been very large. What a different picture we should have had to contemplate. But the role of supreme administrator of a tropical dependency run on lines of decency, justice, and legitimate commerce 
such as was understood to be the king's intention at the West African Conference, simply did not enter into that monarch's purview. The part would have been altogether too confined. His ideas were widely different. He was indeed a dreamer of dreams, as Stanley had described him, but not of that sort of dream. He wished to cut a great figure in the world, a desire impossible of accomplishment without vast financial resources which he did not possess. So the royal feet being now firmly planted on African soil, the royal position in Europe being secured, the royal will entered with immovable determination to crush all obstacles on its predestined course. A secret decree dated September 21st, 1891, and the measures taken by the king's officials in Africa upon receipt of it, changed the whole outlook of affairs in Central Africa and revolutionized the actual and future situation of its millions of inhabitants. This decree laid down as the paramount duty of the officials of the Congo Free State the raising of revenue to take urgent and necessary measures to secure for the state the dominial fruits, Anglesey, the produce of the country, notably ivory and rubber. It was followed by a series of regulations issued by the Governor General through the district commissioners forbidding the natives to sell ivory and rubber to European merchants, and threatening the latter with prosecution if they bought these articles from the natives. The merchants protested, and the king in reply defined his position. Everything in the country belonged to the state, the land and the produce thereof. The natives were tenants upon the state's property. If they interfered with that property, they were poachers, and whoever abated them in that interference were criminals, receivers of stolen goods, and violators of the law of the land. In that way did King Leopold, by a stroke of the pen, appropriate Central Africa. To leave his officials under no misapprehensions as to his intentions, other secret instructions were dispatched by the king to his governor-general. Some of these secret documents have recently come to light, but as they are practically unknown in this country owing to the limited means of the Congo Reform Association, and as they are of transcendental importance to a proper understanding of the policy of brigandage substituted by King Leopold for the freedom of commerce laid down in the conventions and at the West African Conference from which King Leopold derives his trusteeship as overlord of the Congo. I make no apologies for giving them here. Brussels, June 20th, 1892 to the Governor General. As I have had the honor upon several occasions of informing you, the officials of the Congo State must neglect no means of exploiting the produce of the forests. They must succeed in keeping commerce informed of the riches of our territories, and gradually bring about a considerable traffic towards Stanley Pool for the period when the railway is opened. To stimulate the zeal of our officials in this matter, I have decided that in future a bonus proportionate to the cost of exploitation shall be allotted to those who are concerned with forest exploitation. These bonuses will be established as follows. 15 cent bonus per kilo on rubber costing 30 cent and less per kilo. 12 and a half cent bonus per kilo on rubber costing 31 to 40 cent. 10 cent bonus per kilo on rubber costing 40 cent to 49 cent, 8 cent bonus per kilo on rubber costing 50 to 59 cent, 6 cent bonus per kilo on rubber costing 60 cent to 69 cent, 4 cent bonus per kilo on rubber costing 70 cent to 80 cent. For gum copal and wax as follows. 15 cent bonus per kilo on gum and cent costing 15 cent and less per kilo. 10 cent bonus per kilo on gum and cent costing 6 to 10 cent. 5 bonus per kilo on gum and cent costing 11 to 15 cent. For ivory costing the state in the Congo 15 francs, I shall give no bonus. In ivory costing 14 francs, 
I will give a bonus of 15 cent. On ivory costing 13 francs, I will give a bonus of 30 cent. On ivory costing 12 francs, I will give a bonus of 45 cents. On ivory costing 11 francs, I will give a bonus of 60 cents. On ivory costing 10 francs, I will give a bonus of 75 cents. On ivory costing 9 francs, I will give a bonus of 90 cents. On ivory costing 8 francs, I will give a bonus of 1 franc and 5 cents. On ivory costing 7 francs, I will give a bonus of 1 franc and 20 cents. On ivory costing 6 francs, I will give a bonus of 1 franc and 35 cents. On ivory costing 5 francs, I will give a bonus of 1 franc and 50 cents. On ivory costing 4 francs, I will give a bonus of 1 franc and 65 cents. On ivory costing 3 francs and less, I will give a bonus of 1 franc and 80 cents. For scrivolos, author's note, small tusks, and defective tusks, the bonus can be reduced as the government may decide to one half of the above figures. A proportion of the bonuses due may be given to a subordinate in accordance with the lists which must be furnished me by station chiefs, district commissioners, and leaders of expeditions. This measure will begin and will apply to all products collected from October 1st. It will not be retrospective and annuls all preceding regulations on the subject. The Secretary of State, SGD, Van Eetvelde, certified correct, Governor General Wais, author's note, official shorthand report, Belgian Parliamentary Debates, March 1905. Thus, the less the official employed by King Leopold cost his royal master in obtaining his royal master's revenues, the more his royal master was pleased, and the greater his reward. The less the native got for his rubber and ivory, the larger the official's commission. A more direct incentive to robbery and violence was never penned. There are times when the recorder of the Congo tragedy stops short with a mental gasp, and pauses before he goes on again to wonder whether he is the victim of hallucination. On February 6, 1893, M. Felix Fuchs, acting governor general, forwards a circular to inspectors, district commissioners, commanders of expeditions, heads of stations, those fine stations we shall hear about presently, which says, the state cannot assure its future unless it finds the wherewithal to defray its expenditure. The exploitation of its domaine privé is in this respect an important asset. It is of paramount necessity, therefore, that the state should obtain promptly therefrom the necessary revenue to balance its expenditure. This philanthropic document proceeds. At the present, it is chiefly necessary to give an energetic impulse to the collection of rubber and ivory. As regard to the first of these products, the task of the district commissioner who has jurisdiction over a portion of the domaine privé will be facilitated in large measures by the fact that no private person can buy rubber therein unless he has obtained already a concession of a portion of the domaine privé. The government hopes that you will do your utmost to carry out its behest and that you will collect the greatest quantity of the various products of the domain. Author's note. Official shorthand report, Belgian Parliamentary Debates, March 1905. This from a government to its officials. The German government, having got wind of this singular fashion of interpreting the articles of the West African Conference, protested in the most vigorous terms through its minister at Brussels, Count Albensleven. Astonishing as it may seem to those who have not yet realized that Niccolo Machiavelli's precepts have been adopted and vastly extended by his modern prototype, King Leopold denied absolutely and repeatedly that any bonus was paid to his officials on ivory and rubber. Here is the letter which closes the correspondence. Brussels, December 11th, 1895, Monsieur Le Comte, in reply to the communication of Your Excellency, of the 7th of this month, I beg, without entering into an examination of the question of right, to declare formally that there does not exist any commercial premiums for agents of the independent state of the Congo, and that the government has no intention of establishing any, either for rubber, or for ivory, or for any other product whatsoever. 
SDG Edmund van Eetvelde. This official was the co-signatory with Sir Edward Grey the other day to a convention under which the Congo forces are to evacuate certain portions of the British territory they have occupied. His pledges are somewhat at a discount. The system of paying these bonuses on revenue collected have taken various forms. Here are extracts from another circular dated BOMA January 3rd, 1896, and signed by the Governor General Baron Weiss. BOMA, January 3rd, 1896. Gentlemen, by reason of the decision taken by the government to suppress bonuses to officials connected with the exploitation of the domain, in respect to products collected by them, the government has decided to grant extra bonuses to officials rendering exceptional services to the state, principally principally in the development of the resources of the country and the bettering of the conditions of the natives. These bonuses will be granted according to the suggestions which may be made by the commanders of expeditions or by district commissioners. These bonuses, however, will only be granted in districts which produce annually to the state at least 50,000 francs in taxes paid in kind by the natives, it being well understood that these taxes are to be reckoned in products sold in Europe for the benefit of the treasury. Reports as to the collection of product must continue to be sent to me regularly to enable the government to take note of the services rendered by our officials and to check the arrivals of produce. But for the previous marginal notes will be substituted others which shall consist in allotting to officials who may have contributed directly or indirectly to the collection of produce a certain number of marks according to their respective merits, the total of the marks being represented by ten. It will not be necessary to mention in the report the names of district commissioners or commanders of expeditions because the government will be able to, according to the produce collected, to judge of the importance of the services of these officials. It will suffice, therefore, to follow the name of the official with the number of marks attributed to him, according to the services he has rendered thus. MX Sheptazone, 5 marks. A. Officer, 2 marks. B. Non-commissioned officer, 2 marks. C. Clerk, 1 mark. Total, 10. Signed Governor General Weiss, author's note, official shorthand report, Belgian Parliamentary Debates, March 1905. The procedure adopted at present is as follows. Officials whose districts have produced much revenue, e.g. rubber, for the ivory is becoming exhausted, received an annual grant, district commissioners from 6,000 to 10,000 francs, Captains in the force public, 4,000 to 7,000 francs. Lieutenants in the force public, 2,000 to 3,000 francs. Foreign officers, who are inclined to be disagreeable when they return, are lunched by the king, told how bad are the effects of the African sun upon the European temperament, assured that they must have been dreaming or misinformed, and if possible, a deucer sends them away happy not given directly, of course, that would be vulgar, but quietly arranged in a subsequent confidential chat with one of the high officials. The grants mentioned above take the form of an entry to the grantee's credit in the register of the 4%. Public debt, grand livre de la dette publique, of the Congo State, on which interest is paid. Permission is afterwards given for the conversion of this credit entry into bonds to bearer. It is very ingenious and simple withal, the official's future is bound up with the production of revenue. He can claim nothing from the king, but if his zeal and devotion in raiding through the country at the head of an armed rubber-hunting expedition has been sufficient, he knows that he will be rewarded. If he is wise, he keeps a copy of his instructions from headquarters, which will enable him to retaliate in kind lest any chance the royal purse strings be closed. His horizon begins with rubber and ends with hard cash, matabish in Congo slang. The native is between the upper and nether millstone. So it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be so long as King Leopold and his financiers are allowed to pirate the wealth of the Congo forests by armed force.
read this circular given in the White Book Africa number 1, 1904. It's dated Boma, March 29, 1901, and is signed by the inevitable Baron Weiss. The quality of the rubber exported from the Congo is sensibly inferior to what it was some time ago. The difference arises from several causes, but principally from the addition to the latex, authors note. E.g., the juice of the vine, which collagulated, produces rubber, which is fit to be gathered of other kinds of latex of very inferior value, or even of any dust-like matter. This cause of loss can and must be removed. I may here remark in parentheses that an ingenious method of removing it has been practiced by some of the subordinate officials. They have made the natives eat it when badly prepared. Authors note, vide section 3. The commissioners of districts and chiefs of zones, who have all experience, know the fraudulent means which the natives often try to employ. They must take measures completely to prevent these frauds. It cannot be doubted that in those parts where the population submits to the tax, it will not be impossible to lead the natives to furnish pure produce. But in order to effect this, constant supervision is necessary, for as soon as the native notices that the supervision is becoming lax, he will try to lessen his work by taking latex of a bad quality, if he obtains it easily or by adding foreign matter. Whenever these frauds are discovered, they must be put down. The commissioners of districts and chiefs of zones must examine the product at frequent intervals in order to report in time to their heads of stations and not to permit a condition of affairs which is most prejudicial. To this cause of the decline in the value of rubber must be added that arising from defective packing of the produce, which thus often travels during several months under the worst conditions. Much of the effort which has been taken to obtain produce in keeping with the richness of the country may be said to be lost through this neglect, for the value of the rubber may be diminished by half through this want of care. I may add that the value of rubber, even when free from all admixture, has gone down in every market for some time past. Territorial chiefs, therefore, must not only remove the two causes of loss, which they can eliminate, but they must also try to neutralize the third by making unceasing efforts to increase production to the extent laid down in the instructions. The orders which I have here given will have my constant attention. Such circulars as these from the fountainhead of the Congo autocracy are accompanied as may be supposed by circulars from the subordinates to their subordinates, the men who actually get the revenue, not those whose task it is to say that the revenue must be secured. Few of these documents have ever seen light. Those that have may be taken as typical samples. Here are two in sequence from the higher to the lower rung of Congolese hierarchy. Acting Governor General Felix Fuchs to Commandant Verstraten, in charge of the Ruby Welly Zone. I close by advising you that the government firmly hopes that, inspired by the considerations set forth in the present communication, you will exhibit a fresh proof of your activity and devotion by making the district you command produce the maximum of resources which can be drawn from it. Authors note, Official Shorthand Report, Belgian Parliamentary Debates, July 1903. Commandant Verstraten to the officials in charge of the stations of the Ruby Welly District. I have the honor to inform you that from January 1st, 1899, you must succeed in furnishing 4,000 kilos of rubber every month. To this effect, I give you carte blanche. You have, therefore, two months in which to work your people. Employ gentleness first, and if they persist in not accepting the imposition of the state, employ force of arms. Here are extracts from another. District Commissioner Jacques to the officials in charge of the station of Inorio. M. Le Chet de Poste. Decidedly, these people of Inorio are a bad lot. They have just been and cut some rubber vines at Huli. We must fight them until their absolute submission has been obtained, 
or their complete extermination. Authors note. Official shorthand report, Belgian parliamentary debates, February to March 1906. When the inevitable results of such appeals to pillage by violence attain too great proportions, we get a circular of this kind. Boma, November 7, 1893. Gentlemen, from information which has reached the central government recently, it appears that some of our agents settle palavers, make war upon the natives, burn villages, without reporting their actions. Others, who have gone so far as to carry out with their own hands summary executions, and have thus become assassins, have not been brought before any tribunal or court-martial. Their immediate chiefs, present in the region, could not have been ignorant of facts of this gravity, and have thus assumed serious responsibility. The government invites me to take the severest measures at my disposal to cause these deplorable abuses which solely our reputation to cease. I need not add here that this order will be executed. We have decrees and regulations. Each person must conform to them. If individual caprice was to substitute itself for law, we should become in certain parts of the territory more savage than the natives whom we have led to civilization. Signed, the Governor General Weiss. Author's note. Official shorthand report. Belgian Parliamentary Debates, March 1905. Compare the circular in which the Governor General admits that the Congo officials are assassins with the furious denunciations of the press bureau against their foreign accusers. After this avowal, we observe the same supreme official and king's mandatory in Africa issuing the following instructions to the district commissioner of Lake Leopold II. The circular is dated January 9th, 1897. It reads, Where the natives refused obstinately to work, you will compel them to obey by taking hostages. Work, meaning to gather rubber for King Leopold and his financial friends, on lines laid down in the earlier regenerating circulars. It is unnecessary to add that the taking of women hostages has, since the circular, become a recognized feature of the rubber slave trade. Authors note, see section 3. No wonder King Leopold suppressed the documentary evidence of his own commission of inquiry last year. By these measures did the produce of the Congo Basin, lost to the world, become a source of prosperity to the native collector of it. Under this system, 13,715,664 francs of raw produce, 85% rubber, has been forced out of the Congo native in the last seven years at the point of bayonet. Furnishers of untold wealth to their absentee landlord in Europe, their own condition has steadily worsened. Authors note. The total value of the import in that period only amounted to just over 6 million francs, the overwhelming portion of which was composed of government material and stores. Deprived of everything and compelled to devote their lives to gather rubber for an alien potentate who claims the labor of Central Africa as his personal asset, thus the rubber slave trade in the making. We shall plunge into the equatorial forest and see how rubber is acquired under the stimulus of force and bonuses. We shall move among the natives and realize, so far as it is possible, at a distance of several thousand miles from the scene of their oppression, the daily effects of the system upon them, the system of moral and material regeneration, and after inquiring whether the calculated plunder of a continent possesses any redeeming feature for the plundered people, we shall pass to the examination of the revenues derived therefrom, the amount of them, and the manner of their distribution. End of section 7「Section 8 of Red Rubber – The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine E. Red Rubber – The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo 
by Edmund Dean Morell. The Deeds, Part 1 Auferre, trucidare, rapere falsis imperium, atque ubi solitudinem faciunt, pacem appellant. Tacitus, Agricola, 130. What they, by a misuse of terms, style government, is a system of pillage, murder, and robbery, and their so-called peace is a desert of their own creation. I reproduce below the comments upon Affairs of West Africa, published in 1902, in which book four chapters were devoted to the affairs of the Congo, because they are typical of the difficulties which those of us who took up this matter were confronted, difficulties which are referred to in the opening chapter of the present volume. Author The state of affairs to which he calls attention in the latter portion of the book is indeed so terrible, and the accusations which he does not hesitate to bring personally against King Leopold II are so grave that, notwithstanding the unfortunately too general apprehension entertained in well-informed West African circles that there exists very solid ground for criticism, we hesitate, without independent investigation, to give further currency to his assertions. If Mr. Morell is accurately informed, there is hardly a condition of its the Congo State's charter that it has not broken, nor a law of common humanity which it has not flouted. The sufferings of which the picture was given to the world in Uncle Tom's cabin are as nothing to those which Mr. Morell presents to be the habitual accompaniment of the acquisition of rubber and ivory by the Belgian companies. The Times, December 19, 1902 Sir Harry Johnston in the Daily Chronicle, December 20, 1902. Mr. Morell's indictment is one of the most terrible things ever written, if true. Within the last few months only have the closest students of the Congo question been in a position to appreciate to the full the staggering volume of records to the continuity and uniformity of outrage and the all-pervading cause of outrage on the Congo. Many of the data here summarized are unknown save to the comparatively few persons who are subscribers to the Congo Reform Association, in whose monthly journal they have been recorded. Others now appear for the first time. In the main, the records here given are but the briefest and baldest summaries. If the whole of them were to be set down, a book double the size of the present one would hardly suffice to contain them. My object, or one of them, is to show how unbroken is the tale of horror, how dreadful the similarity. We see precisely the same scenes described by men thousands of miles apart, and with many years' interval between them. Records from 1890 to 1893 Letter from Colonel Williams, read out to a London meeting by Mr. R. Cobden Phillips, representing the Manchester Chamber of Commerce on November 4, 1890. Extract. Area. Presumably Upper River Banks. Your Majesty's government has been, and is now, guilty of waging unjust and cruel wars against natives, with the hope of securing slaves and women to minister to the behest of your majesty's government in such slave-hunting raids one village is armed against the other and the force thus secured is incorporated with the regular troops march eighteen ninety one letters from correspondents in the congo read out to manchester geographical society by mr e sowerbutts the secretary Letters speak of atrocities by Congolese troops, women and children seized as prisoners, etc., in this diabolical and unholy so-called civilizing work. Area, probably cataract region. In 1891, the secret decree appropriating the produce of the soil and calling upon officials to devote all their energies to collecting revenue is issued together with the regulations and circulars which followed it. See last chapter. 
The immediate effects of the regulations and circulars are chronicled in letters from Belgian and French traders in the Upper Congo. Letters dated 1891 and 1892, published for the first time in 1904. Area, river banks and central region. Yambaya, February 6, 1891. The country is ruined. Passengers in the steamers Roi de Belge have been able to see for themselves that from Bontia, half a day's journey below our factory at Opoto, to Buombo inclusive, there is not an inhabited village left, that is to say, four days steaming through a country formerly so rich, today entirely ruined. Gonga Dona, October 20th. Thanks to the proceedings of the state, we cannot travel three hours in a canoe without coming across a hostile village. This is the way they go on. They go to a village and say to the chief, If by noon three tusks of ivory are not here for us to buy, you are no longer our friend. At noon the chief arrives and says, I have only two, or as the case may be. If that is the case, replies the representative of the state, we will see. The whole party then springs on shore and endeavors to make prisoners. That having been accomplished, the chief is told, Come with so many tusks, and your men and women will be returned to you. Basankusu, September 17, 1892 The villages are compelled to pay heavy taxes in rubber. They are compelled to furnish so many kilos to the state every week. To give you an idea, the state has received 1,060 kilos in one month and a half. The state had made war upon the villages from Lulonga to Basankusu. All the villages in the Moringa suffered the same fate. Likini, October 15th. After the wars with the Mambatis and the Bokondo, when the state people took many prisoners, which the Mambatis redeemed with ivory, they have begun the same proceedings again. To buy ivory in this way does not need many goods, and has the merit of simplicity. Four days ago they started making war once more. Thirteen killed, six prisoners. October 18th. The frequent wars upon the natives undertaken without any cause by the state soldiers sent out to get rubber and ivory are depopulating the country. The soldiers find that the quickest and cheapest method is to raid villages, seize prisoners, and have them redeemed afterwards against ivory. At Bokonja they took thirty prisoners, whom they released upon payment of ten tusks. Each agent of the state receives one thousand pounds commission per ton of ivory secured, and 175 pounds per ton of rubber. Yambaya, March 23, 1893. The majority of natives in every village are fleeing to the forests on account of the perpetual troubles with the state. Such was the immediate result of the official instructions to raid ivory and rubber on commission. The early beginnings of the system, which was to prevail for fifteen years, and which still prevails. Records from 1894 to 1898. Glave, E.J., an independent English traveller, formerly with Stanley, who speaks very highly of him, crossed the Congo from the Great Lakes to the ocean in 1894 to 5. His voluminous diary published by the Century Magazine in 1896. Area, the whole country traversed. The white officer at Kamambare has commissioned several chiefs to make raids on the country of the Warua and bring him slaves. They are supposed to be taken out of slavery and freed, but I fail to see how this can be argued out. They are taken from their villages and shipped south to be soldiers, workers, etc., on the stations, and what were peaceful families have been broken up, and the different members spread about the place. This is no reasonable way of settling the land. It is merely persecution. The brutal action of the soldiers so terrified the people that many fled into hiding, and have not since returned. Not content with this, the soldiers steal everything on the plantations and in the houses. 
If the rightful owners object they are beaten, the women taken by force. In stations in charge of white men, government officers, one sees strings of poor, emaciated old women, some of them mere skeletons, working from ten to six, tramping about in gangs with a rope around their necks, and connected by a rope one and a half yards apart. They are prisoners of war. Expeditions have been sent in every direction, forcing natives to make rubber and to bring it to the stations. Up the Ikelemba, away to Lake Mantumba, the state is perpetrating its fiendish policy in order to obtain profit. War has been waged all through the district of the equator, and thousands of people have been killed and homes destroyed. Many women and children were taken, and twenty-one heads were brought to Stanley Falls, and have been used by Captain Rom as a decoration round a flower-bed in front of his house. Most white officers out in the Congo are averse to the India-rubber policy of the state, but the laws command it. If the Arabs had been the masters, it would have been styled iniquitous trafficking in human flesh and blood, but being under the administration of the Congo Free State, it is merely a part of their philanthropic system of liberating the natives. Schöblom, a Swedish missionary of the American Baptist Missionary Union, in conjunction with an Englishman in the same mission, Banks, Schöblom had complained with great vehemence locally, and caused furious resentment to the Governor-General, Baron Wahis, who threatened him with five years' imprisonment. Through the intermediary of Mr. Fox Bourne, he appealed to the world at the public meeting in London, May 12, 1897. His experiences cover 1895-97. to 97. Area Central region. The following are extracts from his statements. The natives in inland towns are, as a matter of custom, asked whether they are willing to gather India rubber. The question put to them is not, Will you live at peace together? Will you acknowledge the Congo government? It is, Will you work India rubber? Well, many of the people are killed, and they try suddenly to disband and refused to bring the India rubber. Then war is declared. Describes the usual procedure adopted. Within his knowledge, forty-five towns have been burnt down. Describes the sentry system, the soldiers stationed in the villages, living on the people, and driving the adult males into the forest to gather India rubber. Narrates how he visited a village at sunset. The people had never seen a white man, and had returned from their hunt for rubber. As he was speaking to them, a soldier rushed in among the crowd, and seized an old man guilty of having been fishing in the river, instead of gathering rubber, shoots him before Sherblom's eyes, right hand cut off. People flee out of the town. All except the old chiefs are forced to go away and work rubber. The sentries are from the wildest tribes. When they get to this work, they are many times worse. They are really small kings in the towns, and often kill the people for the sake of the rubber. If the rubber does not reach the full amount required, the sentries attack the natives. They kill some and bring the heads to the commissioner. Others are brought to the commissioner as prisoners. Hundreds are constantly taken down in large steamers. From this village I went on to another, where I met a soldier who pointed to a basket and said to me, Look, I have only two hands. He meant there were not enough to make up for the rubber he had not brought. He had several prisoners tied to trees. When I came back, some of the villages were in an uproar. When I reached the river, I turned and saw that the people had large hammocks in which they were gathering the rubber to be taken to the commissioner. I also saw smoked hands, and the prisoners waiting to be taken to the commissioner. This is only one of the places in which these practices occur. There is a small island in the stream at Lake Mantumba. The people had not been able to bring in the full amount of rubber. The officers with some soldiers went along there. Several of the natives were killed. I saw the dead bodies floating on the lake with the right hand cut off, and the officer told me when I came back why they had been killed. It was for the rubber. 
In fact, the officers have always freely told me about the many who were killed, and always in connection with India rubber. In one village which I passed through, I saw two or three men on the wayside, quite recently killed, about an hour before. The sentry who had to oversee the gathering of the rubber told me they had killed the men because they had not brought in the rubber. When I crossed the stream, I saw some dead bodies hanging down from the branches in the water. As I turned away my face at the horrible sight, one of the native corporals, who was following us down, said, Oh, that is nothing. A few days ago I returned from a fight, and I brought the white men one hundred sixty hands, and they were thrown into the river. I have seen extracts of letters in which the writers have freely told about hundreds being killed, hundreds of hands brought by the sentries, hundreds of slaves being taken, and one of the state officials said to a resident agent, I have two hundred slaves here. Do you want some? Another agent told me that he had himself seen a state officer at one of the outposts pay a certain number of brass rods, local currency, to the soldiers for a number of hands they had brought. One of the soldiers told me the same. That was about the time I saw the native killed before my own eyes. The soldier said, Don't take this to heart so much. They kill us if we don't bring the rubber. The commissioner has promised us, if we have plenty of hands, he will shorten our service. I have brought him plenty of hands already, and I expect my time of service will soon be finished. Mr. Sherblom also gave many particulars of the monstrous demands for food, fish, etc. upon the people, the fines inflicted upon them for shortage, their general condition of impoverishment, etc. Campbell, Dugland a missionary belonging, I believe, to a Scotch Presbyterian mission. He laboured for about a quarter of a century in the southeastern portion of the state, Katanga. His voluminous reports to Mr. Foxbourne cover a very extensive period. Those I am about to quote cover the period 1891 to 1898, published in 1904. Area, Southeastern Region Mr. Campbell subsectionalizes his report into the ivory regime, the rubber regime, treatment of natives, the sentry system, etc. Under treatment of natives, he writes, This is, and ever has been, shocking, and the cause of revolts, troubles, and, when possible, exodus into the territories of other powers. The treatment of the downtrodden natives since state occupation has brought about a moral and material degeneration. Through the gross and wholesale immorality and forcing of women and girls into lives of shame, African family life and its sanctities have been violated, and the seeds of disease sown broadcast over the Congo state are producing their harvest already. Formerly native conditions put restrictions on the spread of disease and localized it to small areas, but the 17,000 soldiers moved hither and thither to districts removed from their wives and relations to suit Congo policy must have women wherever they go, and these must be provided from the district natives. Native institutions, rights, and customs which one would think ought to be the basis of good government are ignored. Among the incidents he gives characterizing the ivory regime, I quote the following. After that, Kataro, another very large chief living near the apex of the western and eastern Lualaba, was attacked. The crowds were fired into promiscuously, and fifteen were killed, including four women and a babe on its mother's breast. The heads were cut off and brought to the officer in charge, who then sent his men to cut off the hands also, and these were pierced, strung, and dried over the campfire. The heads, with many others, I saw myself. The town, prosperous ones, was burnt, and what they could not carry off was destroyed. Crowds of people were caught, mostly old women and young women, and three fresh rope gangs were added. These poor prisoner gangs were mere skeletons of skin and bone, and their bodies cut frightfully with a chicot when I saw them. Choyombo's very large town was next attacked. A lot of people were killed, and heads and hands were cut off 
and taken back to the officers. Shortly after, the state caravans, with flags flying and bugles blowing, entered the mission station at Luanza, on Lake Mueru, where I was then alone, and I shall not soon forget the sickening sight of deep baskets of human heads. These baskets of war trophies were used for a big war dance, to which was added the state quota of powder and percussion caps. I made a journey myself to the copper hills in the west, to the caves, to Ntenkes, Ktangas, Makakas, and Katekes, all in South Lamba, and found the sentries everywhere living like kings, plundering, killing, and burning villages in the name of the state. I append a list of the villages and chiefs at sentry posts known to me, and each manned by two black soldiers. Here follow twenty villages, with their localities, etc. Each of these posts was manned, as stated, by two black soldiers to look after state interests, chiefs, and ivory. Perhaps you will say, why did you not speak out and report all this? My first experience in Katanga was Captain X's threat to imprison my colleague for denouncing these doings. Every time I made representations, they were declared impossible, or the answer was, I will ask my head sentry to make inquiries, the head sentry being one of the worst blackguards in the country. Nothing was ever proved. He would not believe his soldiers could be guilty of such misconduct, or, well, they must have carte blanche, or the natives would not respect the state. Sometimes might is right, would be the curt reply. What could one say? There were no judges or courts of appeal, and the officer, often at his wit's end, would say, What can I do? I must get ivory. I have no law or regulation book. I am the only law and only god in Katanga. Under the rubber regime, similar stories are given, always with an abundance of names, places, etc. Here are a few short extracts. Meanwhile, on the Luapula, similar abuses existed, and women were raped and made to serve both white and black, until many of the best and biggest villages crossed into British territory, where they live in peace. Follows a long list of the villages which have migrated. The wholesale exodus is due to Belgian raiding, the sentry system, and the maltreatment of the natives. Under the sentry system, Mr. Campbell says, I have known them tie up chiefs for a week in ropes, and keep them tied until a sufficient ransom was brought. I have met them on the road on plundering expeditions, travelling in hammocks with from twenty to thirty carriers, these of course impressed into the work, besides other carriers who carried their pots, cloth, provisions, and guns wherever they went. It was a common practice to remove sentries who were unsuccessful in securing sufficient ivory, and to replace them by others, more ruffianly disposed, whose ivory-extorting powers had been previously tested. Banks, of the American Baptist Missionary Union, reporting locally from the Bolengi of 1896, area, central region, describes raid of state troopers upon the villages of Bandaka, Wajiko. Cause, poor quality of rubber. Questions soldiers and is told fifty people have been killed and twenty-eight taken prisoners. Sees the prisoners taken through the mission station. Counts sixteen women tied, neck to neck. Some of these women carrying their tiny children. Several young children were walking on before who were also prisoners. Visits the raided village. In a little shed lay one of my late school children, a promising young lad. I lifted the leaves by which he was covered, and saw his right hand cut off. I then went through the village, and saw the people burying their dead. I counted over twenty bodies, and newly filled up graves. All the bodies had the right hand cut off. Kenred Smith, of the British Baptist Missionary Society, testified before the Commission of Inquiry in 1904 as to atrocities committed in 1893. Extract from Letter to the Author, published this year in C.R.A. Organ. Area, Central Region. 
I thought that all evidence submitted to the members of the commission would be given in due course to the public, and was not therefore too careful in making manuscript notes of my remarks before it. Happily I have notes. I submitted them to them, and now send you the substance of my remarks. Details. Expedition sent on June 2, 1898, by local agent of the Anversois, Vida Section 4, to punish people who sought to escape the rubber tax. Villages of Mika and Bosomakuma attacked. Men, women, and children killed and mutilated village of Bosolo then attacked, and became, according to native evidence, a veritable shambles. Visited Mika, and saw mutilated bodies or parts of bodies representing some twenty people, and new-made graves, bringing up the number to at least thirty. Native evidence placed before him showed two hundred people killed. A cannibal feast followed the slaughter. Complained locally, so far as he knows, no action taken. Clark Joseph of the American Baptist Missionary Union Extracts from his diary, personal correspondence, and reports to local officials from 1894 to 1899. The complete documents were handed to the Congo Commission in 1904, and suppressed together with all other documentary evidence brought home by that commission. They are now made public for the first time here, with Dr. Babur's permission. The area from which Mr. Clark writes is the Domaine de la Couronne, and this account, together with Mr. Scrivener's, which will be referred to later, will show an appreciative public how the regenerator of Africa obtains his revenues. Ikoko, Clark's mission station, represented in diary and letters in 1893 as a large town, beautifully situated in a bay which, say, four thousand people within a radius of one and a half miles from the mission station. The people are fine-looking, bold and active. In 1894, the district first came under the influence of the philanthropic monarch, Leopold II. Large demands for rubber principally are made, also for fish and forced labor for the state plantations of Bikoro. Outrages commence. November 15, 1894. Seven Erebus were foully murdered about half an hour from here. They had been tied and brutally shot when unable to move away from their murderers. My only hope under present rule is for us to try to put the information into the hands of the American ambassador and try to get him to personally lay the reports before Leopold II. I do not think he can know of what is being done in his name, to a correspondent. November 28th. The state soldiers brought in seven hands and reported having shot the people in the act of running away to the French side, to a correspondent in Scotland. December 8th. A year ago we passed or visited between Irubu and Ikoko the following villages, here follow the names of eight villages with probable population of each, total 3,180. A week ago I went up, and only at Ngero, one of the villages in the list, were there any people. There we found ten. To a correspondent. April 12, 1895. I am sorry that rubber palavers continue. Every week we hear of some fighting, and there are frequent rows, even in our village, with the armed and unruly soldiers. During the past twelve months it has cost more lives than native wars and superstitions would have sacrificed in three to five years. The people make this comparison among themselves. It seems incredible and awful to think of these savage men armed with rifles and let loose to hunt and kill people, because they do not get rubber to sell at a mere nothing to the state, and it is blood-curdling to see them returning with hands of the slain, and to find the hands of young children amongst bigger ones evidencing their bravery. To a correspondent. May 3rd. The war was on account of the rubber. 
the state demands that the natives shall make rubber and sell same to its agents at a very low price. The natives do not like it. It is hard work and very poor pay, and takes them away from their homes into the forest, where they feel very unsafe, as there are always feuds among them. The rubber from this district has cost hundreds of lives, and the scenes I have witnessed while unable to help the oppressed have been almost enough to make me wish I were dead. The soldiers are themselves savages, some even cannibals, trained to use rifles, and in many cases they are sent away without any supervision, and they do as they please. When they come to a town, no man's property or wife is safe, and when they are at war, they are like devils. Imagine them returning from fighting some rebels, see on the bow of the canoe is a pole, and a bundle of something on it. These are the hands, right hands, of sixteen warriors they have slain. Warriors! Don't you see among them the hands of little children and girls? I have seen them. I have seen where the trophy has been cut off while the poor heart beats strongly enough to shoot the blood from the cut arteries at a distance of fully four feet. To a correspondent in America. May. All the fighting about us on the lake for, say, eight months has been on account of the rubber. To a correspondent in America. May 17th. Nearly all Ikoko is in the bush. This everlasting rubber palaver is sending lots into eternity, and many to live like wild beasts in the woods, where they are afraid to make a fire for fear of attracting the man-hunters, i.e. the soldiers. To a correspondent. May 28th. Kindly let me appeal to you again on behalf of Ikoko, that the tax of rubber may be taken off. To Commissaire Fieves. Footnote. In the official bulletin for June 1896, there is a new logistic report on the admirable assiduity of this official in obtaining rubber. It tells us that the district under his administration produced in 1894 650 tons of rubber, bought at two and a half pence european price and sold at five shilling five pence per kilo in antwerp end of footnote june five eighteen ninety five there is a matter i want to report to you regarding the nkaken sentries you remember some time ago they took eleven canoes and shot some ikoko people as a proof, they went to you with some hands, of which three were the hands of little children. We heard from one of their paddlers that one child was not dead when its hand was cut off, but did not believe the story. Three days after we were told that the child was still alive in the bush. I sent four of my men to see, and they brought back a little girl whose right hand had been cut off, and she left to die of the wound. There was no other wound. As I was going to see Dr. Rusus about my own sickness, I took the child to him, and he has cut the arm and made it right, and I think she will live. But I think such awful cruelty should be punished. To M. Mueller, Chef de District, Bicoro. June 7th. How many people have been slain for the sake of rubber, I cannot tell but the number is large. To a correspondent. March 25, 1896. This rubber traffic is steeped in blood, and if the natives were to rise and sweep every white person on the upper Congo into eternity, there would still be left a fearful balance to their credit. Is it not possible for some American of influence to see the king of the Belgians and let him know what is being done in his name? The lake is reserved for the king, no traders allowed, and to collect rubber for him hundreds of men, women, and children have been shot. To a correspondent. The Congo government in Brussels, e.g. the king, denied the existence of its royal preserve until 1902. 
The proceeds are handled by the king exclusively and are not paid into the so-called public revenues of the Congo state. Vida section 4. The exasperated natives turn upon their destroyers. April 15th. Two white men and about fifty soldiers killed by the Montaka natives on the lake. Ikoko and Ngero are the only important villages not in arms, all caused through the rubber demand and mode of operation. To a correspondent. November 2, 1895. Some fighting in Ikoko two weeks ago. Two old men, one old woman, one girl, and two children killed. The old woman's hand was cut off. I saw the body. One child of about two and a half or three years of age had been struck over the stomach with the butt of a gun and then thrown into the water, and a younger child had been no doubt treated in the same way, but its body was not found. A young girl, about ten, was with them, and she had been beaten and thrown into the water and died. The woman had been stabbed after being taken prisoner. The old woman was shot. To a correspondent. We have seen that in 1893 Ikoko had a population of 4,000 souls. I complete these particular extracts with the following appeal to Lieutenant de Baruch, Commissaire, dated May 5, 1899. I desire to pray you that some alteration be made in the present state demands on Ikoko, or before long there will be no people here but those attached to the mission. Now, probably, there are not over six hundred of all ages of people in the town and fishing camps. There is not one native chief of influence. While I have been here, there have been four chiefs of considerable force, but two of them were shot, and the other two were several times in the chain, and at last died in the town here. At present, the death rate is very great, because the people are badly nourished." Such is the story of Ikoko and neighborhood. End of section 8。section 9 of Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber the Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morrell The Deeds, Part 2 Weeks, John, of the British Baptist Missionary Society Extract from a report to the District Commissioner of the Bangala Region Dated Monsembe, November 6, 1897 Handed to the Commission of Inquiry in January 1905 published in full in the C.R.A. organ for July 1905. Area, Riverbanks, and Central Region Last year the country all about here was flooded, yet you levied your cassava tax month after month upon the people, in addition to your oil, fowls, and goat tax, etc. The people here had not enough to eat, and as their cassava was destroyed by the flood, they had to buy it at an exorbitant price from more fortunate districts. This year again the country is flooded and the farms spoiled, but I suppose you will enforce the cassava tax and the people have to starve again, and why? To feed and strengthen the state soldiers, to raid them again in their weakness. You take away the sturdy young men, leaving only the old people and children, so that every steamer that stays here loots the town because the proper defenders have been taken off by the state. Mr. Weeks, reporting to the District Commissioner and to the Governor-General in June 1903, deals with the depopulation of the country since 1890. His full letter is published in the West African Mail, October 1903. It covers 13 years. It distresses me very much to see and hear that this town and others of this and neighboring districts are in a more deplorable state than they were two years ago when Mr. Weeks returned to Europe on furlough. When we came to settle in Monsembe in 1890, there were over 7,000 people between here and Bokongo. In 1900, 
there were very few over three thousand, and now there are not many over one thousand. If the decrease continues at the same rate, in another five years there will be no people left. Proceeds to set forth the causes. Continual deportation of young men to serve as soldiers and workmen, and of young women for other purposes. Demand for men levied without any regard to population. Flight to get away from oppressive taxation. Sleeping sickness thinks that this disease would never have taken such a hold upon the people if they had not had their spirit crushed out of them by an ever-increasing burden of taxation. Taxation in foodstuffs becoming heavier and heavier. Imposition of fines sapping the life of the people. Heart-rendering to compare this district now with what it was in 1890. In letters to friends in England, dated June and July 1903, I say, without any fear of contradiction, that the condition of the people is, to put it mildly, 100% worse than in 1893. The entire population of the district is now 9,400, and quite half has recently been driven from the bush to the river to repopulate its banks. Stanley, in 1885, reckoned this same district at 80,000 people. In 1890, Mr. Stapleton and myself, in search of a site, landed at a very large number of towns, and concluded that the figures of 1885 were too high, and put the population down at 50,000. The population has dropped in 13 years from 50,000 to under 5,000. This is not the only district which has gone down in population. Starting from Stanley Pool, Pwemba has about 100 for every thousand it once had. Bolobo has not a third of its former population. Here follows an enumeration of towns with their old and former population. Morrison William, of the American Presbyterian Mission, reports outrages in the Kasai district beginning in 1898. They are given in the next record. Murphy, of the American Baptist Union, describes in times of 1895 the raids and atrocities carried on by Congo troops in his district from 1893 to 5. The hands, the hands of men, women, and children, were placed in rows before the commissaire, who counted them to see that the natives had not wasted cartridges. Area, Domaine de la Corune, Lake Mantumba. Casement Roger, British Consul in the Congo. It is difficult to dissect, from the point of view of time, the long and detailed disclosures of Consul Casement, which disclosures cover the past as well as dealing with the present. But here and there are passages which can be selected as showing how the present-day situation is the outcome of long years of oppression. Consul Casement's report was published in 1904. Area, Domaine de la Corune. The population of the lakeside towns would seem to have diminished within the last ten years by sixty to seventy per cent. It was in 1893 that an effort to levy an India rubber imposition in this district was begun, and for some four or five years this imposition could only be collected at the cost of continual fighting. Area, Riverbanks. The station at Bikoro has been established as a government plantation for about ten years. It stands on the actual site of the former native town of Bikoro, an important settlement in 1893, now reduced to a handful of ill-kept, untidy huts, inhabited by only a remnant of its former expropriated population. We touched at several points on the French shore, and on the 25th of July reached Lukolela, where I spent two days. This district had, when I visited it in 1887, numbered fully 5,000 people. Today the population is given, after careful enumeration, at less than 600. Bolobo used to be one of the most important native settlements along the south bank of the Upper Congo, and the population in the early days of civilized rule numbered fully 40,000 people chiefly of the Bubangi tribe. 
Today the population is believed to be not more than 7,000 or 8,000 souls. The Bolobo men were famous in former days for their voyages to Stanley Pool and their keen trading ability. All of their large canoes have today disappeared, and while some of them still hunt hippopotami, which are still numerous in the adjacent waters, I did not observe anything like industry among them. Indeed, it would be hard to say how the people now live. Perhaps the most striking change observed during my journey into the interior was the great reduction observable everywhere in native life. Communities I had formerly known as large and flourishing centers of population are today entirely gone, or now exist in such diminished numbers as to be no longer recognizable. The southern shores of Stanley Pool had formerly a population of fully 5,000 botecas. These people some 12 years ago decided to abandon their homes, and in one night the great majority of them crossed over into French territory. Where formerly had stretched these populous native African villages, I saw today only a few scattered European houses. In Leopoldville there are not, I should estimate, one hundred of the original natives or their descendants now residing. Area, Domaine de la Couronne. In the notes to his report, Consul Casement gives details of native evidence showing how the lakeside people were extirpated. I decided to visit the nearest settlement of these fugitives. I asked first why they had left their homes and had come to live in a strange, far-off country where they owned nothing and were little better than servitors. All, when the question was put, women as well as men shouted out, on account of the rubber tax levied by the government posts. I asked them how this tax was imposed. From our country, each village had to take twenty loads of rubber. These loads were big. They were as big as this producing an empty basket which came nearly up to the handle of my walking-stick. We had to take these loads in four times a month. Now how much pay did you get? Entire audience. We got no pay. We got nothing. It used to take ten days to get the twenty baskets of rubber. We were always in the forest, and then when we were late we were killed. We had to go further and further into the forest to find the rubber vines, to go without food, and our women had to give up cultivating the fields and gardens. Then we starved. Wild beasts, the leopards, killed some of us when we were working away in the forest, and others got lost or died from exposure and starvation, and we begged the white men to leave us alone, saying we could get no more rubber. But the white men and their soldiers said, Go, you're only beasts yourselves. You are Nyama, meat. We tried, always going further into the forest, and when we failed and our rubber was short, the soldiers came up to our towns and shot us. Many were shot. Some had their ears cut off. Others were tied up with ropes around their necks and bodies and taken away. We fled because we could not endure the things done to us. Our chiefs were hanged, and we were killed and starved and worked beyond endurance to get rubber. The white men told their soldiers, you kill only women, you cannot kill men. So when the soldiers killed us, here he stopped and hesitated, and then pointing to the private parts of my bulldog, it was lying asleep at my feet, he said, then they cut off those things and took them to the white men, who said, It is true you have killed men. You mean to tell me that any white man ordered your bodies to be mutilated like that, and those parts of you carried to him? all shouting, Yes, many white men. You say this is true? Were many of you so treated after being shot? All shouting, Nkoto, Nkoto. Very many, very many. Mr. Scrivener in his diary confirms this last statement. He heard it from the lips of the sentries themselves, and in the Mongala massacres of 1899, the agents of the Anniversoise confessed to ordering sexual mutilations. Dealing in a long enclosure with the appalling depopulation of this region, Consul Casement gives as a primary reason thereof. War, in which children and women were killed as well as men. 
Women and children were killed not in all cases by stray bullets, but were taken as prisoners and killed. Sad to say, these horrible cases were not always the acts of some black soldier. Proof was laid against one officer who shot one woman and one man, while they were before him as prisoners with their hands tied, and no attempt was made to deny the truth of the statement. To those killed in the so-called war must be added large numbers who died while kept as prisoners of war. The irregular food supply has been another cause, says the consul. The native is without ambition because without hope. He does not attend to his own plantations owing to the sense of insecurity. When sickness comes, he does not care. A third cause is the lower percentage of births. Weakened bodies brings this about. Also, women refuse to bear children and take means to save themselves from motherhood. They give us the reason that, if war should come, a woman big with child or with a baby to carry cannot well run away and hide from the soldiers. With regard to the mutilations practiced by the soldiers and referred to by Mr. Clark and others, the consul says, Of acts of persistent mutilation by government soldiers of this nature, I had many statements made to me, some of them specifically, others in a general way. Of the fact of this mutilation, and the causes inducing it, there can be no shadow of doubt. It was not a native custom prior to the coming of the white man. It was not the outcome of the primitive instincts of savages in their fights between village and village. It was a deliberate act of the soldiers of European administration, and these men themselves never made any concealment that in committing these acts they were but obeying the positive orders of their superiors. Whitehead, John, of the British Baptist Missionary Society Extracts from Letter to Governor-General, dated Lukulela, July 28, 1903 Published in Africa No. 1, 1904 White Book Area, Riverbanks The population of the villages of Lukulela in January 1891 must have been not less than 6,000 people but when I counted the whole population of Lukulela at the end of December, 1896, I found it to be only 719, and I estimated from the decrease, as far as we could count up the known number of deaths during the year, that at the same rate of decrease, in ten years the people would be reduced to about 400. But judge of my heartache when on counting them all again on Friday and Saturday last, to find only a population of 352, and the death rate rapidly increasing. Records from 1899 to 1903 With the year 1898, the great trusts of the central region came into being, and to the horrors of the Domaine de la Couronne, and all that had been up to that time Domaine Privé, were added the horrors of the trust area as the agents of these concerns, which are the king under varying labels, vide section 4, struck new ground, or, as was the case with the ABIR, carried further devastation into the districts already tapped. Lacroix and other agents of the Anversaw Trust, Confessions of Area, Central Region, Mongala Fighting in the Mongala district had been continuous since 1898. On April 10, 1900, the Ninwe Gazette of Antwerp published the Confessions of Lacroix. Instructed by his superiors to attack a certain village for shortage in rubber, he had killed in the course of his raid many women and children. I am going to appear before the judge for having killed 150 men, cut off 60 hands, for having crucified women and children, for having mutilated many men and hung their sexual remains on the village fence. Other confessions followed, published in Le Petit Bleu and other papers. The Congo courts inflicted long terms of imprisonment. The men never served them and have long since been released. The defense was identical. They had acted under instructions to force rubber by any and every means. The superiors were not troubled. Later on, as we shall see, the trial of the man Caldron 
also an agent of the Anversa, showed, four years later, a precisely similar state of affairs existing in the district. Weeks, John. See above. Letter to protest to District Commissioner of Bangala, dated Monsemba, November 30, 1903. Published in the West African Mail in 1904. Describes punishment of towns of Bokongo, Bogondo, etc., for shortage in foodstuffs by a force of 150 soldiers under an officer. Gives names of 11 women, 10 men, and a girl slaughtered unresisting. It is very evident from the different places in which these people were shot down that there was no armed resistance. Have you neither mothers nor sisters that you can treat women in this brutal way? Mr. Weeks proceeds to give particulars of increasing wretchedness of people owing to scandalous taxation, people compelled to sell their relatives into slavery to meet it, gives names of people sold into slavery to provide foodstuffs for state stations, lieutenant in charge was allowed to return to europe although a subsequent inquiry confirmed the truth of weeks charges so admitted by the commission of inquiry in a letter to the author dated december twenty four nineteen o three published in the west african mail nineteen o four gives abundant and detailed statistics of taxation in foodstuffs shows that the 820 natives of all ages and both sexes in the four sections of Malela, Bogondo, Mungondo and Bokongo must supply each year to the state foodstuffs aggregating 1,605 pounds, 16 shilling, 8 pence in value. I need scarcely point out that very young children, very old people and invalids cannot earn a wage or even farm or fish, Consequently, the burden falls heavier on those who can, and the vision before them is one of unceasing toil in order to comply with the demands of the state. Is it any wonder that natives die under the burden? The wonder to me is that so many are alive after these seven years of oppression and taxation. Death has less horror than this constant grind, this perpetually trying to fill a bottomless sack, this everlasting payment of heavy taxes, meeting exorbitant fines, being shot down untried, or forced to work in the chain on a state station. Death is kinder than this sort of living. My colleague has just returned from spending a week among the Nbodo towns, and his comment on what he there beheld was, Death and decay in all around, I see. Tilkins, Lieutenant Officer of the Force Public. His letters read in the Belgian House in July 1903. Cover 1897 to 1900. At the time he wrote them, Tilkins was carrying out his duties as fixed by his superior officers. Vita sections 1 and 4. Area Northeastern Region. Domaine Privé. Letter to Major Lessons of the Belgian Army on July 20. 1898. The chef de poste of Buta announces the arrival of the steamer Van der Kerhove, which is to be floated upon the Nile. He will require the colossal number of 1,500 carriers. Unhappy blacks! I do not like to think of it. I ask myself, where can I find them? If the roads were good it might be different, but they are barely cleared crossed repeatedly by marshes, where many will find a certain death. Hunger and the fatigues of an eight days' march will account for many more. What blood this transport has not caused to flow! Three times already have I been forced to make war upon chiefs who refuse to cooperate in the work. Unfortunately, they are but poorly paid for such arduous labor, five pence worth of cowries for the upward journey, and a piece of American cloth for the homeward journey. If a chief refuses, it is war, and that atrocious war, perfected weapons of destruction against spears and lances. A native chief has just come to tell me, my village is a heap of ruins, all my wives have been killed, yet what can I do? When I tell my people to carry the white man's goods, they flee to the woods, and when your soldiers come to recruit, 
I can give them no one because my people prefer to die of hunger in the woods rather than do transport work. Often am I compelled to put these unhappy chiefs in the chains until some one hundred or two hundred carriers are obtained, which procures their liberation. Very often my soldiers find the villages deserted. Then they seize women and children and capture them. To his mother in 1898. Commandant Meses, my district commissioner, is about to return, and Commandant Verstraten, the friend of Major Lenson's, replaces him. It is he who inspected my station and who complimented me highly. He told me that the nature of his report would depend upon the quantity of rubber produced. When he left me, he told me to employ myself actively in collecting rubber, and from 360 kilos in September, my production rose to 1,500 kilos in October, and this month I trust it will be over 2,000 kilos. By January, I shall be making 4,000 kilos per month, which makes 500 francs profit above my salary. I really am a lucky fellow, and if I play at rubber for two years, I shall make 12,000 francs over and above my salary. On January 26, 1899, Commandant Verstraten wrote to the Governor-General. I draw the government's attention to Lieutenant Tilkins, Landegem, and Verslipe. These agents have specially distinguished themselves in putting in train the exploitation of rubber. To them is due the surprising results obtained in the area allotted to their action. Tilkins to Major Lensons, May 12, 25, July 11, and August 10. 1899. I expect a general uprising. I think I warned you of this, Major, in my last. The motive is always the same. The natives are tired of the existing regime, transport work, rubber collecting, furnishing livestock for whites and blacks. For three months I have been fighting with ten days rest. I have 152 prisoners. For two years I have been making war in this country, always accompanied by forty or fifty albinis. Footnote, e.g., soldiers armed with the albini rifle. End of footnote. Yet I cannot say I have subjugated the people. They prefer to die. What can I do? I am paid to do my work. I am an instrument in the hands of my chiefs, and I obey the orders which discipline exacts. First Rotten was never punished. Nay, he has been promoted in the Belgian army, which he continues to adorn. Ruskin of the Congo Balolo Mission Declarations before Judicial Officer Rossi, April 12, 1902 Minutes taken down by Mr. Jeffrey of the same mission, in shorthand. Confirmed before Commission of Inquiry, and accepted as correct, 1904. Published in 1904 by author. Area ABIR Concession, Central Region, Extracts In the early months of 1899, M. had a large number of prisoners, e.g. hostages, at the factory. They were improperly fed and cared for, and died at the rate of from three, five, and sometimes ten a day. They were dragged by a piece of ngoji tied to the foot out into the bush, and only a little earth and a few sticks thrown on top of them. Hands and feet were left sticking up, and the stench was awful. On July 18, 1899, four were released. An old man was found in the mission station. We gave him food and water, which he ate ravenously. The director came up and released 106 prisoners. We saw them pass our station, living skeletons. Some were so much reduced that they had to be carried home. Among them were old, grey-headed men and women. Many children were born in prison. They also seized Balua, the wife of Botanga, and M. F. had her flogged, giving her two hundred shikot. So severely was she dealt with that blood and urine flowed from her. She died shortly after. One man had bad rubber. M. G. compelled him to lie on the ground, and Ilunga, one of the sentries, gave the man she caught. G then struck the man with the flat of a machete, and he jumped up. G drew his revolver and shot him through the leg. 
M. F. thought that his men were not strong enough and therefore could not compel the people to bring in what he considered sufficient rubber. Once when he was away his men stole some rubber, and for this he had them tied up right in the sun to stakes for a day and a night. Mrs. Cole, now Mrs. Harbour, when passing on her way to the school, saw the men there from a distance. They were naked and without food and water all day, and so great was their agony that their tongues were hanging out. De Deer, French explorer attached to the Bourg de Boussas expedition, passed through the Lado enclave in October 1902, reports the neighborhood of the Congo State Fort at Dufil deserted by its former inhabitants. Along the whole course of the route, the natives had fled, fearing the white man's impositions. Area, northeastern region, domain privé. Cromer, Erlov, reporting to British government of the same region in 1903. White Book, Africa, number 1, 1904, says, The reason of all this, deserted condition of the country, oppression, etc., is obvious enough. The Belgians are disliked. The people fly from them, and it is no wonder they should do so, for I am informed that the soldiers are allowed full liberty to plunder, that payments are rarely made for supplies. I understand that no Belgian officer can move outside the settlements without a strong guard. Grogan, independent English explorer, says of the whole eastern frontier, the main privé. From the north of Lake Albert to Lake Mveru, there is a perfect state of chaos. Whole districts are administered by incompetent officials, often non-commissioned officers, and the troops are the lowest type of natives, almost invariably cannibals. The people were terrorized and living in marshes. The Belgians have crossed the frontier, descended into the valley, shot down large numbers of natives, British subjects, driven off the young women and cattle, and actually tied up and burned the old women. I do not make these statements without having gone into the matter. Every village has been burned to the ground, and as I fled from the country I saw skeletons, skeletons everywhere, and such postures, what tales of horror they told. Thus a tract of country about three thousand square miles in extent has been depopulated and devastated. This was the Congo Free State. When in Mbuya, the Balega told me similar tales. Here I was repeatedly given accounts that tallied in all essentials, and further north the Wakoba made the same piteous complaints, and I saw myself that a country well populated and responsive to just treatment in Lugard's time is now practically a howling wilderness. Bakari, captain surgeon in the Navy, Royal Italian envoy to the Congo in regard of a bogus immigration scheme fostered by the King Leopold to throw dust in the eyes of the Italian public, passed through the eastern district, Domaine Privé, in 1903. Report suppressed by Italian government. A bald, very bald summary, only allowed to appear. As to the natives, those nearest to the proposed Italian settlements are nearly all in revolt against the Belgians. Everywhere the blacks are terrorized and suspicious. The natives have been compelled to work, so we have all the ghastly scenes of the slave trade, the collar, the lash, and the press gang. Interviewed by the Giornale d'Italia, Captain Bacari stated that the Italian officers employed in the Congo were intended to be used in the enslavement of the natives, but that they had refused to carry out this design, and had in consequence become objects of persecution. Many reports of the Italian officers employed in the Congo army were published by the Italian papers in 1905, covering their experiences chiefly in the eastern district. Summing up these reports, the Corriere della Sera says, Slavery nominally established is rampant, cannibalism exists, and the sole desire of the native is, if possible, to flee from the white man. Vida, also statement in section 4. Lloyd, A.B., independent English traveller, crossed the Congo from the Samliki to the ocean in 1899. Area, northeastern region, domain privé. In the afternoon I was walking through the potato fields when I came upon sixty or a hundred women, 
all with hoes cultivating the ground, and close at hand a native soldier with a rifle across his shoulder, mounting guard. I inquired where all the poor creatures had come from, and was told a sad story, alas, not uncommon in the Belgian Free State. A Wakona chief had been told to do some work for the Belgians, and when he refused, soldiers were sent, and upon the least resistance the men were shot down and the women captured. It was a sad sight to behold these poor creatures driven like dogs here and there and kept hard at their toil from morning till night. One of the Belgian soldiers told me that there had been many killed, including the chief, and when I said what a terrible thing it was, he merely laughed and said, Washensi Bevana, they are only heathen. Scrivener, A. E., of the British Baptist Missionary Society, traversed the tract 150 miles long on foot in the Domaine de la Couronne in July, August, and September 1903. Allowed the author to make full use of his diary, printed in full in the West African Mail in 1905. It is very voluminous, and the briefest summary here given. In the afternoon we passed a ruined mud house, and were told that this had been a rubber post with soldiers in charge, but that since all the people had run away, it had been given up. Later on we saw still more numerous sites where only recently thousands of people had been living. Cassava was still growing in the plantations, and bananas were rotting on the trees. All as still as the grave. A little further on we found another deserted rubber post. Just as the sun was setting, we reached a large and imposing state post. All round were plentiful signs of the former population. Later I heard from a white official that the remaining population did not number a hundred, all told. For hours we walked through a deserted country, though here and there on both sides were frequent signs of a recent population. Three chiefs came in with all the adult members of their people, and altogether there were not three hundred. And this is where not more than six or seven years previously there were at least three thousand. It made one's heart heavy to listen to the tales of bloodshed and cruelty. We passed through miles and miles of deserted sites, and on all sides were groves of palms and bananas and many other evidences of a big people. A man bringing in rather under the proper amount of rubber, the white man flies into a rage, and seizing a rifle from one of the guards, shoots him dead on the spot. Men who had tried to run from the country and had been caught were brought to the station and made to stand one behind the other, and an Albini bullet sent through them. A pity to waste cartridges on such wretches. On M, removing from the station, his successor nearly fainted on attempting to enter the station prison, in which were numbers of poor wretches so reduced by starvation and the awful stench from weeks of accumulation of filth that they were not able to stand. In due course we reached Ibali. There was hardly a sound building in the place. Why such dilapidation? The commandant away on a trip likely to extend into three months the sub-lieutenant away in another direction on a punitive expedition. In other words, the station must be neglected, and rubber hunting carried out with all vigour. I stayed here two days, and the one thing that impressed itself on me was the collection of rubber. I saw long files of men come, as at Mbongo, with their little baskets under their arms, saw them paid their milk tin full of salt and the two yards of calico flung at the headmen, saw their trembling timidity. So much for my journey to the lake, Lake Leopold II. It has enlarged my knowledge of the country, and also, alas, my knowledge of the awful deeds enacted in the mad haste to get rich. The Bulgarian atrocities might be considered as mildness itself when compared with what has been done here. End of section 9「Section 10 of Red Rubber – The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber 
The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Moore. Section 10. The Deeds, Part 3. Bond Charles of the Congo Balolo Mission in a letter published in December 1903 says of the ABIR concession territory, I have the evidence of a number of men working for us at the present time that at their own town on the Bosomo River numbers of men have been killed outright, and others have died from having their hands cut off because they would not submit to demands. Casement Roger, see above. To give a summary of Consul Casement's report describing the condition of affairs observed by him in 1903, which would convey to the reader a just notion of its cumulative force, would be impossible, without devoting to it more space than I can afford. The area affected is the riverbank region on the main highway of the Leopoldian civilization. Here are a few short summaries. A village of 240 people all told, compelled to produce one ton of carefully prepared foodstuffs every week, at a price far below the current figure. Other villages in much the same situation forced to carry their tax long distances. A group of villages whose population in 1887 was 5,000, now reduced to 500. Raids and slaughter for delay in paying food taxes. Page 26. Insufficiency of food accountable for much of the sickness prevalent. Page 28. Monstrous and illegal fines for shortage in food supplies or rubber, impoverishing the people and leading to general wretchedness and despair. Natives fleeing from the white man, where formerly they greeted him with open arms. Villages taxed in gum copal to an almost incredible extent. A group of villages working all the year round and subject to the usual punishments for shortage, producing per town three hundred pounds per annum value in gum copal, receiving ten pounds per annum as a return. A native of Montaka, a typical case, produces some twelve pounds of gum copal per annum and receives in exchange one shilling and four pence for his entire year's work the value of an adult fowl, according to local prices. Mutilation and outrage frequent and habitual. Slavery forced upon the people, that is, selling relatives, in order to meet state demands. Women taken to hostage houses before the consul's eyes. Their menfolk guilty of shortage in rubber, etc., etc. I would earnestly beg every reader of this volume to spend eight and a half pence and write to Messrs. Harrison and Sons, St. Martin's Lane, for a copy of the report. Africa, number 1, 1904. Berthier, Lyon, Frenchman, visited the Upper Congo and spent some time in the country, 1899 to 1901. His diary was published by the Colonial Institute of Marseille in 1902. Area Riverbanks, North and Central Region, Domaine Privé. Here are short extracts. Belgian post of Imes well constructed. The chef de poste is absent. He has gone to punish the village of Mbachi, guilty of being a little late in paying the rubber tax. A canoe full of Congo state soldiers returns from the pillage of Mbachi. Thirty killed, fifty wounded. At three o'clock arrive at Mbachi, the scene of the bloody punishment of the chef de poste at Imes. Poor village. The debris of miserable huts. One goes away humiliated and saddened from these scenes of desolation, filled with indescribable feelings. Gilchrist Somerville, of the Congo Balolo Mission, in a letter of protest to the Governor-General on the condition of the people of the Lolanga district, July 1903. Area Riverbanks and Central Region, Domaine Privé, describes exorbitant fines and monstrous taxation levied upon these people by the state. Eight years ago there was a population in these towns of at least 5,000 people, compared with the 1,200 today. The people themselves are literally starving to keep up these supplies. There was the usual bogus inquiry, which came to nothing. 
frame w b of the british baptist missionary society in a letter to the author dated march tenth nineteen o four describes the state of the country as noted by him in a trip up river in nineteen o three i am convinced that with the exception of this very limited district lower congo and perhaps that of stanley falls the title of slave state is very fitting to the regime that exists as i traversed the old caravan road to the pool my eyes were opened crowds of people passed me every now and then bearing heavy loads of kwanga cassava puddings for the state some were little girls of twelve years of age carrying eight and ten some of the women converted into sweating beasts of burden for besides the twelve kwanga on the head they often had a baby on the back some were men and some were little boys what the state demands is that such and such a town shall bring in say two hundred and fifty kwanga every fourth eighth or twelfth day according to the distance what it means to the people is nothing to the state and the cry of the women who have to grind from morning to night to provide and often to carry is not heard by the state officer the labor is forced the natives have no time for anything else they are slaves all up the river is the same thing at one place where crowds of people ought to have been on the beach we found the whole town had fled young and old male and female were hiding in the bush because the fish tax was not complete we visited a town near lisali where the people had recently come from inland to escape the cruelties of the rubber tax frame w b howell john kempton s c kirkland r k all missionaries of the british baptist society were descending the congo on the missionary steamer goodwill when on october twenty ninth nineteen o three they came across when turning a bend of the river the following scene at the native village of yanjali where the steamer was wont to call for fuel the town was occupied by a party of congo government soldiers under two white officers the four missionaries on board were horrified to see the native soldiers of the administration under the very eyes of their officers engaged in mutilating dead bodies of natives who had just been killed three native bodies were lying near the river's edge as the goodwill put into the banks and human limbs were lying within a few yards of the steamer as she sought to make fast one of the slaughtered natives was a child a state soldier was seen drawing away the legs and other portions of the human body another soldier was seen standing by a large native basket in which were the viscera of a human body the missionaries were promptly ordered off the beach by the two officers presiding over this human shambles mr frame in the letter to the author confirms the accuracy of the above account time can never wipe the barbarous scene from our memory the mutilated dead the mad rushing and firing of the soldiers let loose and the hasty flight of the poor people hunted from their homes like wild beasts made us sick at heart and when we looked into the faces of our black crew we were ashamed for were not these things done in the name of the state and under the eyes of its white officers it is advisable to bear in mind that this incident occurred three years ago on the main pathway of civilization imagine what must take place in centers removed from prowling missionaries Williams A. R. of the Christian Missionary Alliance of New York, and Mr. Hall of West Indian Missionary of Good Family, trained at the Calabar College, Kingston, Jamaica, attached to the Baptist Missionary Society of Boston, describe in letters to the author published in 1904 the impoverished condition of the natives of the Lower Congo, whose condition is one of Elysian bliss compared with their tortured and oppressed brethren in the vast upper region they live on getting more impoverished every year says mr hall the soldiers says mr williams are a perfect terror to the whole place they rape the women clear the villages of livestock and generally behave in the most oppressive manner de la Mothe, ex-governor of french congo testifying before the cotel commission held in paris in nineteen hundred to inquire into the working of the concessionaire system stated in reply to questions that thirty thousand natives had crossed from congo state 
into French territory owing to the ill-treatment meted out to them. The American memorial to Congress presented through Senator Morgan on April 19, 1904, contains long accounts from several American missionaries working in the Congo as to the state of affairs prevailing. It is always the same story. Here are some extracts. Area, Central Region, Domaine Privé Leighton, A.E., reports on children forced to work for the state and the system of hostages or prisoners to compel labor. Dr. Leon writes, A close acquaintance with the conditions shows the cogency of the natives' contentions that they are no less than slaves to the state. And as slaves I have observed they must sometimes make bricks without straw, as when one must furnish fish nearly the year around, and he can catch fish only at certain seasons. Then one is forced to buy in other parts, paying in this way ten to forty times what will be received in return from the state post. To meet these obligations, one of the remaining members of a once large family had to pawn, i.e., sell into slavery, a younger member of his family. The poor people of this section, Bolengi, near Coquihatville, are broken-spirited and poverty-stricken by an arbitrary and oppressive system of taxation. Billington A.E. reports from Buembu. Men are first applied for, and if they do not present themselves, a soldier or soldiers are sent, who tie up the women or the chiefs until the workmen are forthcoming. Clark Joseph reports, I have seen men and women chained by the neck being driven by an armed soldier. The native has no desire for the improvement of his surroundings. He will not make a good house or large gardens, because it will give the state a greater hold on him. His wife refuses to become a mother, because she will not be able to run away, in the case of attack. Twice this week the people of Ikoko have been rushing off to the bush to hide on the approach of a large canoe of soldiers. And so on, ad infinitum et nauseam. Morris and William, see above, 1898 to 1902. First accounts made public in 1900. Morrison sent a private personal appeal to King Leopold on October 21, 1899. Area, southwestern region, Kasai. Describes raiding by state officers and soldiers around Luebo, efforts being made to compel the Baluba population of Luebo consisting of several thousands, to remove to Luluaborg, the state station, five days distant, where they would have to work. In July 1899, heard that the large body of Zaposaps, a cannibal tribe, armed and utilized by the state to force rubber from the natives, as irregulars in fact, were forcing rubber tribute in the Benapianga county. Similar information reached Shepherd, Morrison's colleague, at a station nearer the scene of the disturbances. A number of the prominent chiefs of the region had been invited by the Sapo Saps to a conference and treacherously murdered. Shepherd went to the spot. He was received in a friendly way by the Sapo Saps, saw many burnt villages. In the raiders' stockade where the slaughter had taken place, Shepard saw and counted eighty-one human hands slowly drying over a fire. Outside the stockade more than two score bodies he counted. Some of the flesh had been carved off and eaten. Some of the supposups were armed with the albini. On May 5, 1903, Morrison addressed a public meeting convened by the Aborigines Protection Society and gave a number of details of the reign of terror in June, July and August 1902 in his district, chiefly dealing with man-hunting by state officers and troops to recruit soldiers. Gilchrist, Somerville, see above, in comments on the report of the Commission of Inquiry. Published in C.R.A. Oregon, December 1905. Area, Riverbanks, Central Region, Domaine Privé. Gives in abundant detail effects of state taxes upon the people covering many years. 
With regard to the causes of depopulation in the Lolanga district where I have lived for fourteen years, I emphatically affirm that for one who has died of sleeping sickness there have been twenty deaths due to lung and intestinal diseases, and for one death due to smallpox there have been forty due to lung and intestinal troubles. The lung and intestinal troubles are without doubt due, in a very large proportion of the cases, to exposure involved in collecting the taxes, and in hiding from the soldiers in the forest, as well as the miserable huts the natives now live in, because they have neither time nor heart to build better. And all the diseases mentioned with the others find ready victims in the half-fed people, and produce their fell work with a greater rapidity and effect. So strong is the passion for rubber and copal that the companies and the state on the various rivers are continually having disputes about their respective boundaries, and overlapping in what they claim to be each other's territory in the interior between the tributaries and the main Congo. It was one of the commonest occupations of the commissaires to be settling these disputes, and it was a very frequent cause of bloody affrays between the natives serving the various companies or state, the trespassing on each other's parts of the forest while out gathering the rubber to meet the respective demands made upon them. Whitehead, John, of the British Baptist Missionary Society, testified before the Commission of Inquiry on the History of His District, Lukulela. Evidence Suppressed part published in the C.R.A. Organ for December 1905. Mr. Whitehead's statement traces the history of the district from 1891 to 1905. First food taxes, then rubber taxes, and food taxes. Until then there had been no demand for rubber. When that demand was made and the people objected, an expedition went inland about the end of 1901. The prowess of the state force was exhibited, chiefs killed, villages destroyed, and the payment of the tax enforced. Gave us depositions of chiefs and much evidence, protesting to the Governor-General in a letter dated April 19, 1904, he calls attention to the system prevailing forcing lads to sign on for twelve years as laborers. Ruskin, Mrs of the Congo Balolo Mission in comment upon the report of the Commission of Inquiry, published in C.R.A. Organ for December 1905. She describes the beginning of the rubber traffic in the ABIR concession. It is interesting to hear the Bongandanga people tell of the beginning of the rubber trade. How wonderful they thought it was that the white men should want rubber and be willing to pay for it that was in the days antecedent to the decree of 1891, author. How they almost fought for the baskets in order to bring them in and obtain the offered riches. But they say, we did not know, we never understood what it would become in the future. Now it is looked upon as the equivalent of death. They do not complain so much of want of payment, as that there is no rest from the work, and no end to it except death. I have known women to be taken as hostages without any regard to their condition during pregnancy or the period of lactation. They were made to work in the sun at grass work or weeding. Some were confined in the common prison or hostage house without any privacy and obliged to be back at work again in a few days with their babies at their backs. The hostage house was described to me by a woman who had been imprisoned there, and the details would be unprintable. Only two epidemics of smallpox have been known in the memory of living natives of Bongandanga, one in 1901, and the other fifteen or twenty years before. Sleeping sickness was absolutely unknown until about four years ago. The people are easy victims to it because of lack of food and rest, and exposure to damp, rain, and cold. Also, they are fast losing any desire to live and therefore do not try to throw off the terrible lethargy which so soon overcomes them. Messrs. Gilchrist, Weeks, and other missionaries are unanimous in describing the ravages of diseases, sleeping sickness, intestinal trouble, pneumonia, etc., to the wretched condition of the people owing to the grinding tyranny under which they live, 
to supply King Leopold and his financiers with revenues, and his soldiers and their crowd of retainers with foodstuffs. Lower, Mr. and Mrs., of the Congo Balolo Mission at Ikao. ABIR Concession. Described to the Commission of Inquiry in 1904, innumerable outrages perpetrated upon the natives in 1902 and 1903. Evidence suppressed. Published by the CRA last year. Summary. Natives flogged and shot for shortage in rubber. Names, dates, etc. given in great detail. They are all specific cases, of which this is a type. Went to report murder of his mother by sentries, cruelly treated by sentries in consequence. Beaten by sentries during a two-week stay in prison, sent back to village, died two days later. Men, women, and children given in the lists of the murdered. Punishment for delay in rubber production. Harris, J. H., Mrs. Harris, Padfield, Charles, Stannard, Edgar, all testified before Commission of Inquiry of Atrocities and General Oppression and Ill-Treatment Antecedent to 1904. Evidence Suppressed, published in summarized form by C.R.A., 1905. Records in 1904 and 1905 1904 was chiefly remarkable for the voluminous and appalling accounts sent home by the missionaries on the ABIR concession, Messrs. John Harris, Herbert Frost, Edgar Stannard, and Charles Padfield, all of the Congo Balolo Mission. Voluminous, detailed, and terrible narratives from the first three named of these gentlemen were published in the C.R.A. organ for August 1904, and for many months to come information was regularly supplied by them to the author, and supplied by the author to the world's press. The public is sufficiently familiar with these reports, which have moreover been confirmed by the report of the Commission of Inquiry, to absolve me from quoting from them. It suffices to say that they are concerned exclusively with the atrocities committed by the ABIR company in forcing rubber from the natives of the country. At the close of 1905, the Commission of Inquiry began its ascent of the upper river, and Messrs. Billington, Clark, Granfall, Scrivener, Gilchrist, Mr. and Mrs. Harris, Stannard, Ruskin, Gammon, Mr. and Mrs. Lower, Mr. Padfield, and Weeks testified before it. Their evidence was suppressed, but summaries, in some cases lengthy summaries, were published in 1905 by the Congo Reform Association. On August 4, 1905, Sir Charles Dilke again brought the Congo question forward on the Foreign Office vote. Earl Percy, replying for the then government, stated that Consul Mackey was not allowed to see the depositions of the witnesses, but that he had sent home extracts from some of the evidence given at the later sittings. This report of Consul Mackey's was suppressed by the British government, and every attempt to have it produced has hitherto failed an incident which is curious, to say the least. Further evidence was supplied in the course of 1904 from other regions. Writing to the author on May 17, Mr. Weeks gave details of the treatment of three prominent chiefs of his district in connection with incidents arising out of the food taxes. Two or three chiefs were placed in the chains, and died in them from ill-treatment after a few weeks' incarceration. The third was a fortnight in the chains, and was fined ten pounds because his village had failed to trap a bush pig, part of the fortnightly tax levied by the adjoining government station. On May 27th, Mr. Scrivener, in a letter to the author, described another journey into the Domaine de la Couronne, peopled by some wretched survivors of the rubber-hunting orgies in the Lake District. He gave abundant details, as usual, of men and women shot, women tied up and thrown into the river, etc. Then ensued a series of massacres which would be incredible were it not for so much of a like character that has been proved only too true. The district is now a waste. Mr. Whiteside of the Congo Balolo Mission sent a long letter to the Belfast News, 21st of October, describing the condition of the Lolanga towns. 
Much Italian evidence was produced in 1905, chiefly from the Eastern District, and led to stormy scenes in the Italian chamber. A long letter to the author from a missionary correspondent in the Katanga District also came to hand. Unhappily the writer was terrified, not unnaturally from the details given, lest his name should appear, which deprives his evidence of some of its weight in the public estimation. The letter was published in the C.R.A. organ for September 1904. It describes the usual proceedings. Girls raped and carried off by King Leopold's officials, chiefs degraded and shot, forced labor, oppression and cruelty rampant. A further memorial to Congress from the American Missionary Society stated January 16, 1905, contains more evidence from American missionaries. Mr. Charles H. Harvey reports, The dreadful form of rubber collecting has, among other evils, introduced a form of slavery of the worst possible kind. No man's time, liberty, property, person, wife, or child is his own. His position is worse than that of the sheep or goats of the white man. Even the dreadful horrors of the middle passage are completely put in the shade by deliberate, demon-like acts of atrocity. Mr. H. W. Kirby reports, I have just returned to Lukonga after visiting our fifteen mission stations. The population is decreasing, and during the last twenty years have decreased very rapidly. The first cause of the decrease he attributes to fighting with the state. He says, the further away from publicity, the greater the atrocities. I have heard much. I could tell much, but you know enough. A white officer forcing a native to drink from the water closet, shooting down handcuffed men, the employment of fierce cannibal soldiers that terrorize the people, shooting down twenty men to pay for a lost dog. The judgment of the Boma Appeal Court in the Codron case was published by the Congo Reform Association in May 1904. It showed the state of affairs prevailing in the territories of the Anversois Trust to be similar in all respects to that which obtained when Lacroix and his co-adjutors were performing their civilizing deeds, and it showed the complicity of the supreme executive in these deeds. Vida Section 4 Letters from the Kasai to the author disclosed further risings of the natives against the rubber demands made upon them. These risings have since assumed larger proportions. Mr. T. Ackermann, a Swiss, described in a report sent to Herr Ludwig Deuss, a highly respected merchant of Hamburg, who has labored manfully in Germany for the cause of Congo reform, atrocities committed in 1902 and 1903 at Flamby, Fakisuli, etc., Lomami district, each case stated in great detail, and some of them peculiarly horrible. If the chief does not bring the stipulated number of baskets, soldiers are sent out, and the people are killed without mercy. As proof, parts of the body are brought to the factory. How often have I watched heads and hands being carried into the factory? Herr Dius sent a copy of the report to the German government, and I transmitted a copy to the British and American governments, published, minus the names of individuals, in the West African Mail, March 3, 1905. 1905 was notable also for the publication of confidential circulars and regulations issued by agents of the ABIR Society Company to their agents, proving the complicity of the home administration in the taking of hostages and other concomitant of the rubber slave trade. Evidence to hand since the Commission of Inquiry visited the country. No sooner was the back of the Commission of Inquiry turned than the regime they had described as wholly illegal and atrocious was again in full swing, and continues today all over the Congo as it must do, of course, just as long as England and Europe allow it. King Leopold's claim to the land, its products, and its people have not been abrogated, but declared afresh, hence the system under which those claims are upheld has not altered one iota, except for the worse. The last information may be briefly summarized. Of course, and unhappily, it only touches a tiny fringe of the vast Congo. 
For the rest, where there are no informants, the student is thrown back for positive evidence upon the admissions of the Belgian papers. These testify to a grave rising in the Ituri region where gold has recently been discovered. Private information received by the author is to the effect that three months ago troops were concentrating from all sides at Stanley Falls to deal with this rising. French advices from the Congo state that King Leopold's troops have been repulsed with the loss of two officers and eighty men. Belgian papers tell us that five hundred soldiers are being dispatched. Those papers also admit risings on the Kasai, the Kwango, and the Busira. In short, the same situation obtains as has existed since the decree of 1891, which inaugurated the rubber slave trade. On January 17, 1905, Mr. Harris writes to the Vice-Governor-General, who committed suicide when the Commission returned to Boma from their investigations, giving a long list of atrocities perpetrated in the Nsongomboyo district, which he had just visited. Also the names of seventy-three adults, including many women, and a number of children killed by sentries in that district. On April 4th, Mr. Stannard writes to the author stating that the director of the ABIR had repudiated the Commission's findings and intends to continue as before. Mr. Harris writes to the District Commissioner on April 10th, pointing out a recrudescence of the rubber slave trade, giving details of raids by sentries upon villages. Vain protests. Matters go on in the old way. Mr. Stannard, writing to the author in the same month, says, The devil's work is in full swing again. Further letters from Harris to the district commissioner describing the raiding of Bolomboloko, massacre, hostage-taking, rape, and so on. All last year and during the present year, up to a few days ago, the author, as honorary secretary of the Congo Reform Association, has been engaged in sending reports to the Foreign Office, proving the prevalence of the same condition of things, and not only from the ABIR district, but from the river banks in the domaine privé. The journey of Mr. Whiteside and Mr. Stannard in the upper Lomaco will be fresh in the public mind. There have been visits of high commissioners, inspectors, and the governor-general since the commission left the Congo. The only result has been an aggravation of existing ills, and one new feature, the persecution of the missionaries in a determined effort to browbeat them into silence. Massacre, outrage, rapine, the river of blood flows on, and the river of gold flows in. Since the above was written, evidence has continued to accumulate. The Times published a long letter from Mr. Freshfield, covering extracts of letters received by him from the British and Italian expedition now exploring Rowan Sori and showing oppression, misrule, and brutality in the Samliki region, N.E. area, domaine privé. A considerable amount of information has reached me from the Tanganyaka region, Katanga Trust, proving beyond doubt the existence, with the knowledge and complicity of the officials, of the old-fashioned slave trade by Arabistan chiefs protected by the authorities. In the name of humanity, will not the German government disclose the reports it has received from its officials in East Africa on this subject? Mr. Charles Bond, see above, sends detailed reports of an aggravation of the food taxes round Lolanga since the Governor-General's visit. End of section 10 Section 11 of Red Rubber, The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morell. Section 11 Is There a Redeeming Feature? The Arab and the Liquor Traffic. The Free State did not flinch before its perilous task, the destruction of the Arab power and it has reaped the fruits of its energy, de Camp, New Africa. 
the suppression of the liquor traffic with the suppression of the slave trade is the finest title to glory which the congo state possesses report of the congo commission of inquiry what in the face of this history can be urged on behalf of the congo administration which shall be held to extenuate in any essential respect the havoc it has wrought in an interesting article which appeared in the quarterly review for january last and whose authorship entitles it to the most careful attention it is suggested after a generous acknowledgment of the present writer's justification for his charges that i have perhaps stuck too exclusively to one side of the picture that i have been disinclined to admit a redeeming feature that criticism struck me very much i had never thought that there was a redeeming feature which could be urged in the same breath with deeds too infamous to be forgiven by mercy itself i had never realized sufficiently until i saw that article that the matter was one of debate i have never until this day attempted to argue it if i do so now i beg the reader to believe that it is wholly from an impersonal point of view if the congo administration has any virtues let them be set forth by all means let their claims be proclaimed and the foundations upon which they rest subjected to analysis what then is the other side of the picture what is its relative value to the side we have gazed upon the Congo administration claims to have suppressed the slave raiding carried on by half-caste Arabs in a portion of the Congo basin about one-fifth the size of the territories over which it now asserts dominion. The Congo administration claims to have prohibited the liquor traffic in its territories. The Congo administration claims to have built railways, put up the telegraph and telephone in certain districts, placed steamers on the upper river, built a large number of fine stations, and in this manner established civilization in the heart of Africa. The Congo administration claims to have introduced a regular system of justice in its territories. Travelers have borne witness to the good treatment of the natives in specific areas. That, I think, fairly covers the ground. Some of these assertions are true, some are partly true and partly false some are altogether false even were they all literally true and could bear the test of examination could they palliate much less excuse the wrongdoing of the past fifteen years the congo administration extirpated the arab slave dealers it did the policy pursued by these semi-barbarians was atrocious but was it so atrocious as the civilized barbarism which has replaced it? If not, what becomes of the virtues attributed by the Congo administration to itself as a consequence of its action? If you knock down a footpad who is ill-treating someone, and after having driven the aggressor away, proceed to deal more severely with his victim, what claim have you to righteousness? A British officer, Major A. St. H. Gibbons, who has traveled through the region where these half-caste Arabs formerly held sway, and whose references to Congolese administrative methods have been in some respects so impartial that King Leopold's press bureau has quoted him in its publications as a friend and defender, has written in this respect, to say that the status and lot of the native population has been in any way improved by the Belgian occupation seems to me more than doubtful. Remember that the above passage refers to that part of the Congo where the administration claims to have conferred untold blessings upon the natives by delivering them from Arab tyranny. Major Gibbons continues, under Arab influence, the freedom of organized native communities was not interfered with. These people came to trade, to give and take, not to take only. Morally speaking, I will content myself here with the bare assertion that the natives are not the gainers by the Belgian occupation. 
What a tremendous indictment of the Congolese position as regards the Arab contention in these few lines. The Arab did not take only. The Congolese official does, and the natives are not the gainers under the change. This condemnation comes with added force when read with the accounts issued by the Press Bureau relating to the treatment of the natives under Arab rule. If they are worse off now, what, in the light of those accounts, must their condition be? No man is probably more competent than Dr. Hind, who served with the Congo forces in the Arab campaign, to speak of the characteristics of their occupation before its downfall, and passages from his famous book are also quoted by the Press Bureau in substantiation of the claim to virtue. What is the verdict of Dr. Hind? Despite, he writes, their slave-raiding propensities during the forty years of their dominion, the Arabs had converted the Maniima and the Maliba countries into some of the most prosperous in Central Africa. The military and other operations conducted by the Congo administration on its eastern frontiers have necessitated the head carriage over the great caravan routes, formerly utilized by the Arabs, to convey their ivory to the east coast, of a gigantic mass of stores of all kinds. One of those great trade routes, that leading to the western shore of Lake Tanganyika, crosses the heart of the Maniima country mentioned by Dr. Hind as one of the most prosperous under Arab rule in Central Africa. What does the report of King Leopold's own commission tell us on the present condition of the native peoples in the territories traversed by this route? It tells us that the native peoples are exhausted through the demands made upon them for head carriage in the transport of government material and are threatened with partial destruction. Captain Beccari, the king of Italy's envoy, traveled through that region three years ago. What has he placed on record? We have all the ghastly scenes of the slave trade, the collar, the lash, and press gang. A lieutenant in the Italian army, whose official military records I have seen, and of whose bona fides I have personally assured myself, has recently returned to Italy, after spending nearly three years in this, the eastern province of the Congo Free State. Like so many of his compatriots, he entered King Leopold's African army without the faintest idea of its habitual tasks, or of the nature of the Congo administration itself. He writes, The caravan road between Kasango and Tanganyika is strewn with corpses of carriers, exactly as in the time of the Arab slave trade. The carriers, weakened, ill, insufficiently fed, fall literally by hundreds, and in the evening, when there happens to be a little wind, the odor of bodies in decomposition is everywhere noticeable to such an extent, indeed, that the Italian officers have given it a name, Maniima Perfume. After fifteen years of moral and material regeneration, a la Leopold, Maniima Perfume. Where is the redeeming feature here? One might add a very great deal more in this connection, on the ethics of Arab versus Leopoldian slave raiding and trading. One could point to the fact that a brisk trade in slaves is carried on to this day by the revolted soldiery of the Congo state, through territory which the Congo administration professes to control, with the Bihian caravaneers from inland Angola. One could point to the testimony of Italian officers to the effect that, in the Arabized villages of a portion of the eastern provinces, the old markets for women slaves exist today as they did before, and that the inmates of the harems of Congo officers in that province have been bought and sold. One could point, inter alia, to Consul Caseman's report, and to the evidence placed before the Congo Commission of Inquiry, 
showing that the monstrous demands for foodstuffs levied upon the natives in certain districts under direct administrative influence compel the wretched people to sell their relatives into slavery in order to meet those demands one could recall as i have done those official circulars signed by the supreme executive and torn from the abysmal and secret darkness of congo infamy after many years by m van der velde the belgian labor leader fixing a bonus payable to officials for every man captured and forced into the congo army and military camps so much per head for a man of a certain stature so much for every youth so much per male child one could assert and demonstrate abundantly that the raids upon villages by congo officials and troops to seize recruits and laborers that the raids upon villages by congo officials and troops to capture women delicate operations to seize hostages as the report of the commission of inquiry puts it to punish and terrorize communities short in their supply of rubber raids in the course of which massacres wholesale and atrocities unspeakable are the habitual accompaniments constitute proceedings indistinguishable from the raiding of arab bands one could prove did not one feel that the reader is already sick with proof that the congo free state in its basic claims practices and methods is primarily a huge slave-owning and slave-raiding corporation and that compared with the cold diabolicism of its policy arab excesses extending over an infinitely smaller area were tame the slave-raiding slave-dealing arab was at least constructive he destroyed but to build again he was a colonizer, a ruthless one, but still a colonizer. Witness the huge centers of economical activity, of agricultural production he created. He belonged to the land. He had permanent interests in it. To have played the role of mere destroyer would have been to make waste of his habitation and his substance. But his successors, wielding absolute power in the country, are not attached to the soil. The objects of their employers in Europe are purely financial and foreign to Africa. Those employers seek a rapid accumulation of riches, and they spend those riches out of Africa. Africa, the people of Africa, play no part in the ends to which those riches are put. For the preservation of the races of Central Africa, it would have been better if Islam, which, as the leading authorities on Africa, British and French admit, breeds union for mutual aid among the black peoples, had thrown deep and abiding roots among the Bantu races of the eastern section of the Congo Basin. It would have given them that cooperation and adhesion by which alone they could have withstood the ravages of the special compound of slavery and regeneration patented by King Leopold in the name of Christianity. Civilization went frantic over the cruelty of the uncultured Arab half-caste. It has allowed the cultured European to impose upon an infinitely greater number of human beings a yoke more unbearable than the Arab laid, and that yoke remains. From the Arab to the gin bottle and the demijohn of rum, the Congo administration claims to have prohibited the liquor traffic in the upper Congo. The claim is untenable. The act of Berlin it was, which formally prohibited the importation of alcohol into the upper Congo, just as it prohibited it in northern Nigeria. The Act of Berlin did not prohibit the import of liquor into the Lower Congo, and the Congo administration has not suppressed it there, nor put on duties as high as in some other West African dependencies. The two foremost Belgian authorities on the Congo question, Mr. A. J. Waters, editor of Le Mouvement Géographique, and Professor Catier of the Brussels University, pointed this out soon after the publication of the report of the Commission of Inquiry, 
in which the commissioners are made to say that the Congo administration deserves the thanks of the civilized world for sternly waving aside the temptation of paying its labor with gin. As that fine humanitarian and excellent wit, a rare combination, Grand Chasseur devant l'Eternal, Pierre Mille, remarks in his and Chalet's Les Deux Congo. It is perfectly true that the Congo state does not pay the natives with a drink of brandy. It does not pay them at all. It is excessive to praise it even for that, because the Berlin Act explicitly forbids the import of alcohol. But no doubt the commissioners, seeing that the Congo state had violated all the other clauses of the Act, were amazed at its having respected this one. Apart from the inaccuracy of the claim, historically considered, the fusel oil of hypocrisy is present in larger proportions here than in all or nearly all the other philanthropic protestations of the Congo administration. This is not the place to discuss the African liquor traffic with any thoroughness. Personally, I have written against it very strongly. But the more one studies the accessible data, and the brighter the light which is thrown upon the various factors concerned, the more is the problem of the liquor traffic in Africa, as in Europe, seen to bristle with complications and difficulties. And without being converted thereby, one is impressed with the character and the weight of conviction of some of those who have opposed the general view as to the positive, hurtful effects European imported liquor has upon the primitive swamp and forest-dwelling communities of West Africa. The more one is inclined to the belief that the true lines of reform are in the direction of improved quality, and progressive rises in customs duty whenever the import is seen in a given period, to average out above its normal and virtually stationary figure. Be that as it may, the attempts of the Congo administration to wash away its sins by dragging in, on a historically false issue to begin with, the liquor traffic argument can only fill the mind of an ordinary person who knows something of the facts with disgust. It is better, it seems, for the regeneration of the native that he should be subjected to all the Congo administration subjects him to rather than be allowed to spend a portion of his earnings in the luxury of a drink. He has been robbed of all he possesses, which is marketable against European or American merchandise. He can buy nothing, neither drink to drown in temporary oblivion his misery, nor aught else, for he owns nothing with which to buy, and his labor belongs to King Leopold. And the administration, which has robbed him, calls heaven to witness that it has forced him, with moral and material suasion, to take the pledge. Similarly might the highwayman justify the rifling of his victim's pockets, lest the latter were tempted to spend their contents on liquor at the nearest inn. And by the same process of reasoning, the highwayman could claim superior virtue in knocking his victim on the head as the best means of placing him for ever out of the reach of temptation. End of section 11. Section 12 of Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Red Rubber, The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morell. Section 12. Is There a Redeeming Feature? Public Works and the Price Thereof. What does the native receive in return for all this taxation? I know of absolutely no way in which he is benefited. Some point to the telegraph. In what way does the telegraph benefit the native? Those who live near the line have to keep the road clear for nothing, and in tropical Africa that is not an easy task. Others point to the scores of steamers running on the upper Congo. 
in what way do they benefit the native here and there along the river natives are forced to supply large quantities of firewood for an inadequate remuneration others again point to well-built state stations in what way do they benefit the native they were largely built and are now largely maintained by forced labor then others point to the railway it is a splendid achievement of engineering skill and pays large dividends to shareholders but in what way does it benefit the thousands of natives on the upper congo j h weeks for twenty-five years a missionary in the upper congo in a letter to the author dated Monsembe, december twenty fourth nineteen o three i come to the third claim the congo administration has undertaken the construction of public works and buildings elegant stations have been erected along the banks of the upper river that is quite true no one has ever denied it some of the public edifices at boma and metadi on the lower river are quite as substantial as those which are to be met with in other administrative centres of the west coast of africa but who has paid for their erection the congo native whose labour is it which has reared them from the ground the labour of the congo native whom do they benefit now that they are there the congo native the Congo native who is entitled to nothing? The Congo native who owns neither his land nor the fruits of the soil, which he alone can gather, nor his labor? If the Congo native does not benefit from the existence of these fine buildings which his labor has constructed and paid for, if their existence merely facilitates the plunder of his country and the exploitation of his person by the occupants of them, in what sense can their construction be claimed as evidence of civilization to maintain such a thing would be to make use of an argument which no longer passes muster in the world it is out of date by two thousand years go behind those fine stations those camps of military instruction those government-run plantations go behind them into the forest and the bush mingle with the people of the land witness their abiding desolation their daily griefs wander among ruined homes and poverty-stricken hamlets where once flourished prosperity and ease look how the grass almost conceals the village paths once so clear and clean weeds overhanging the now crumbling huts sued invading the river frontage once filled with cassava steeping pits that sued where the mosquito and the tsetse love to breed the purveyors respectively of malaria and sleeping sickness whose dread ravages sweep increasingly through the land finding ready victims in a broken-spirited and ill-nourished people broken by long years of grinding tyranny ill-nourished through the workings of a system which demands for its multitude of agents the staple foodstuffs of the country where are the stores of brass rods the numerous livestock which were once the pride and wealth of these primitive communities arbitrarily seized the commission of inquiry is fain to admit as it records the incontestable impoverishment of the villages where are the native industries which once gave pleasure and occupation to these people ironware brassware rude pottery basket-making they have decayed says the report of the commission decayed as everything worth preservation has decayed and withered beneath the breath of leopoldian civilization it is hard to tell how these people live see these men in whom the very manhood seems stamped out dragging themselves back from the bush at the day's end, after a weary search through partly submerged forest, knee-deep, waist-deep, in fetid swamp, for the accursed juice of the rubber vine, that vine which they must find and tap in all seasons, in all weathers, whether the sap is rising or falling, always, ever, day after day, the year round, until death in some form, by violence, exhaustion, exposure, or disease, or mere weariness and sorrow, closes the term of an everlasting, and to them, mysterious visitation. 
see them at night in the forest far from home wife and children their interminable search not yet over huddled together shivering under a few palm leaves with a scrap of fire in their midst the nights are cold in the equatorial forest the rain invades their scanty shelter and the night wind chills their naked bodies racked with rheumatism and fevers their minds a prey to the superstitious fears in the impenetrable gloom made by the giant trees and matted creepers through which the sun never pierces where malignant spirits are abroad exposed unarmed and helpless to the attack of some roving leopard what thoughts are theirs in the distant village wives and children live at the mercy of the capriciousness cruelty and lust of the armed ruffians set there by the white man men fierce all-powerful speaking another tongue tribal enemies perchance or maybe the worst malefactors in the community specially selected for that very reason as the most fitting instruments of oppression men whose lightest word is law who have but to lift a finger they and their bodyguard of retainers and death or torture rewards protest against the violation of the sanctuaries of sex against the rape of the newly married wife against bestialities foul and nameless exotics introduced by the white man's civilization and copied by his servants in the general purposeful satanic crushing of body soul and spirit in a people crushing so complete so thorough so continuous that the capacity of resisting aught however vile slowly perishes out there in the forest the broken man through the long and terrifying watches of the night what is his vista in life unending labor at the muzzle of the albini or the cap gun no pause no rest at the utmost if his fortnightly toll of rubber is sufficient if leaves and dirt have not mingled in too great proportion with the juice he may find that he has four or five days a month to spend among his household if so he will be lucky for the vines are ever more difficult to find the distance to travel from his village greater then the rubber must be taken to the white man's fine station and any number of delays may occur before the rubber worker can leave that station for his home four or five days freedom per month that is the very maximum he can expect five days to look after his own affairs to be with his family and always under the shadow of the sentry's rifle but how often in the year will such good fortune attend him shortage on one occasion only will entail the lash or the chain and detention worse perhaps if the white man has a fever or an enlarged spleen that day and if he flinches if starting from an uneasy sleep there in the forest when shapes growing out of the darkness proclaim the rising of another day he wakens to the knowledge that his basket is but half full and that he must begin his homeward two days march betimes not to miss the roll call his heart fails him and he turns his face away plunging further into the forest fleeing from his tormentors seeking only one thing blindly to get away from his life and all that it means what will happen well enough he knows has he not seen the process with his own eyes father mother or wife will pay for his backsliding in the hostage house and whither shall he flee the forest encompasses him on every side the forest with its privations by day its horrors by night there he must live seeking such nourishment as roots and berries will afford shall he gain some other village in the hope that it may be a friendly one but there will the sentry be also and his doom as a deserter is sure go behind those coquettish centres of civilization where the superior congolese official drinks keeps his women and superintends the shipment of the rubber in the river steamers bound for the pool the railway and the ocean steamers go behind those outlying posts where the subordinate congolese official or agent of the government-controlled rubber trusts 
lives in discomfort and solitude unless his posse of savage and often cannibalistic auxiliaries can be called company eating out his soul losing hold on decency and dignity with the months harried by perpetual objurgations from the superior person in the fine station for rubber more rubber still more rubber go behind them those outstations and in some covert place near at hand in a clearing surrounded by bush hidden from prying eyes of prowling missionary or chance traveller you will come across it a small low-roofed building opening into another where a guard of sentries keep watch and ward this is the hostage house, one of the recognized institutions of the Upper Congo, like the Chicot, the Collier National, otherwise the Chain Gang, and the Matabiche, otherwise the Rubber Bonus. Inside, herded like cattle in a pen, cramped and suffocated, unkempt, groveling in filth and squalor, men, women, and children, chiefly women, half-starved, wholly starved at times. What a story the records of the Congo courts will tell if a substantial number of them are ever dragged to light. For the pestered, unwrought, subordinate white man in the outstation, grown callous and habitually almost unconsciously cruel, has other things to think about besides his hostages and their victualling. It is as much as he can do, often enough, to feed himself and his soldiers. Taught by his superiors to look upon the people of this regenerated land as brute beasts ere he sets foot among them, the daily task assigned to him has bred a total disregard for human suffering. His mind has become simply non-receptive to such ideas. Rubber is his god. His salary is a mere pittance, but every ton of rubber from his outstation spells Matabiche, and every month that passes means possession coming nearer, and with it release from his surroundings. Censure, if the output falls below the stated figure. Praise and advancement, if he succeeds in maintaining or increasing it, and Matabiche. Rubber is his god. The natives are but means to an end, and them he loathes. Ah, how he grows to loathe them! Are they behindhand in their quota? Then they are robbing him. He who has power of life and death over hundreds or thousands of men, women, and children. Do they tremblingly urge that the vines are exhausted? They are defying him. He knows it, and his fever-haunted brain devises fresh measures for their coercion. He re-reads his instructions, couched in terms of mingled cajolery and warning, and he hardens his heart. Fevers, solitude, discomforts, excesses, the sense of omnipotence grafted upon an indifferent morale, and pernicious ideas inculcated by his employers— the sense of mingled irritation and vanity excited by seeing fear, and the deceit born of fear. In every face, the iron chains of the whole system of which he has become the tool, and in a sense the victim, a system implacable, unalterable, machine-like, whose motive power, controlled and directed with genius from a faraway European city, operates in the equatorial forest with passionless regularity. All this has made of him what he is, what he needs must be, lost to all moral sense, impervious to emotions of pity or compassion. When an official begins to realize the coulisses of the administration, he is stupefied to have fallen so low in the social scale. He cannot ask for his resignation, because the Resuel Administratif does not admit it. If he insists and leaves his station, he can be prosecuted for desertion, and, in any case, will probably never get out of the country alive, for the routes of communication, victualling stations, etc., are in the hands of the administration, and escape in a native canoe is out of the question. 
every native canoe if its destination be not known and its movements chronicled in advance from post to post is at once suspected and liable to be stopped for the natives are not allowed to move freely about the controlled waterways the official must therefore finish his term always obeying the ukases of the governor-general and the district commissioner without the hope of being able to make known the miseries he is undergoing to the outside world because in boma there is a cabinet noir for correspondence look inside that hostage house staggering back as you enter from the odors which belch forth in poisonous fumes as your eyes get accustomed to the half-light they will not rest on those skeleton-like forms bones held together by black skin but upon the faces the faces turned upwards in mute appeal for pity the hollow cheeks the misery and terror in the eyes the drawn parched lips emitting inarticulate sounds a woman her pendulous pear-shaped breasts hanging like withered parchment against her sides where every rib seems bursting from its covering holds in her emaciated arms a small object more pink than black you stoop and touch it a newborn babe twenty-four hours old assuredly not more it is dead but the mother clasps it still she herself is almost past speech and soon will join her babe in the great unknown the horror of it the unspeakable horror of it every station every post every factory of the rubber districts of the upper congo and many in the food tax districts has its hostage house the number of hostages detained is inscribed upon registers and so far as the outstations are concerned monthly statements on forms printed for the purpose and entitled etat des indigènes soumis à la contrainte par corps are forwarded in duplicate to headquarters by careful reckoning of the number of stations and outstations the authorized number of hostages detained per mensum in each and documentary evidence showing how that number is exceeded it has been possible to compute that ten thousand human beings pass through the hostage houses of one only of the vast rubber preserves of the upper congo in a single year how many remain to die or leave them only to die is more difficult to compute the hostage house is one of the most efficacious assets of the rubber slave trade sometimes with shameless boldness but with some attempt at outward decency because the sight is a more public one the hostage house flaunts itself openly and is a more pretentious and commodious building this on the premises of one of the fine and important central stations and here you can see the prisoners as they march roped through the station to the abode which a beneficent administration has caused to be erected for the purpose of stimulating a healthy desire to work among the natives of central africa slowly the procession winds its way through the station buildings officers bungalows drying sheds for rubber and so on at its head walk four sentries fez on head and cap-gun or albini slung from their brawny shoulders behind them eighteen women mothers those whom motherhood will shortly claim maids girls of tender age some carry babies or hold tiny children by the hand for who shall feed these if left in the village behind faltering they come casting fearful glances to left and right so terror-stricken that they cannot control the calls of nature what is their offence it is an offence by proxy and a very grave one the husbands or the brothers of these women have failed to trap the weekly antelope required as part of the tax for the white man's table or their supply of fresh fish is short fish is not always abundant in all seasons in the same locality but the congo official and his soldiers require fish and fish they must have or the rubber has been of bad quality and insufficient in quantity it is necessary to take these measures the husbands will require their wives 
and they will trap the antelope, they will find the fish, and they will improve their rubber supply. They are lazy, that is all. If they do not, well, the women will remain in their pleasant abode, fed generously by an administration full of concern for their moral and material welfare. Should delay prove exaggerated and indefensible, it will be the painful duty of the official in charge to send a number of sentries to visit that village. Merely to visit it, of course. They will take their guns? Yes, but for self-protection. These people are wild, very wild. But, rest assured, the guns will not be used save under deliberate provocation. It would be contrary to the regulations. Ah, of course, if the regrettable necessity presented itself, why, then these poor brave sentries would have to defend their lives. The women in the house of detention? Well, no doubt they would be very happy to join the sentries' menage. And who knows? You observed the fifth in the line, she with the brass anklets? No? You English are strange people. She was pleasing, quite pleasing. Distinguished magistrates assured the commissioners of inquiry, says their report, that the detention of women in hostage houses was the most humane form of coercion. Perhaps it is on the Congo, for there are many worse. But the Leopoldian conception of humanity is the humanity of the human tiger thirsting not for blood, but for rubber, which presently, when flung from the hold of an ocean carrier, owned by an Englishman, plentifully be starred and be meddled upon the Antwerp quay, shall be converted into gold. Gold to pour into the lap of some favored friend. Gold to be invested in undertakings from China to Peru. Gold to rear palaces, pagodas, and monuments to the Emperor of the Congo in Belgian cities gold to purchase properties under brilliant mediterranean skies gold to be hoarded in private treasure chests of which none but the royal owner holds the key gold to corrupt consciences and manufacture public opinion to disseminate lying literature throughout the world even on the seats of continental railway carriages i have stood on that key of antwerp and seen that rubber disgorged from the bowels of the incoming steamer, and to my fancy there has mingled with the musical chimes ringing in the old cathedral tower another sound, the faintest echo of a sigh from the depths of the dark and stifling hold. A sigh breathed in the gloomy equatorial forest by those from whose anguish this wealth was wrung. They knew not their merciful emperor, Yet that echo took form of words in my mind. Imperator, it has seemed to whisper. Imperator, morituri te salutant. We who are about to die salute thee, emperor. Perhaps it was because thoughts flew backwards five hundred years, when to the sound of the same gentle pealing from the old cathedral tower, the ancestors of this same people, which permits to-day its foreign monarch and its financial bodyguard to plagiarize in Africa the infamies committed upon its own citizens by the hirelings of another foreign monarch, fell in mangled heaps in the narrow streets of this very city. If there be a spirit in that tower which never dies, as legend somewhere has it, one can picture the cynical smile that flits across its shadowy features as, contemplating at once the rubber-laden key and the escutcheon of the city with its severed hands, and thinking of the Congo toll, the toll of the handless stump, reflects of the world and its ways, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Yes, Go behind those fine stations cemented with the blood of black humanity, and see into the lives, read into the hearts of the people. Witness the degradation to which native life has sunk, that elderly chief, honored in the eyes of his subjects, flogged and put to menial tasks, made to drink from the white man's latrine. 
in the social system of the african native the person of the chief is at once the father of the clan its rallying point the centre to which it looks for guidance the symbol of all that the clan venerates and regards as holy the deliberate policy of bula matadi has been to break down that influence in nine cases out of ten an influence for good and of course put nothing in its place every feature of indigenous life which made for self-respect has been dragged in the mud of grinding tyranny and foul imaginings natural instincts of dignity and decency undermined indigenous laws for the localization of disease rendered of no avail through the wholesale deportation of women and the moving hither and thither of masses of soldiery public incest as a pastime to the brutal soldiery things nameless unprintable watch that procession wending its way through the tortuous bush track mourners sons carrying the body of their father murdered by one of the village sentries in a fit of caprice to the white man's station the slain man was the chief of that primitive community moreover he was a metal chief surely in this case justice could be secured against the assassin impatiently the white man hears the story and bids the bearers through an interpreter depart the rubber was insufficient it was not the first offence the chief was responsible it is enough as the men delay somewhat in taking up their burden he sets his dog upon them watch too this son of a murdered father begging from the murderer permission to untie the body from where it hangs on yonder sapling and give it decent burial that permission will be granted him eventually, but on it will be founded a further pretext for extortion, and a goodly portion of the remaining family goods will pass into the sentry's hands. Note the gait of that youth as he limps painfully into the village square. He is a fine muscular specimen of humanity. What ails him? As he turns, the cause is clear enough. Down his broad naked back and loins, the blood slowly runs and drips upon the ground. Flies are buzzing round his shoulders. He has been flogged by the white man's orders for shortage. Fifty blows of the rhinoceros hide whip. He fared better than Bokoto of Walla. He explains to his aged mother, as he reaches his hut, he got a hundred strokes and had to be carried away. Go behind those fine stations which figure in the illustrated publications so obligingly scattered broadcast by the press bureau. Get from the lips of survivors the story of the breaking of their village. The narration takes you back to the Middle Ages, to the exploits of the Spanish conquistadors in the West Indies. Go from village to village, from district to district, leave the rubber zone and visit that fishing centre where the old men the young are away getting in their fortnightly tax will tell you in their primitive simplicity our young men have no time even to make children there is nothing before us but death get from the lips of the people everywhere the same story of misery and woe here when the weekly tax and foodstuffs have been paid, there is nothing left but leaves to eat. There the chant of mourning for relatives slain in an affray with the sentries. Pass on through swamp and brushwood. There is another hamlet not far off, and from its direction a confused noise arises, quickly to be distinguished as cries of terror, shouts, execrations. A man dashes past you, running swiftly down the bush path you are now entering. Seeing you, he doubles back and plunges into the forest. You come upon the scene. It is typical and commonplace. A white man in dirty clothes and straggling beard sits upon a stool. Before him stand several soldiers surrounding or holding five women and a man whom the official is angrily interrogating through an interpreter. He is taking the census of the village, 
and apportioning its taxation. That is all. Other soldiers are busy looting the huts, coming out with armfuls of spears and knives, cutting down the plantations, or chasing with loud shouts the villagers who have fled, panic-stricken to the bush. Multiply such scenes, such tales, such tragedies, ten thousandfold, and you will only touch the fringe of a people's misery. To men who have lived among them for many weary moons, and whose existence would long ago have been intolerable but for their faith in the Almighty, to a man who for years has been receiving the outpourings of these men's hearts in letters and in speech, and whom circumstances have given an insight, granted to few, into the European side of this unparalleled scandal and colossal human tragedy, until their hideousness has burned itself into his soul and scorched it. There is no redeeming feature in the public works constructed by King Leopold on the Congo or in Brussels. On the Congo, every mile of railway, every mile of road, every new station, every fresh stern-wheeler launched upon the waterways means a redoubling of the burden on the people of the land, first because their labor and their labor alone supplies the needed monies and the needed muscles, secondly because these material evidences civilization serve but one purpose that of facilitating the enslavement of the inhabitants of tightening the rivets in the fetters of steel within whose pitiless grip they groan and die and for the handsome edifices raised by king leopold in brussels with the proceeds of this rubber slave trade i can find no words more fitting than those of Mr. Vandervelde, uttered in the Belgian chamber last March, to characterize them. I tell him that this money, these profits, these presents are shameful things, because they are the result of the exploitation of a whole people. End of section 12《セクション13》of Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade in the Congo, by Edmund Dean Morell. Section 13 Is There a Redeeming Feature? Part 3 Justice and the Friendly Critic The administration of justice in the Congo is of such an impartial and protective character, and is so highly appreciated by the natives themselves, that they come in ever-increasing numbers and from great distances to submit to the jurisdiction of the whites. Sick de camp new africa the congo administration claims to have introduced justice into its territories justice the virtue which consists in giving every one his due clearly it is not a claim to this sort of justice on the congo which requires discussion no what is contended by and for the congo state is that it has instituted a judicial system which is a very different thing. A judicial system can be pure or impure. It can be an instrument of protection to the weakest. It can be an engine of tyranny under which the weak are ground to powder with every appearance of strict legality. It is claimed for the judicial system of the Congo state in that familiar and inimitable language of lofty sentiment studded with rhetorical flowers that it corresponds with a double mission to be fulfilled by the government to solve the essentially judicial litigation which can arise in social life and to punish in conformity with the law the violation of social order there exists in the capital of the congo state boma on the lower river a court of first instance and an appeal court 
and there are thirteen territorial tribunals scattered throughout a country some eight hundred thousand square miles in extent for all criminal cases the appeal court at boma is supreme beyond it there is no appeal the superior council in brussels whose members are appointed by the king and which never meets is theoretically a court of cassation for civil cases the first essential of a pure judicial system is a magistracy independent of executive influence or control under a regime of absolute autocracy such conditions are unlikely in the congo state they are obviously impossible and it is one of the many amazing things in the report of the congo commission of inquiry that having seen the congo system at work having noted the breaking of the paper laws of the land by the executive and by individuals throughout the length and breadth of their peregrinations the commissioners should have pleaded earnestly and strenuously for a magistracy free from executive interference, a plea which has necessarily been rejected by the sovereign autocrat. The members of the Congo magistracy are, from highest to lowest, nominated by the king. The governor-general is the king's mandatory, and the public prosecutor's office is exercised under the governor-general's authority. The latter can stop prosecution in criminal cases, and can suspend proceedings in criminal cases at any stage after they have been instituted. He does so habitually, as the report of the Commission of Inquiry admits. It could not be otherwise, seeing that the executive itself is the supreme violator of the law. The public prosecutor and his assistants are, consequently, the servants of the executive, that is to say, of the governor-general and the judicial system of the Congo state exists only to give an appearance of legality to what is indefensible, to invest the rubber slave trade in the eyes of Europe with the garb of respectability, to make the world believe that a legal machinery exists to protect the native when that machinery is used in point of fact to minister to his oppression with such a system the effective administration of justice is of course impossible and it is not the least of the negligences of british governments that they should have permitted for all these years british subjects on the congo whether white or black to be subject to the jurisdiction of the congo courts moreover that situation still obtains under it one englishman was hung out of hand english missionaries are now being harried for speaking the admitted truth before the commission of inquiry and a very considerable number of british colored subjects have suffered and doubtless now suffer the gravest wrongs i refer to this subject again in section five there is some little difficulty in conveying to the ordinary mind the moral atmospheric conditions prevailing on the congo they are so charged with chicanery and deceit, so utterly abnormal in every sense of the word, that long experience alone can properly assimilate them, and the knowledge thus acquired is not communicable in a couple of sentences. One can only ask the reader to bear in mind that the Congo state surrounded itself from the earliest days with the trappings not of an ordinary colonial undertaking, but of a professedly philanthropic institution, and that when it started out on its career of piracy and brigandage in 1892, these trappings clung about it, forming a raiment well nigh impenetrable to criticism. In the succeeding years, King Leopold, himself highly proficient, uniquely so indeed, in statecraft of a certain order, has attached to his interests by various means men schooled in all the subtleties of the law never probably has greater ingenuity been displayed to give black the semblance of white or at least of gray 
laws innumerable have been drafted and flourished in the eyes of europe securing to the congo native freedom absolute and entire ensuring for him such beatitude in this life and such a quasi certitude of salvation in the next that as lord fitzmaurice speaking in the house of lords in july last wittily put it some of your lordships on leaving this house might almost be disposed to take a ticket immediately for the congo the torchlight of truth has finally succeeded in reducing these trappings to dust and ashes but the atmosphere is not yet rid of the particles so it is that in considering the judicial system of the congo which cannot be separated and treated as a thing apart from other sections of the congo system this factor must ever be present in the mind when in diplomatic correspondence official publications and in the emanations from the press bureau king leopold's secretaries and scribes dwell with emphasis upon la justice congolaise as though the congo judicial system was by them regarded as the greatest proven tribute with the suppression of the arab and the gin bottle to administrative genius one has to point out that the congo administration does not and never has administered in any known acceptance of the term as professor catier truly says after twenty years it has not even begun to administrate everything must be begun afresh an early duty of a civilized administration in tropical africa is to recognize uphold and strengthen where required the existing native courts the chief sitting in council with his elders the machinery for the preservation of law and order founded upon indigenous customs whose essential justice and suitability investigation seldom fails to reveal bound up in this a careful and constant study by the administrative officials of the laws and usages of the people their practices in regard to chieftainship hereditary succession marriage tenure of land and other property their entire social fabric in short is the necessary indeed the principal business of the administration of a tropical african dependency but such trivialities as these find no part or lot in the leopoldian conception they are absolutely foreign to it there is not a recognized native court from one end of the congo territory to the other if you speak to a congolese official about native customs laws and what not he simply laughs at you he has no time for that sort of thing his duty is to maintain the revenue and if possible increase it if he is stationed in one of the revenue producing districts and revenue means rubber ivory and gum copal if he is stationed in one of the great food producing districts his duty is to superintend the output distribution and dispatch of supplies and to see that every village within the taxable area delivers fortnightly or weekly as the case may be its fixed quota this is a task of considerable magnitude there are tens upon tens of thousands of soldiers and their women and retainers workmen laborers of all sorts etc engaged directly or indirectly in different branches of the rubber slave trade they must be fed and the congo administration unlike civilized administrations does not import large quantities of dried fish rice and so on for the consumption of its retainers therefore those retainers live on the land and as the overwhelming proportion of the get at able native population in the rubber districts is employed from january one to december thirty one in searching the forests for that article the food supplies for the great station centers in those districts the outstations are supplied locally and the sentries in the villages look to the village women not their own to support them 
have to come from a distance from other districts. When the enormous number of mouths to be fed is considered, and the continuous nature of the demand, it will be readily understood how vital to the working of the system it is that the supply should be kept up without a hitch, what dangers would be incurred if a break of any duration occurred. The report of the Congo Commission of Inquiry points this out, and states explicitly that its remarks are of general application to all the great station centers. It admits, indeed, that sometimes a portion of the workmen, soldiers, and prisoners are often deprived of food for twenty-four hours. No surprise need be felt that the hostages, e.g. prisoners, are sometimes forgotten. It will be seen, then, that an indispensable feature of the rubber slave trade is the forcible maintenance of a considerable section of the population under pressure for the production of foodstuffs as unrelaxing as the pressure for revenue. Between these two primal needs, revenue, e.g. rubber, and food, the Congolese official has time for nothing, everything else lying outside the sphere of what is really required of him, save in a few and strictly exceptional cases where, owing to a variety of causes, different conditions prevail. With what does the magistracy in the Congo concern itself? In the Europeanized towns of Boma and Matadi, a number of trumpery little cases of litigation, rather encouraged than otherwise, occur. In the true Congo, the vast upper region stretching from Stanley Pool to the Nile and the Great Lakes, there is no litigation to speak of. There are no competing commercial firms, and there is no room for litigation between master and slave. The wretched native has been taught by bitter experience to shun Bula Matadi in whatever guise he appears before him. The Commission of Inquiry sorrowfully recognized that the evangelical missionary has come to be regarded by the native as the only representative of equity and justice, thus conferring upon him a prestige the commissioners add, which should be invested in the magistrates. In the distinguished magistrates, who opine that to drag mothers, wives, and young girls from their homes, and thrust them into hostage houses, is the most humane form of coercion? The commissioners are silent on this point. The truth of the matter is that the principal employment of the Congo magistrates consists in dealing with the crimes committed by Europeans upon the natives, in dealing, that is, with the fatal and inevitable accompaniment to the system of which the supreme local executive is the inspirer, or rather the transmitter and applier, inspiration emanating from Brussels, whence comes every initiative, as Professor Catier rightly says. If this is the principal employment of the magistrates, the chief object is to make an impeccable outward simulacry of stern activity compatible with securing immunity for the criminal. The task is easier than it sounds, for the simple reason that there is no publicity. Out of the innumerable judgments delivered by the Congo courts in cases of atrocity during the course of the last decade, no complete text and extracts from one judgment only has ever been published in Belgium. It sounds incredible. It is, however, strictly true. The government of M. de Smet de Neyer has been a very complacent one for the sovereign of the Congo state. Were those judgments accessible to the Belgian public, now that its eyes are partly open to the verities of this awful business, the effect produced by the report of the Commission of Inquiry would be slight by comparison. Only two complete texts have ever reached this country, that of the Appeal Court in the Caudron case, and that of the Territorial Tribunal of Stanleyville in the case of John Brown, a native of Lagos. 
the former was and remains with the exception of the official circulars consul caseman's report and the report of the commission of inquiry the most revealing document connected with congo affairs which has ever seen the light of day it was the first official document from the congo side of any importance which we had been able to acquire and not only did it show the complicity of the supreme executive in the rubber slave trade but it convicted the governor-general himself of violating the laws of the land the other judgment is evidential of the kind of justice which a british colored subject even one with brown's exceptional position and record on the congo can expect if he comes to loggerheads with the superior official hence it is not difficult to understand that this absence of publicity facilitates very greatly the object to which i have referred the public is informed now and then that numerous arrests have taken place and that several agents have been sentenced the press bureau circulates a cleverly worded dispatch to the continental and american journals affiliated to it in which individual excesses inseparable from every colonizing enterprise are deplored and the magnificent independence notwithstanding the odious calumnies of mr morell and his gang of the congo magistracy proclaimed there the matter ends so far as the public is concerned of the subsequent fate of these men who are all subordinate agents from the outstations in the bush nothing ever transpires i have been able to trace one or two not without considerable difficulty their history is a little diversified but one characteristic is common to all after serving an infinitesimal part of their sentence they come back very quietly to belgium here a mysterious providence ensures their keeping quiet sometimes a local job is found for them one man for instance who was a bootmaker's assistant by trade before being given unlimited power over men and women in the congo forest was comfortably set up in a comfortable little shop of his own his sentence in the congo was ten years he served eight months another who has married and settled down in the haberdashery line was given a life sentence on the congo for burning an old woman alive a foreign appointment preferably in egypt it would seem is rather usual no one knows of course who the fairy godmother or father is but the effect is potent silence is ensured that is the main point i have received some very curious letters from belgium in the last few years some with appeals some with offers of the most varied description one professed to be from the father of a young belgian sentenced to ten years a curious sequel attached to it the writer stated that he had appealed to one of the congo state secretaries in brussels on his son's behalf on the plea that the latter had merely carried out the instructions of his superior this high official had replied that a reprieve would be difficult to arrange just now in view of the agitation in england but he would consider what might be done six months had passed since this meeting but the youth still lingered in Beaumagayon. the writer added that he had not told the high official in question one thing that was that he the writer possessed documentary proof of his son's obedience to orders in the shape of a letter from his chief an officer of high rank in the congo army would i like to see the letter i answered that it would be very interesting to see the letter repeating in my reply the name he had mentioned i did not expect an answer and i was not disappointed but two months later i noticed in a published passenger list of the latest homeward-bound congo mail steamer the name of my correspondent's son my letter as i anticipated had evidently been used to some purpose with the high official aforesaid 
does this absence of publicity and the advantages it entails for the congo administration mean that the congo magistracy must be regarded as individually and collectively corrupt not at all that as a body it is inoculated with the virus of the system one need seek no better indication than that afforded by the views quoted in the report of the commission of inquiry of some of its distinguished members on the subject of women hostages that in itself is about the most damaging revelation which could well be imagined especially when we are told in the publications of the press bureau that the taking of women hostages is contrary to the written law i have a letter before me from one of the assistants of the public prosecutor at boma offering for a consideration the documents which in his capacity of magistrate he possesses documents which would astonish the world the world has ceased to be astonished at king leopold and all his works truly the usual type of european on the congo whether fulfilling the rule of magistrate or not is worthy of his royal master i have no doubt that there are honest individuals among the congo magistracy and the particulars given in father vermiche's recent book throw a flood of light on the way in which the honest magistrate is hampered at every turn by the executive when engaged in gathering evidence for the prosecution of a european criminal but assuming for the sake of argument that every congo magistrate were above suspicion there would still be a barrier which neither the public prosecutor nor a fortiori his assistants can cross the publication of the quadrant judgment and the events which followed it illustrated this very forcibly that publication as i have remarked was a staggering blow to the congo administration and king leopold sought to parry it by issuing a special manifesto addressed to the governor-general and calling upon the public prosecutor and his assistants the substitutes or deputy attorneys to search for all officials no matter who they may be who had participated in the particular rubber raids the scapegoat quadron had been concerned in the manifesto further stated that the government that is the king intends that there shall be no indulgence shown towards any of its officials who may participate in blamable acts towards the native people with that nicety of expression and enthusiasm for righteousness which is impressed so forcibly on these royal promulgations the manifesto proceeds to anticipate that all officials no matter who they may be have been triumphantly dragged out of their hiding places by a noble and perspiring public prosecutor and declares if the constituent elements of participation do not exist and if the prosecution fails it will remain for the superior authority to examine if the agents of the state whose administrative responsibility appears nevertheless to be implicated in these cases either by their acts or by their inaction shall not be the object of disciplinary measures of a seriousness proportionate to the faults which they have committed to the uninitiated this evidence of pained surprise barely concealed indignation and resolute intent on the part of the emperor of the congo conveyed sincerity and the press bureau hastened to improve the occasion the judgment of the appeal court was such of course that had the instructions in the king's manifesto to the governor-general been carried out the first warrant of arrest issued by the public prosecutor would have been against the governor-general whom the judgment clearly indicated for the committal of an illegal act involving in its train cruelty and outrage upon natives the next person to be arrested would have been the district commissioner i e an official ranking with two exceptions next to the governor-general the third would have been the officer in command of the government troops 
who assisted Cardron in his raids, then the manager in Africa of the company, whose servant Cardron was, and so on all down the scale. The prison at Boma would have had to have been enlarged. It is hardly necessary to add that the magistracy was powerless to do anything of the kind. Cardron was defended, a rare occurrence in the Congo, and the prosecution did not, and could not deny, that Cardron was merely a servant of the executive, that he received with the consent of the executive, which took three-fourths of the profits derived by the company from its rubber operations, three per cent commission on all the rubber he secured, that the company had no lands of its own, and was merely acting as rubber collector for the executive, that its raids were conducted with the open assistance of government officers and troops, that the arms and munitions of war utilized by the company constituted in itself the proof that the executive recognized the right of the company to employ them, since they could by law only be placed in the hands of those specially so authorized by the governor-general, that every rifle and cartridge in the possession of the company was passed through the custom-house and conveyed to the company's station in government vessels, that in the year 1903, the year of Cardron's raids, these government vessels had conveyed 40,000 rounds of ball cartridge to the company, and finally that, for the results of such illegal raids, the executive itself was solely responsible. Particulars of the trial of the man Van Kelken, an outstation subordinate of another of the rubber companies, on December 9, 1904, which have reached me, are merely a replica of the Cardron business. His performances had been denounced by the missionaries, they included the seizing of women hostages, arming sentries with albinis, etc. Van Kelken conducted his own defense, in the course of which he made no attempt to deny taking hostages, and produced as his justification for doing so a letter from his district commissioner, and a circular signed by the governor-general. The latter document deplored the decrease in the rubber output from the concession, and reminded the company's agents that they were entitled to exercise bodily constraint upon the natives. The defendant pointed out that he was not concerned with the legality or illegality of such measures. He merely carried them out as he was bid. As for the detention of hostages, there was no secret about it, and every agent was called upon to furnish in writing monthly lists of his prisoners, one for his manager, the other for the executive. Needless to say, the penalty inflicted upon Van Kelken was not severe, and he has long since returned to Europe. Needless to say also that proceedings against the Governor-General and the District Commissioner for their illegal instructions were not taken. The defense of Dutiege, another subordinate agent, whose sentence of fifteen years by the Court of First Instance was reduced to ten years by the Court of Appeal in November 1904, ran on much the same lines. This case was notable for an incident which makes one rub one's eyes and wonder whether one is living in the twentieth century. A favorite pastime of Dutiege consisted in forcing natives, who brought him badly prepared rubber, to eat it. The court held that the introduction into the stomach by the mouth of an elastic substance in gerunds, was not productive of after-ill effects, and that the subsequent illness and death of the men who had been compelled to eat the badly prepared rubber could not, therefore, be attributed to this. The charges included other counts, that of murder and complicity in murder, but the reduction of the sentence was on the grounds stated above. End of section 13
Section 14 of Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade in the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade in the Congo, by Edmund Dean Morrell. Is there a redeeming feature, Justice and the Friendly Critic, Part 2. When the Commission of Inquiry entered the Moringa Territory, they found a state of affairs which dismayed them. Here were established missionaries who were determined that the commissioners should drink the cup of horrors, which was their daily experience, to the dregs. From a radius of fifty miles, multitudes of natives flocked to the riverside and told their stories of unspeakable woe before the visibly impressed court held on board a specially chartered government vessel. Wholesale massacres, murders, torture, rape, mutilation, depopulation, impoverishment, misery profound, the shameful tale flowed on until the end of the week, but when a tithe of the tragedy had been unfolded, the commissioners, sickened and appalled, said that they had heard enough. Their verdict is on record." yet the managing director of the company on the spot directly responsible for this welter of abomination was allowed to leave the country untouched the assistant manager stepped into his shoes the district commissioner and his assistants were not troubled the officer commanding the troops in the concession was retained promoted and has since been engaged in prosecuting one of the missionaries for libel and one of the directors in Europe was appointed by the king a member of his Commission of Reforms. The European management of that company includes the Grand Marshal of King Leopold's court and several high Congo officials. Its president is a senator. The Congo government holds half the shares, and the net profits of the concern in six years have amounted to £730,000 on a paid-up capital of under £10,000, each share of a nominal value of £20, of which the Congo government possess 1000 having received in that period dividends totaling £295. Where in history will you find such a record, and what can be said of the judicial system under which such a record is established? We have seen how the governor-general controls the judicial machinery, that he can interfere in prosecutions, suspend them, and what not. Executive interference with the law takes many forms, and is further freed from impediments by the abnormal relations pertaining between Belgium under the present government, which has been in power for twenty years, and the king's autocracy on the Congo. Everything, as I have said, connected with the Congo is abnormal. The officers of the Belgian army, serving in the Congo army, continue to draw their salaries from the public funds of Belgium. Strictly speaking, no such officer accused of committing crime on the Congo can be tried there. A Belgian tribunal is alone entitled to try the case, and he should be immediately recalled. The Congo Free State stands towards Belgium in the light of a foreign power. Its headquarters are in Brussels, true, but legally it is non-existent in Belgium, and no tribunal outside the Belgian courts could sit in Belgium upon a Belgian subject accused of crime abroad without violating the constitution of Belgium. As the majority of the high officials of the Congo executive, district commissioners, inspectors, chefs de zones, and so on, are military men, it will be seen how important from King Leopold's point of view, as sovereign of the Congo state, it is that the responsibility for atrocities should not be brought home to them personally. In this, he is assisted by the character of the Congo judicial system on the one hand, and the complicity of the present Belgian government on the other. An interesting light was thrown upon this aspect of Congo abnormity by the Tilkins case in 1903. Tilkins was a sub-lieutenant in the Belgian army, and a lieutenant in the Congo army. He was in command of one of those sub-posts in the Ruby Well rubber district, 
and secured in three years forty thousand pounds worth of india rubber after he had returned to belgium charges of atrocity were preferred against him in the congo after consulting the senior governor-general who at that particular time was on leave in brussels he returned to the congo to meet them although his indictment included charges of a terrible though not unusual nature he was let out on bail of two hundred pounds convinced that he would not obtain justice on the congo but would serve as a scapegoat for the sins of his superiors he stowed away on a homecoming steamer there is little doubt that his departure was facilitated by the local executive which was not at all anxious to try him upon his return to belgium he demanded a public trial his demand was refused he was tried by default on the congo and sentenced to ten years he thereupon handed his dossier to m van der velde it contained written orders from his superior officers on the congo the high executive officials demonstrating conclusively that the usual pressure had been exercised upon him to increase his rubber output with the habitual result these m van der velde read out to the house and rightly regarding this as a test case called upon the belgian government to grant tilkins's request for a trial in belgium the minister responsible to the department of defence made no sign however what would have transpired at a public trial tilkins's defence would have been the plea of military obedience to instructions required of all soldiers which rendered atrocities upon a population already maddened by monstrous demands and only kept down by main force necessary and indeed requisite the letters of commandant verstraten see section one would have been put in in the cross-examination of this official and his predecessor in office commandant mayus the letters received by them from the acting governor-general m felix fuchs and their letters to him must necessarily have been produced and he himself cited to appear but this correspondence would have been sufficient and more than sufficient it would have had the effect of the explosion of a powder magazine under the edifice of moral and material regeneration responsibility for the rubber slave trade would have been traced to its fountain head thus it is that belgian officers executive officials of the congo administration are prosecuted on the congo only when circumstances make prevention absolutely impossible as in the case of lieutenant massard whose arrest the commission of inquiry itself demanded by telegraph to boma after hearing the evidence of monsieur scrivener and native witnesses at boma thus it is that not a single belgian officer has ever been sentenced by the congo courts save by prearranged default thus it is that not a single belgian even accused of the most abominable crimes on the congo has ever been proceeded against in belgium thus it is that when missionaries denounce the atrocities of some commandant or officer in the congo army either the accused party is given a kindly hint and proceeds down river on sick leave in route for europe while with great ostentation a judicial commission ascends the river to inquire into the charge or if matters owing to the action of some honest magistrate have reached the stage when to save the face of the law the officer has been summoned to boma surveillance is relaxed by superior order pending the examination of his dossier and the accused discreetly embarks for europe or if a stage still farther advanced has been reached before executive interference can be exercised with befitting secrecy and decency the accused is liberated on bail stows away unbeknown of course to all and when the same steamer reaches the congo on her next voyage the face of the law is saved by a summons being taken out against the captain for harboring a passenger not noted on the official passenger list a fine of twenty francs inflicted and a judiciously edited report of the proceedings finds its way into the european press through the usual channel providing yet another example of the impeccability of the congo courts 
This judicial pantomime is not played for the benefit of officers of the Belgian army only. Officials of the rubber trusts, who are believed to possess incriminating documents, are beneficiaries equally with the former. In one recent case, the departure of an official from a particular spot on the upper river synchronized with the arrival of an assistant attorney with a criminal dossier concerning him. He had left for Europe long before the investigation was complete. A final illustration of the methods of criminal jurisprudence on the Congo may be briefly touched upon. The native has been taught by sad experience to avoid the Congo courts as a pestilence. Natives who have been induced by the missionaries to testify against some official have been compelled to travel immense distances, in some cases upwards of 1,000 miles, to Boma. There they have been detained for months, in the case of one recent batch, for eight months, and there most of them have died, or come back only to die. Change of diet, homesickness, to both of which the native is peculiarly susceptible, coupled with neglect and lack of nourishment, have been mainly attributable to this mortality, deplored in the report of the Commission of Inquiry. So disgraceful has been the treatment of native witnesses, even at Boma, that in a published communication to the Congo Reform Association, dated August 17th last year, Lord Lansdowne, after referring to the reports, quote, of the severe privations from which these natives are suffering, end quote, received by His Majesty's Government from the acting British Consul at Boma, intimated that instructions had been sent to that official, quote, to give the native witnesses such assistance as he properly can in their efforts to obtain work during their detention at Boma, end quote. A kindly act very greatly to the Lordship's credit. Thus, from a sentiment of ordinary humanity, allied to a sense of philanthropic responsibility, insomuch as the charges brought by a British subject against a Congo official had led to the summoning of native witnesses to Boma, a British foreign minister instructed a British consular officer in the capital of the Congo Free State to try and find work for these natives, in order that they should procure the wherewithal to feed themselves, whom the public prosecutor had caused to be conveyed 450 miles from their homes as witnesses for the prosecution in the public trial of a Congo official. These men were the relatives of victims of the rubber slave trade from which the Congo executive reaps millions, but that executive could not afford to feed them while serving as witnesses on one of its farcical trials. Quote, the mere word boma terrifies them. Thus, at the present moment, it is very difficult, if not impossible, in many regions of the Upper Congo, to induce the natives to testify before the courts. The inhabitant of the Upper Congo, summoned as a witness, flies to the forest. He must be treated as a criminal, hunted, chained sometimes, in any case subjected to force, to conduct him from his village to the court. End quote. It is not I who wrote that. It is the commissioners of King Leopold. Personally, I can see no redeeming feature in the justice which the Congo administration has introduced into the Congo Basin, where impunity for the guilty is ensured, and where the mere act of complaining spells for the native exile or death. Rather do I agree with Professor Cartier that, quote, it is organized and systematic protection of injustice, end quote. And I fail for my part to see how any reasonable human being can arrive at an opposite conclusion. I now come to the fifth and last point, that is, the statements of travelers and others favorable to the Congo state as regards its treatment of the natives, which have been given to the world. A year ago, an extensive analysis of this evidence would have been necessary. Happily, it is no longer so, for the report of the Congo Commission has put the blatant section of the Congo state's defenders out of court. We have our revenge for the contumely they sought to throw upon us 
in the ridicule which the report of the commission of inquiry has cast upon their impartial investigations with that class of apologist and defender of the congo state british public opinion has done for good and all to recall their travesty of facts would be to do them too much honor they had their brief term of self-advertisement they succeeded for a time in helping to confuse the public mind they delayed a little the manifestation of the truth and so helped to prolong the agony of a people their consciences are doubtless satisfied apologists and defenders of the class which producing no evidence chose for reasons best known to themselves to re-echo the mendacities issued by the press bureau or in the official publications of the congo administration are no better off the report of the commission of inquiry has disposed of them also a section of the catholic priesthood and laity especially the former which in a measure quite sincerely saw in our campaign of mercy an attack upon catholic institutions and upon a catholic country must now be convinced of their double error by the statements of the religious press of belgium the debates in the belgian chamber and the report of the commission if not it must be either because these documents are inaccessible to them or because they refuse to admit that they were misled in either case further attacks upon the reform movement from that quarter would be deprived of raison d'etre a section of irish feeling is hostile and probably always will be hostile men whose judgment is as distorted as mr mckean's who would prefer king leopold to lord aberdeen at dublin castle are beyond the reach of argument but they do not count whatever feelings irishmen may entertain towards england and englishmen in the abstract or in the concrete the cause of english nationalism has nothing to gain by identifying itself with the beneficiaries of the rubber slave trade distrust suspicion even hatred of england is permissible in an irishman but love for the emperor of the congo in the irish breast is an incongruity moreover these irish admirers of the sovereign of the congo state are destitute of evidence they merely re-echo the absurdities which reach their hands through the ramifications of the press bureau the only evidence we owe to an irishman is the evidence of a gallant gentleman and man of honor roger casement these lucubrations of certain continental and irish american journals subsidized by the press bureau are similarly innocent of evidential value and beneath discussion the area of controversy so far as contradictory evidence is concerned is indeed narrowed down to a few a very few observers who have journeyed through or sojourned in parts of the congo state not visited by the commission of inquiry and who have personally seen nothing to complain of this in any case is not one may remark a matter which is in the least surprising it would be quite possible to travel from london to stanley falls and back again and observe little or nothing offensive particularly if you happen to be a person of some distinction average superficiality and no experience of african conditions travelling from antwerp to boma in one of sir alfred jones's steamers you would be perfectly comfortable and any unfavorable opinions you might have formed of the bulk of the african regenerators on board especially if you were conversant with the french tongue would be dissipated by the courtesy of the higher officials and the geniality of the english captain arrived at boma you would be impressed with the fine buildings the coquettish air of this administrative centre the general signs of activity and military punctiliousness prevailing at matadi the termination of your ocean journey this impression would strengthen at sight of the railway skirting the arid flanks of palabala the workshops the engineering establishments and so on a two days journey on the narrow gauge line winding in amazing curves amid fine scenery would probably fill you and rightly so 
I have ever rendered homage, as they say in Belgium, to the perseverant energy and determination of the Belgian engineer, Robert Tice, who constructed this line in the teeth of great obstacles, it was a triumph of individual skill and of individual enterprise. It was not the Congo government which built that railway, but a private company, with admiration. The uninhabited countryside might set him wondering, but he would probably be ignorant of the fact that what is now desert was once a thriving and populous region, and no one certainly would enlighten him. The end of his railway journey would bring him to Leopoldville, another centre of considerable activity, with many stern-wheelers, more engineering shops, churches, etc. He would not pause to think how its 3,500 inhabitants were fed, and he would not be told that the people within a radius of 60 miles were rapidly disappearing under the crushing burden of the food taxes. And so on up to Stanley Falls in a government vessel, passing not a few fine stations on the riverside, not a few steamers and other tokens of civilization. To return from this digression to the favorable evidence existing. In the Lado Enclave, the strip of territory on the Nile leased to King Leopold by Lord Rosebery twelve years ago, a large force of troops is stationed. Several forts have been erected, the soldiers are there, a smart body of men, mostly commanded by Italian officers. Their barracks are substantial and commodious. The stations are well kept. Two British officers visiting these Congolese military and political posts have commented favorably upon their appearance. Their remarks have been spread broadcast by the press bureau, and made the most of. Curiously enough, no one in this country had suspected the existence of an evil state of affairs in this tiny strip of territory until Lord Cromer's scathing comments appeared in the White Book of 1904. Since then, information has reached me from unquestionable sources that the history of the construction of these military edifices was characterized by the usual proceedings. The Foreign Office can throw light upon it whenever it chooses to do so. I observe that Sir Charles Eliot, in his recently published volume, speaks rather favorably of these Congolese stations on the Nile, and adds, quote, It is generally said that our officers can always reduce natives to obedience by threatening to deport them to the Belgian side of the river. It is certain that there are no villages for many miles round the Belgian stations. End quote. In short, it is quite possible to speak in commendation of the armed Congo camps on the Nile without affecting the question of the wrongs of the Congo natives in the very slightest degree, and from such commendation the Congo administration is welcome to any consolation it can derive. What remains, then, as positive evidence favorable to the Congo state? The experiences of Mr. Gray and one or two other Englishmen in the employ of the Tanganyika Concessions Limited, which is engaged in exploiting the copper mines of southeastern Katanga, and the experiences of Sir Harry Johnston, who penetrated 30 miles into the Congo state territory from Uganda in 1900, and visited other parts previously. I need say no more on this point beyond mentioning that as these lines are written, I understand Dr. Harry Johnston will be good enough to contribute a short piece to this volume, and adding that the Congo Reform Association is proud to number him among its supporters. As for Mr. George Gray's experiences, his distinguished brother, the present British Minister for Foreign Affairs, referred to them with perfect frankness in the last debate on the Foreign Office vote. He confirmed their favorable nature, and explained that they were carefully limited to the southern extremity of the Congo state, where it might be added there is no rubber, and where the presence of a number of Englishmen, and especially an Englishman known by King Leopold to be related to the British Minister of Foreign Affairs, is in itself calculated to keep excesses in check. I will make a present to the Press Bureau of another favorable piece of testimony. 
it comes from a missionary acquaintance of mine who writing from upoto in the early part of the present year states quote, happy upoto has been under the rule of commandant scardino for the past three years it is no secret that he is not in accord with congo state methods consequently upoto district has not been terrorized to such an extent as other parts commandant scardino has ever shown himself as inclined to leniency rather than oppression and taxes have been more frequently modified than increased End quote. i am happy to print that paragraph concerning an italian officer and gentleman who like other of his compatriots has had the breeding and the strength of will to endeavor amid great difficulties to rise above the system whose unwilling servants he and they have been and who as a result are detested by the supreme congo executive as much as the british missionaries almost nor are such exceptions wholly confined to italian officers captain le maire of the belgian army is another and a very notable one poor domes was another but he disappeared the officials who fall foul of the executive are curiously apt to disappear on the congo in the case of domes the agent of disappearance appears to have been a hippopotamus the danish lieutenant s very nearly did i hope that officer's experiences may some day be published he is highly connected and his story would be especially interesting from the point of view of the treatment by the congo executive of the foreign officers who have accepted appointments in the congo army under a complete misconception of the state of affairs and who have endured all the indignities privations dangers and moral sapping which an italian officer in a letter to me after describing la trite de noir the black slave trade rightly describes as la trite de blanc the white slave trade these solitary exceptions are the one bright spot in the sea of blackness for all the riffraff of the european armies the lost souls as the italians say have been recruited by king leopold's agents to carry out his infamous policy blackguards were required to perform that dirty work and the congo basin has been flooded with blackguards converted in many instances to fiends incarnate by the tasks they have been set to do nor is it only among army officers that exceptions have occurred who shall tell the tale of the miseries of the wretched belgian clerk or artisan ill-bred ignorant but with decent instincts who has gone out to the congo to the tune of the brabanson footnote the belgian national anthem and footnote filled with patriotic imaginings only to find himself thrust into some outstation and told to get rubber plunged suddenly into an earthly hell missionaries have had such men coming to them half frantic after a few weeks stay begging and imploring their assistance and a shot self-inflicted has often enough abruptly terminated a career which in europe might at least have been respectable no one who has probed deep down into this cesspool of iniquity and naked human passions or who understands the workings of the monstrous growth which civilization has allowed to spring up in central africa blames the agents of the system but the system itself the miserable tools are to be pitied brutes as many of them are the déclassé the failures the offscourings of europe it is the beneficiaries that should be pilloried the modern slavers of africa who sit at home and pocket the dividends above all that one will the will of a megalomaniac which controls rules dominates every wheel and rivet of the machine drunk with absolutism impervious to every feeling of humanity who drives his daughter from her mother's deathbed flaunts with ostentation the irregularities of his private life before all men and rakes in millions from the anguish of his miserable african slaves End of section 14section 15 of red rubber the story of the rubber slave trade on the congo 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Red Rubber, the Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dene Morel. Section 15. The Beneficiaries. Bondage under the most barbarous and inhuman conditions, and maintained for mercenary motives of the most selfish character. The Marquess of Lansdowne, in House of Lords, July 1906. But this labor, which is said to be instead of a tax in the Congo state, do we know what it goes into? Do we know that it goes into the pockets of the state or to the public revenue? There are no public accounts, and as long as that is so, and so long as this taxation or this labor is levied by companies working for private individuals, the Congo state must remain open to the reproach that it is imposing not taxes, but forced labor for the purposes of private profit. Sir Edward Gray in the House of Commons, July 1906. Let us repeat, after so many others, what has become a platitude. The success of this work is the result of an autocratic government, that is to say, of the prescience of a single man guided by a single thought. It is the work of one soul directing will. Alfred Poskin, Bylands Congo Lai. To procure for the sovereign a maximum of revenue, such has been the object of administrative activity. Professor F. Cattier, Royalist and Annexationist, Teacher of Colonial Jurisprudence at the University of Brussels. The preceding sections have dealt with the history of King Leopold's Congo enterprise and the deeds which have characterized it, more especially during the last decade, as the effects of the system elaborated in the royal decrees of 1891 to 2 have made themselves felt with increasing force throughout a steadily widening area. An examination of the arguments advanced in favor of that enterprise, or an extenuation of its offenses, has enabled us to pass successfully in review the general condition of the native peoples under King Leopold's absolutism, the relative criminality of the Arab ivory slave trader, and the European rubber slave trader, the validity of the liquor traffic contention, the nature and the working of the judicial system introduced into the country, and finally the value and extent of the positive evidence favorable to the treatment of natives by Congolese officials. We have now to consider for whom, in whose interests, this martyrdom of the races of Central Africa is being inflicted and endured. Who are the beneficiaries of the rubber slave trade? what is being done with the profits accruing therefrom. Before coming to that point, it may be useful to summarize in a few passages the conclusions of the report of the Congo Commission of Inquiry in regard to the two main direct causes from which the miseries of the natives spring, and as such affecting particularly the efforts made in this country to compel exposure and redress viz. the requisitions in India rubber and the requisitions in staple food supplies. So far as the rubber taxes are concerned, the Commission found that everywhere on the Congo and notwithstanding certain appearances to the contrary, the native only gathers India rubber under the influence of direct or indirect force, page 266, and made sundry allusions to what is implied by the word force on the Congo, viz. indiscriminate massacre, settlements of soldiers in rubber-producing villages, uncontrolled and unhampered in the execution of their instructions, taking of hostages, imprisonment of women and children, flogging, illegal fines and punishments, and so on. It thus described the condition of the rubber-gatherer. In the majority of cases, he must, every fortnight, go one or two days' journey and sometimes more, to reach the place in the forest where he can find in fair abundance the rubber vine. There the gatherer passes some days in a miserable existence. He must construct an improvised shelter, which cannot obviously replace his hut. He has not the food to which he is accustomed, 
he is deprived of his wife exposed to the inclemencies of the weather and to the attacks of wild beasts he must take his harvest to the station of the government or the company and it is only after that he returns to his village where he can barely reside two or three days before a new demand is upon him page 192 in other words the native in the subjugated rubber districts of the congo must on the commission's own showing under pain of suffering the various methods or retribution alluded to by the commission devote over three hundred days under the above named conditions conditions obviously involving enormous loss of life per annum to the gathering of rubber in order to pay his obligatory tax either to the congo government or to its trusts so far as the taxes in staple foodstuffs are concerned the commission found that around leopoldville page one seventy four to five and all the great centers page one seventy seven the population is compelled to bring in every four seven or twelve days considerable supplies of native prepared bread sometimes from enormous distances as the bread kwanga only keeps fresh for a few days the native even by doubling his activity cannot free himself from his obligations for any length of time even if the tax does not claim his whole time he is perpetually obsessed by the thought of the next near payment which causes the tax to lose its true character and to be transformed into an incessant corvée page 176 the results noted by the commission from this taxation were depopulation page 174 the abandonment of the villages page 177 the general misery reigning page 177 the commission found that the same conditions characterize the riverine tribes taxed in fish the same recurrent demands the same depopulation the same methods of coercion for shortage beside these admissions which are here very briefly summarized the remainder of the report is of secondary importance they show us broadly speaking the population of the subjugated area of the upper congo divided into two great groups or sections the rubber gatherers and the food suppliers the first the direct suppliers of revenue the second the indirect suppliers of revenue laboring to feed the army of officials agents soldiers and their retinue quartered upon the direct suppliers to compel the incessant output of rubber and to feed the workmen laborers woodcutters station hands and others engaged in various ways in handling preparing and shipping the rubber to europe the admissions of the commissioners show us these two great sections of the populace doomed to a perpetual enslavement working out their cruel destiny for alien taskmasters without pause without rest without hope growing fewer in numbers impoverished and miserable and subjected to inhuman punishments to use professor cadier's words the impositions in rubber and foodstuffs which weigh upon more than half the territory that is to say over an area three or four times as large as france subject the natives to a well-nigh continuous slavery to a slavery more severe than that imposed by the arabs why why this enslavement and destruction of a people the same old motives which from the beginning have been responsible for all the great world tragedies human ambition greed and selfishness yes but let us narrow responsibility to its just limits to arrive at the truth by process of questioning is a sound method handed down to us by the ancients what in reality is the congo free state is it a state the fundamental principle of a state is the participation of the people of the land in the government of their country it must be clear to the meanest intelligence that the people of the congo state do not participate in the government of the country the people of the congo are divided into a number of separate communities and tribes and there has been no attempt to weld together into one state form any of these communities or tribes hence the word state in connection with the congo enterprise is a complete misnomer is it an african protectorate or dependency 
an african protectorate or dependency implies the establishment or overlordship by a european nation in a portion of africa for its protection against external aggression and for its internal administration through the development of the country in the interests of the people of the land and of the european nation which has assumed overlordship no european nation has assumed overlordship of the congo but with the assent of the powers a single man king leopold the second of belgium attributed to himself the title of sovereign over the communities and tribes of the congo basin the country is not being developed in the interests of the people of the land nor in the interests of a european nation hence the congo enterprise is neither protectorate nor dependency then what is the congo enterprise it has no precedent nothing with which it can be compared it is unique its component parts are one a european king monarch of a small european state whose neutrality was guaranteed by the powers who claims sovereignty over twenty millions of negroes in central africa two a staff of executive officials who direct the exercise of that sovereignty from a european capital three a staff of executive officials who exercise that sovereignty in central africa through four a considerable force of native troops workmen and laborers what interpretation has the sovereign given to his claim of sovereignty over these twenty millions of african men women and children he has interpreted without the consent of the powers the word sovereignty to mean possession how has he interpreted the word possession he has interpreted it by an immense appropriation and expropriation he has interpreted it by conveyancing the land of these twenty millions of negroes to himself and all vegetable and mineral products which that land contains this gigantic property he has divided into various parts for the purpose of raising and classifying its revenues one part he has set aside to provide the sums necessary for the remuneration of the executive staff in brussels and on the congo the construction of dwelling places for the staff on the congo the construction of public works and other undertakings required to ensure the working of the property this part of the property a he has called domain privé which by a recent manifesto he has altered with fine irony into domain national another part b he has handed over for stewardship on various terms to financiers from whom he has borrowed money or to personal friends and officials of his european court these with his assistance have raised capital to work the property thus entrusted to them and form companies which they have floated on the belgian stock exchange in these companies the sovereign holds shares usually one half the total number issued a third part c he has declared inalienable from himself and his heirs forever its revenues accrue to him this part is termed domain de la Corone. of what do the assets or the revenues of this property consist they consist one of the produce of the soil which has commercial value on the european markets after paying expense of handling and transport two the people of the land the climate of the congo being what it is the produce of the soil is only obtainable by the people of the land and the conveyancing of the former by the sovereign to himself would have been but a meaningless operation without the services of the people and how are the services of the people secured the commission of inquiry has told us by force and force spells in practice as the commission of inquiry has also told us and as the evidence we have produced shows us the enslavement and destruction of the people of the land the congo free state is therefore not a state nor an african protectorate or dependency but an estate in africa covering nearly one million square miles and inhabited by perhaps twenty million human beings this estate is claimed by one man although he has never set foot in it living in europe as his exclusive property 
he having dispossessed the native inhabitants of their land and the produce of the land which they alone can gather and enslave them in their homes to collect that produce for himself and generally to work his property for him and i beg you to recollect that we are not living in the times of the pharaohs but have entered the twentieth century of the christian era from henceforth let us dismiss from our minds our speech and our writings the idea that the administration or the maladministration of an african state or dependency is in question king leopold is the state and king leopold absentee landlord of a vast african property is alone in question above all let us refrain from referring to the congo as a belgian colony let us avoid writing of belgian misrule and let us keep from saddling the belgian people with responsibility which is not theirs save morally and in that respect only a few degrees more so than it is of the british and american peoples until the report of the congo commission of inquiry appeared after eight months procrastination shorn of all the evidence placed before it the sovereign of the congo enterprise had with considerable skill manipulated belgian public opinion entirely in his favor foreign criticisms directed against his enterprise had been invariably represented as an attack upon the belgian people and the scandals of that enterprise sheltered in the folds of the belgian flag and beneath the cloak of belgian patriotism the press bureau persistently fanned this legend and as nearly all the belgian newspapers were influenced by it and the belgian people largely ignorant of the true state of affairs the scheme worked with wonderful success the publication of the report of the commission of inquiry says professor cadier in the preface to his notable volume has transformed as by a magic wand the nature of the discussion of congo affairs whoever should have alleged a year ago one-tenth of facts which to-day are definitely established would have run the risk of prosecution to-day the situation in belgium has indeed altered and is discussed with greater fullness in the last section of this book here we will be content with tracing so far as is possible under present circumstances how the revenues from the congo enterprise are distributed and the amount of them figures are always indigestible to the average reader but it is absolutely necessary in this instance to deal with them we have drunk deep from the well of human misery the well of human greed has now to be explored the king the reader will remember has divided his self-constituted property so far as the revenues derived therefrom are concerned into three parts a revenue to cover general working expenses of the property termed government or public revenue b revenues acquired through the allotment of portions of the property to companies or trusts for the collection of india rubber c personal revenues inalienable retaining the fiction of a state an official bulletin is issued several times a year by the brussels section of the king's congo staff and in this official bulletin is given each year what purports to be the revenue and expenditure of the state these figures are estimates only and printed as such the actual returns are never issued they are the estimates be it well understood of the revenues derived from the part of the congo marked a example and the domain privé or national they profess to be the estimated revenues and expenditure of the government until 1903 they were supposed to represent an estimate of the total revenues derived by the government from the state the very existence of part c with its inalienable personal revenues having been systematically denied although created in 1896 these estimates have been issued since 1891 and for the 15 years 1891 to 1905 inclusive figure out as follows receipts 250 million 353 thousand 590 expenditure 277 million 491 569 
excess of expenditure over receipts twenty seven million one hundred and thirty seven nine hundred and seventy nine according to the above figures then the general management of the congo enterprise has entailed in fifteen years an estimated working loss in round figures of pounds one million and eighty five thousand these figures being estimates only are valueless they are not only valueless in the present instance but deliberately misleading to what extent will never be known probably unless one of king leopold's congo staff in brussels should turn king's evidence in so far as they are used in argument as indicative of the profit and loss on the management of the congo enterprise they are fraudulent very few persons have succeeded in ascertaining the amount realized by king leopold's brokers from the sale of the rubber and ivory which constitute the principal items in the estimated revenue obtained from this part a or domain privé of the congo m a j waters has published the figures of the sales affected on the antwerp market for eighteen ninety five six and seven dr anton professor at the university of jena was able to give those for eighteen ninety eight the present writer secured from an unquestionable source those for eighteen ninety nine and nineteen hundred and father vermeersch whose sources of information like those of the authorities mentioned above have on this point never been contested claims to have ascertained the total realizations for nineteen o four and nineteen o five the figures for nineteen o one two and three are unhappily still a mystery a comparison of these figures with the estimates will be instructive thus in the six years for which we possess information of the partial realizations of sales and for the two years in which we possess information relating to the total of realization of sales we find that the estimates are forty eight million nine hundred and forty nine thousand four hundred or just under pounds two million less than the receipts the first pounds two million unaccounted for the misleading character of these revenue estimates does not stop there the estimates include each year a given sum which varies with the years representing king leopold's share in the profits of the companies which run part b of the congo these estimates are entered as produit du portefeuille or proceeds from stock held and a congo official remarked to consul casement with grim irony that they would be more fittingly entitled produit du portefeuille or proceeds from the rifle these estimates are invariably below the actual figure for the two years nineteen o four and nineteen o five the estimates total five million two hundred and seventy two seven hundred and seventy whereas the proportions accruing to king leopold as holder of half the shares in three of these companies only amounted to nine million three nine hundred and fourteen an excess of nearly one hundred and fifty thousand over the estimates as i have said the full amounts realized will never be ascertained probably but the above figures are conclusive on one point the revenues from part a of the congo territories domain privé set aside to cover the expenses of running the enterprise have not been less than the expenditure as the published estimates would have us believe but have largely exceeded the expenditure there has been a substantial surplus in the last fifteen years which can be placed with the utmost moderation at two million with the certainty of being far below the mark and that surplus is nowhere accounted for we will now turn to part b the portion of the congo made over by the king to financiers and friends who have floated companies on the belgian stock exchange formed under congo law in order to escape control of belgian company laws and who dispose of the rubber they collect by the means we have noted chiefly on the antwerp market these companies or trusts are eight in number the abir lopori and moringa and of Wiswa, mangala kasai basin of the kasai commercial congolai wamba grand locks arumi comité spécial du katanga katanga busira busira lomami lomami 
for all practical purposes we may leave out of account in considering the revenues derived from the rubber slave trade up to the present time the busira and the lamami concessions the grand locks or aruimi concession as it is usually but not quitely accurately termed the commercial congolai and the katanga the busira and the lomami and commercial congolai are relatively small concerns the exploitation of the rubber of the aruimi concession by the king's agents only began eighteen months ago and the returns are not yet available the katanga concession has for various reasons been preserved hitherto from showing substantial profits its future would seem to lie in its copper mines which introduces a new element not ripe at present for examination both the aruimi and the katanga are sources of great potential wealth and lie outside the scope of the present expose up till now the abir and avoir and kasai have been the three great revenue producers among the companies and to these i propose to confine myself the abir used to be known as the anglo-belgian india rubber company in which colonel north was at one time interested its career of prosperity began with its reconstitution in eighteen ninety eight as a congo company at which time i believe all british capital was withdrawn its nominal capital is forty thousand pounds in two thousand shares of twenty pounds each king leopold possesses one thousand of these shares its paid-up capital is only nine thousand two hundred and eighty pounds its managing council is at present composed of m a van den nest senator count j d'oltremont grand master of king leopold european court a de brown de tiege formerly member of parliament for antwerp a banker who some years ago lent money to the king m alexis malls count horace van der berg and m j van stoppen monsieur van ertevold one of king leopold's principal congo secretaries of state and baron donnies an ex-governor-general of the congo used to be on the council and i believe they are now but i am not sure the net profits of this concern in six years have amounted to eighteen million four thousand one hundred and seventy two francs and the dividends paid per share to eight thousand three hundred and seventy five francs thus in six years this company has made a net profit of seven hundred and twenty thousand pounds out of the rubber slave trade on a paid-up capital of nine thousand two hundred and eighty pounds and each share of a paid-up value of four pounds has received three hundred and thirty five pounds the king's profits may be calculated on these figures but those profits do not stand alone to stimulate interest among the belgian public in the congo enterprise shares were split up into tents and they are still quoted in tents on the antwerp stock exchange in this manner public speculation was excited and those in the know have done well for the shares row prodigiously thus in eighteen ninety nine the stock exchange quotation for a full share was seventeen thousand nine hundred and fifty francs in nineteen hundred twenty five thousand two hundred and fifty francs in nineteen o three fifteen thousand eight hundred francs these extraordinary fluctuations are significant of much which goes on behind the scenes at the headquarters of the rubber slave trade in the three years given above the owner of one thousand full shares was either a millionaire or next door to it let the reader judge one thousand shares paid up value say four thousand six hundred and forty pounds in eighteen ninety nine was seven hundred and eighteen thousand pounds nineteen hundred one million ten thousand pounds nineteen o three six hundred and thirty two thousand pounds eight years of slaughter endemic oppression and exhaustion of the rubber bearing vines have done their work the output is falling rapidly and the full share today is only worth one hundred and eighty eight pounds i say worth i should have said quoted it is not worth anything like that so far as its congo expectations are concerned but some of the blood-stained profits of former years have been invested in rubber plantations in the malay states and doubtless in other undertakings 
the property of this company on the Congo is virtually ruined, and precisely the same history is being repeated in the Kasai, to which we will now direct our attention. Prior to 1902, the Kasai Basin was the only region of the vast upper Congo left open to trade. This concession has been wrung out of the king by the opposition of the Belgian merchants established in the upper Congo, when the royal decrees, 1891-2, to two, interpreting the rights of sovereignty into personal possession, were promulgated. Fourteen Belgian and Dutch merchants bought rubber from the natives on fair terms, and did a brisk business. Then King Leopold stepped in and forced these firms to amalgamate in a trust. The natives became the property of the trust, and the rubber in the forests also. The share capital is 1,005,000 francs in 4,020 shares of 250 francs per share of which the king holds 2,010. The administrators in Europe are appointed subject to the king's approval. The powers of this administrative council are controlled by a permanent committee, composed of four members, two of whom the king selects, the other two being appointed subject to the king's approval. The king appoints the chairman of the committee, and he has the casting vote. The net profits of the concern have been as follows. 1902, 1,465,279 francs. 1903, 3,687,161 francs. 1904, 5,597,449 francs. 1905, 7,543,000 francs. Or in the four years, 731,680 pounds on a capital fully paid up, I believe, of 40,200 pounds. These shares are also dealt with in tents. The value of the full share today is 15,500 francs. The king's 2,010 shares are worth, therefore, at the present figure, 1,244,200 pounds. The profits of the rubber slave trade are not exactly negligible. 1,200 tons of rubber on a total output of 5,000 tons from the whole of the Congo were wrung from the Kasai natives last year. The state of things in this part of the sovereign's property must beggar description. According to the best authorities, the Kasai natives ten years ago were the finest races on the Congo, celebrated for moral and physical beauty. They are now in process of being extirpated and dragged down to the level of unhappy Mongos, Bujas, Ebuyas, Ebabuas, and other tribes inhabiting the rubber zone. The history of the third great trust, that of the Mangala, is more startling than its profits, which, however, are not to be despised. The European board consists of M. A. de Brown de Tiaget, whom, as we have seen, is on the ABI board. M. C. de Brown de Tiaget, Monsieur Bunt, the king's broker, and Baron Goffinet, an intendant of the king's civil list, otherwise stated one of the keepers of the privy purse. Quite a happy family party. The capital is 1,700,000 francs, divided into 3,400 shares of 500 francs each, of which the king holds 1,700. Moreover, the king levies 15% on the company's rubber profits when a fixed percentage of profit has been reached. The net profits of the three fat years, 1898, 1899, and 1903, amounted to 360,000 pounds. Profit-taking in 1900, 1901, and 1902 was sadly interfered with by the Bujas, a fierce tribe which declined to be enslaved. Now the profits are steadily rising again the king having taken over the business, which means in practical politics that the natives are being kept at work, wholly by the king's troops commanded by officers instead of by the less efficient irregulars raised by the trust and commanded by men of the Kodron type. It seems that the Bujas are now working well, and the value of a full share, the shares are also quoted in tents, is now 280 pounds. 
seventeen hundred shares of a nominal value of twenty pounds equals thirty four thousand four hundred pounds seventeen hundred shares at two hundred and eighty pounds equals four hundred and six thousand pounds q e d shortly after the notorious major lothair strung up mr strokes to the nearest available tree after a trial which lord fitzmaurice has recently called one of the most disgraceful judicial farces which ever sullied the annals of what purported to be a court of justice king leopold appointed him to the post of managing director of this concern in africa and it is said that his majesty had very weighty reasons for offering this most energetic official a lucrative berth which that berth certainly proved itself to be end of section fifteen recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com section sixteen of red rubber the story of the rubber slave trade on the congo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com Red Rubber, The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo by Edmund Dene Morel Section 16 The Beneficiaries, Part 2 We now come to Part C of the Congo Territory. Domain de la Colonne whose revenues the absentee landlord has appropriated to his own exclusive manipulation. The world is not even favored with estimates of these revenues. Sown in blood, they are harvested in secret. We owe to Professor Cadier the first and the only disclosures of their amount and the disposal of them. All we knew prior to the appearance of his revelations this year were the names of the three gentlemen appointed by the king to manage them, Baron Goffinet already holding a distinguished position, as we have seen, in the Congo enterprise, Baron Raoul Snoy, one of the king's aides-de-camp, and Monsieur Drugmans, secretary for the management of the Domaine Privé, or A, revenues, again a harmonious family party with great elaboration by carefully tabulated statistics by a system of double check worked out in detail professor cadier has been able to estimate that the net profits procured from this private preserve have amounted in the last decade to a strict minimum of pounds two million eight hundred and fifty four thousand or nearly three hundred thousand pounds per annum in the course of the debate in the belgian chamber last march Monsieur de Smet de Nier, the premier of whom more anon, and Monsieur de Favreau, the foreign minister, upon of whom the Congo autocrat can rely upon any circumstances, endeavored to dispute Professor Cadier's figures. But the attempt broke down hopelessly. Monsieur de Favreau described the estimates as very much exaggerated, but when pressed to give the actual figure, replied amid laughter, I do not know what it is. Monsieur de Smet de Neuer was not much happier. Basing himself upon data purporting to fix the total rubber producing area of the Congo, and deducting therefrom the area of the Domaine de la Coron, he declared that the king's profits had been nearer seven hundred and twenty thousand pounds than two million pounds. Asked if he took the responsibility for this figure, Monsieur Desmay de Nier answered that he was not called upon to establish before the house the revenues of the Domaine de la Coron, but was merely disposing of Professor Cadier's errors. Unfortunately for the speaker, he was shown at a subsequent stage in the debate to have himself been guilty of a prodigious error, by including in the rubber-producing area of the Congo, as quoted by him to the house, the area covered by all the waterways of the immense fluvial system of the country, plus the area where rubber is known to exist, where it has not yet been exploited. Hence Professor Cadier's estimates remain unshaken. He might easily have been confounded by the king furnishing the Prime Minister of Belgium with the real figure, 
if that figure had been lower than the professor's estimates that the prime minister was not so furnished is pretty conclusive evidence that the real figure is higher than professor cadier's estimates but this terrible critic of the absentee african landlord did not end there he succeeded in obtaining some remarkable information as to the disposal of these revenues he found that they were utilized inter alia in the creation of a press bureau the subsidizing of journalists newspapers and jurists for the drawing up of doctrinal thesis whereby the king has sought to invest with legality the appropriation of eight hundred thousand square miles of african territory to himself the construction of a colonial school at Tuverin, the construction of a triumphant arch in brussels the cost of which the belgian parliament had declined to sanction from the national funds improvements on a colossal scale of the royal residence at lichen last but not least the purchase of real estate it was in dealing with the latter item that professor cadier was specially instructive he searched through the register of mortgages for two of the wards or districts of belgium that of brussels and that of ostend and he found that the king had purchased in the name of domaine de la Coron as purchaser real estate to the amount as entered on the bills of sale of seven hundred and thirty one thousand five hundred and sixty pounds eighteen pages of professor cadier's volume are devoted to a detailed enumeration of the one hundred and fifteen transactions officially recorded in these two wards alone land houses gardens hotels woods building grounds stables etc are mentioned in these astonishing purchases which as mr harold spender says look as if king leopold aimed at using the proceeds of the congo for turning belgium into his private estate i do not know whether belgian legislation includes what might correspond to our statues of mortmain but there would seem to be need of something of the kind the genius of leopold africanus has imagined yet another method of acquiring further sums from his african party for example by means of loans the nominal liabilities of the congo state are considerable they are as follows eighteen eighty eight public debt one hundred and fifty million francs eighteen ninety and eighteen ninety five debt contracted with belgium thirty one million eight hundred and four thousand four hundred and five francs eighteen ninety six loan one million five hundred thousand francs eighteen ninety eight loan with belgium twelve million five hundred thousand francs nineteen o one loan with belgium fifty million francs nineteen ninety four thirty million francs or a total nominal indebtedness in round figures of eleven million pounds the one million five hundred thousand one hundred franc bonds of the eighteen eighty eight loan are redeemable in ninety nine years by drawings on the lottery system the guaranteed fund being sufficient to provide for interest and sinking fund no interest is paid on the issues according to monsieur de smed de nyer nine hundred thousand of these bonds have been issued according to professor cadier the issue of the first one hundred thousand bonds was authorized in february eighteen eighty eight and the subscription list was opened on march seventh of the same year at the price of eighty three francs per bond a further issue of eight hundred thousand bonds was authorized by the decree of november three nineteen o two he adds that this issue was partly converted in nineteen o three if M. de Smetinier's figure is accurate, and his statements, as we have seen, must be received with caution, only 200,000 bonds out of the last authorized issue have been converted. A large number of bonds have been placed in France, and M. Lucien Coquet, in an able treatise, declares that in 1903 the number of bonds negotiable on the French market was 796,875 should this be true it means that france holds four-fifths of the total issue up to date an interesting circumstance deserving of note king leopold pays no interest to belgium on the money borrowed from her in eighteen ninety and eighteen ninety five 
The loans of 1896, 1898, and 1901 bear interest at 4%, and the loan of 1904 at 3%. The bonds created under the 1901 loan are reimbursable in 90 years. The bonds issued under the 1904 loan, known as the 3%, Congo, bear interest as from March 1st of that year. A portion of this stock was placed at par, the balance at a discount, of no less than 28%. In addition to the nominal liabilities mentioned above, an indirect debt was incurred in 1901, consisting of a guarantee of interest of 4% on a sum of 25 million francs raised by the Grand Lax Trust. In his recent manifesto, King Leopold expresses his intention of raising a further loan of 100 million francs, 4 million sterling. What has King Leopold actually received from these loans? It's impossible to say with certainty. Professor Cadier, after an elaborate analysis, based upon the sums set aside in the annual Congo estimates for interest on loans, reckons the figure at 3,200,000 pounds, exclusive of the 1888 loan. The yield from the 1888 loan he reckons at 2 million pounds, total of 5,200,000 pounds. A long and heated discussion took place in the Belgian chamber over these figures last March. The upshot of it was that an actual yield of a little over 3 million pounds was admitted by Monsieur de Smet de Nair, who gave no proof as various speakers pointed out, that the larger sum estimated by Professor Carrier did not approximate more closely to the truth. And now let us sum up this astonishing series of facts. King Leopold starts upon his Congo career by declaring that he has taken in hand a philanthropic enterprise. Stanley came over to this country as his mouthpiece, and doubtless quite sincerely at the time chided his audience for a latent skepticism or lack of sentiment. They could not, he told them, appreciate rightly because there are no dividends attached to it, this restless, ardent, vivifying and expansive sentiment which seeks to extend civilizing influence among the dark places of sad-browed Africa. For several years the king sinks 40,000 pounds per annum in the Congo which he is gradually taking steps to turn into his private possession, with everything animal, vegetable, and mineral within it included. He publishes annual statements which profess to be estimates of the total revenues acquired by this philanthropic enterprise, and he invites the world to note that during the last fifteen years, notwithstanding his royal liberality, the enterprise shows a loss of one million eighty-five thousand pounds. Upon examination, those estimates are found to have been below the receipts by something like three million pounds, so that an alleged loss is converted into a profit of nearly two million pounds, nowhere accounted for. It transpires, moreover, that the king is the holder of the shares in rubber companies, which he has caused to be formed and floated in Brussels and on the Congo, and which he controls through his creatures and that the stock exchange value of his holdings today is two million pounds. It transpires further that, after concealing the fact for eight years, the king has set aside a portion of the Congo four times the size of England, Scotland, and Wales, for himself exclusively, and that the net revenues he has derived therefore in ten years amount to two million eight hundred and fifty-four thousand pounds. Thus we find that the king's philanthropic enterprise has in the last 15 years produced a net profit of just under five million pounds, instead of a deficit of one million eighty-five thousand pounds, and that the close of these 15 years finds the king in possession of shares in three rubber companies of a total stock exchange value of two million pounds apart altogether from the enormous potential value of his holding in the two other Congo companies, the Katanga and its subsidiaries, and the Grand Lax, or Aruimi. Holder of these shares in two cases for eight years, in one case for four years, 
he has been in a position to reap all the profits from speculation thus afforded and with the greater facility since the large proportion of these shares held by him carried with it control of the market this picture is completed by the revelation that to meet an alleged published deficit of one million eighty five thousand pounds he has contracted nominal debts to the amount of eleven million pounds from which he has admittedly received three million pounds the whole of these vast sums are the proceeds of the rubber slave trade of the Congo, raised directly or indirectly from the unspeakable oppression, misery, and partial extermination of the native Central Africa. Crime so awful, scandal of such magnitude, tragedy so immeasurable, the world surely has never seen their like in combination. The question with which this section is headed now answered and the facts herein tabulated can only be disproved in one way, viz. by the production of audited balance sheets of the Congo revenues covering the last fifteen years, and these will not be forthcoming. King Leopold is the main beneficiary of the rubber slave trade. A long way behind him, the chosen few whom choice or temporary necessity have caused to be selected as participants in the royal spoil. As a Belgian writer puts it, the slave trade has been re-established for the benefit of King Leopold and twenty rich families in Belgium. It bodes little what the sovereign of the Congo has done with this ill-gotten wealth if he had spent it all and all the additional wealth it has enabled him to amass in other fields in charitable institutions the crime the scandal and the tragedy would remain true to his role king leopold now seeks to pose as the celestially appointed agent to stem the ravages of malaria and sleeping sickness he has given one thousand pounds to sir alfred jones his liverpool consul and the ocean carrier of his rubber for the liverpool school of tropical medicine an admirable institution of which sir alfred jones is the president and in his recent manifesto offers to spend twelve thousand pounds towards fighting the sleeping sickness the mere idea of a grant of twelve thousand pounds out of as many millions wrung from the congo natives fills this royal pecksniff with such emotion at his own goodness that he declares if god gives me that satisfaction victory over sleeping sickness i shall be able to present myself before his judgment seat with the credit of having performed one of the finest acts of the century and a legion of rescued beings will call down upon me his grace prodigious one feels inclined to suggest a special form of prayer for the use of the royal benefactor somewhat after this wise o almighty god from my ill-gotten millions i devote unto thee the colossal sum of twelve thousand pounds to save thy people in africa from a disease which my policy towards them by increasing their impoverishment and misery by destroying their confidence by robbing them of their staple food supplies by plunging them in wretchedness and despair has largely increased stained as my policy is with crimes innumerable thou wilt appreciate the extent of this my pecuniary sacrifice at the touch of my royal robe whole tribes have disappeared as though struck down with a mysterious pestilence the progress of my triumphal march through the equatorial forest is marked by the bleached bones of men and women but all good deeds have their painful sides and what is the evil wrought besides these twelve thousand golden pieces which i offer upon this sacrificial altar for the salvation of those of my black subjects whose eyelids unhappily for them are not yet closed in sleep eternal it bodes little whether the bulk of this money has been and is being expended on what the king considers the interests of belgium we shall see in the next section the peculiar way in which those interests are regarded by him. Obviously he cannot spend it all on himself or his friends of either sex. The improvements at the Lycan Palace are to cost, when completed, one million two hundred thousand pounds. The triumphal arch erected in Brussels, and which the nation did not require, cost two hundred thousand pounds. 
plans have recently been submitted to his majesty for the erection of an enormous statue of himself mounted on a charger to be erected in brussels in 1910 at a cost of 150,000 pounds. The investigations into the value of the real estate he has purchased in Belgium have only begun. Professor Cattier has proved purchases totaling 731,560 pounds. Monsieur van der Velde was able to inform the Belgian Chamber last March that Professor Cattier's disclosures by no means exhaust the list that more real estate has been bought by the domaine de la Caron in the provinces of Louvrain, Namur, and Luxembourg. The same speaker alleged that other properties had been purchased by the king in the name of Baron Gaufrenet, with whom the reader will be familiar. It is, of course, well known that the king owns large properties on the Mediterranean, notably at Cape Ferrat where a magnificent residence and grounds are occupied by madame la baron vaughan the french government declined to recognize the domaine de la caron as a valid purchaser and the property was acquired in the name of the king's medical adviser m van der velde estimates the purchase price of the properties at cape ferrat and in brussels under the name of baron gaufonnet at six hundred and eighty thousand pounds and he is exceptionally well informed. It is, of course, equally well known that the king has invested large sums in Chinese railways and in Persia, and there are rumors that his agents are conducting negotiations in San Domingo and Bolivia. He is reported to have invested 600,000 pounds in Suez Canal stock, very large sums have certainly been expended in the campaign of mendacity organized throughout the world by his press bureau especially in france the united states italy and germany a great deal of information has come into my hands on this subject but not in a form which renders publicity always possible or internationally desirable there is not a well-informed Frenchman on colonial affairs, but knows that the present admittedly deplorable state of affairs in the African territory of France bordering King Leopold's preserve is the outcome primarily of Leopoldian intrigue with a golden lining. The men who in France are struggling against the inoculation of French colonial ideas by the Leopoldian virus, Anatole France, Francis de Presence, Paul Violet, Gustave Rouenet, Pierre Mia, Felicien Chalai, and others are fighting not only for the fair fame of their country, but, as we are fighting here, for the preservation of the native races of Central Africa, for the salvation of the African tropics from the destructive blight of Leopoldian precept and example. That great man, de Braza, seeing with his own eyes the result of imitating Leopoldian methods in the French Congo, whither he had been sent on a mission of investigation by his government, had determined to consecrate the rest of his life to opening the eyes of the French people, and fighting the modern slave trade. Death has robbed us of him, but his memoirs remain. May Madame de Braza be inspired to give them to the world. End of section 16. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. Section 17 of Red Rubber The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Red Rubber, The Story of the Rubber Slave Trade on the Congo, by Edmund Dene Morel. Section 17. The Duty. Thou. Did King Leopold know that the concomitants to the enormous revenues he has been drawing from the labor of the Congo races were the misery, degradation, enslavement, and partial extermination of those peoples? Does the question require an answer, rather than the answer these pages apply? Remember that power has been and is vested in him alone, that power is absolute, 
all controlling and directing that his congo staff in brussels is not composed of responsible officials but of men whom he himself has selected and keeps upon it revocable at his will and pleasure answerable to him alone paid out of his african revenues men to whom no initiative is allowed who are there to do his bidding whose position is wholly dependent upon a slavish submission to his commands remember that these men if responsibility be shifted from the royal shoulders on to theirs stand condemned on the face of the report of his own commission stand condemned at the bar of civilization of having directed for fifteen years from their offices in brussels a vast system of criminal oppression the like of which the world has never seen remember that if the royal master was ignorant of their misdeeds they have betrayed and disgraced him before the universe they have bespattered the royal robe with blood they have branded the royal name with infamy they have been wicked servants and their offence is the greater since he has profited from it largely profited profited beyond the dreams of avarice remember that he has retained them in office and that a minister of great britain to the european country over which he rules as constitutional monarch has still to conduct diplomatic negotiations through them on behalf of the government of his britannic majesty remember that his congo staff in africa does but apply and carry out the instructions it receives from brussels and that the governor-general is his mandatory remember that fourteen years ago he by secret decree the contents of which were unknown until years later gave to that staff a command which was to regulate their whole conduct to be the motive force directing them their paramount duty and their first consideration and that command was to raise revenue remember that for eleven years out of those fourteen the natives were by force compelled to provide this revenue illegally with no limitation as to quantity or time and that members of his staff received in various forms commission proportionate to the revenue they secured remember that in the eleventh year when revelations increased and multiplied every day this raising of revenue by force was for the first time legalized but limited by law in such a way as to provide that no native should be called upon to labor for the royal majesty in brussels at the utmost more than forty hours per month or sixty days per annum remember that three months after the promulgation or this legal decision which had then become the law of the country the king's mandatory in africa issued a private circular to the local staff to the effect that the revenues under this new law which restricted to a fixed duration of time demands that for the eleven preceding years had been unrestricted and unlimited should not only be maintained at their previous figure but should show constant progression and that one year after the new law had come into operation november december nineteen o four the natives were being requisitioned by force to the raising of revenue for a minimum of three hundred days in the year remember that from this supreme illegality sprang acts all of them equally illegal according to the laws of the country propounded for the ostensible purpose of protecting the native against outrage which the supreme illegality rendered habitual and inevitable such as armed expeditions illegally sent against native communities unwilling or unable to supply revenue in quantities considered requisite by the local members of the royal staff who received a commission on that revenue the seizure of men and women and their illegal retention in hostage houses and so on remember that all this while if data on the abominations committed under this illegal system for raising revenue in accordance with the king's command were accumulating in the mission stations they were also accumulating in the official records and in the public prosecutor's office which is supervised by the king's mandatory and that the king's commissioners have declared that the material for the affirmations their report contains and for the conclusions at which they arrived was supplied not so much from the evidence placed before them by european and native witnesses 
as from the examination of these official records. Remember that no members of the King's executive staff in Africa have been prosecuted or even dismissed the royal service, but on the contrary have been honored, promoted, and remunerated. Let those who, from motives unquestionably good in the eyes of the men who hold them, motives made up of traditions and a general trend of ideas that have so much to recommend them in ordinary cases, seek some loophole of escape from a grim logic which will not be gainsaid, and find it in sinning concessionaire companies. Let them remember who these concessionaires are, and what these companies are farmers of a portion of the royal revenues, organizations created and operating under the King's African Code of Laws, subjected to no control from the machinery of a European judicature. Let them remember that the men on the councils of the headquarters of these concerns are the King's Congo bodyguard, that all these years they have acted in the closest partnership with him, officers of his privy purse, functionaries at his european court bankers ever obsequious to the royal call let them remember that these men still bask in the royal smile these companies still operate the king's steamers still convey to their agents in africa the rifle and cap gun the cases of cartridge caps and loads by which means they stimulate for themselves and for the king the rubber output like the Brussels executive staff, like the Congo executive staff, the so-called concessionaires, the titled partners in guilt, the financial vampires in co-equal infamy, the beneficiaries from uniformity in outrage remain. The handwriting is on the wall. It blazes forth in letters of fire. They will burn through the ages unquenchable, ineffaceable, a transcendental testimony to the possibilities of individual crime, a supreme warning to mankind, and in the dim hereafter those who read them with happier hearts and in happier times will recollect that their message it was which pronounced the final judgment upon autocratic rule in the world of men. End of section 17. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, interfaceaudio.com. Section 18 of Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greta Bui. Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade on the Congo by Edmund Dean Morrell. Section 18. 2. Reform My rights on the Congo are indivisible. None possess any right of intervention. Such is King Leopold's answer to the protest of civilization. The tenor of he who makes that answer is so precarious that he has thought well to accompany such declarations with a series of decrees addressed to his Brussels staff, elaborating a number of reforms. Those reforms are left to the Congo staff to execute after having been drawn up by the Brussels staff. The future destinies of the Congo natives are committed to the same hands which have dealt so gently with them in the past. Reforms, the need for which the Brussels staff has always rejected, because it always denied the existence of factors requiring that attention which the commission or inquiry urgently called for, are conceded in theory, just as they were conceded in theory ten years ago by the creation of the Commission for the Protection of the Natives and the perfecting of the Organization of Justice and observe in what manner they are issued to a wandering world. We, that is, the most obedient servants of His Majesty's Brussels staff, have the honor to submit for the approval of Your Majesty 
the legislative and administrative measures which appear to us of a nature to continue the realization of the program which the King's Sovereign has been pursuing for more than a quarter of a century in Central Africa, at the price of his constant efforts and personal sacrifice. How true indeed! For the items in the program of this Leopoldian civilization remain not only unaltered, but accentuated, reaffirmed, in tones unmistakable, breathing an arrogance born of long immunity in wrongdoing. The interpretation of sovereignty to mean personal possession of an international trusteeship converted into private property, of African production for the pursuance of alien aims, of power absolute, unchecked, unfettered, uncontrolled, indivisible, setting itself beyond and above the law of nations. All this is emphasized in the Royal Manifesto. The personal sacrifice is exemplified by a tightening of the grip upon the revenues from the Domaine de la Couronne and Domaine Privé, while modesty still demands that the extent of the sacrifice should be withheld, in other words, that the amount of those revenues should still be wrapped in mystery as unfathomable as the regenerator of Africa can make it. Any outside interference in such matters partakes of the character of positive usurpation. The realization of the program will be fulfilled with the most immutable patriotism and in perfect harmony with my immutable will. That form does atonement take. After this, is it necessary to examine those reforms? The produce of the soil of Central Africa still belongs to the king. Hence, too, the labor of the African without which the former is unobtainable. But the native will only be taxed in strict conformity with legality. The royal profits derived from pillage, perennial outrage, and endemic oppression have been stupendous but insufficient, as we have seen, to provide for the feeding of native witnesses whose attendance is required at Boma, the chief directing center of the king's African estate. So, too, more officers will be drafted into the king's African army to secure the effective control of the troops, but only when the revenue permits of it. And free inspectors shall be specially appointed to ensure a just relationship between European and natives in a country 800,000 square miles in extent as a preliminary to securing a more complete administrative and judicial organization which alas is only possible through an increase in the revenue of the state the law we have been told of all time protects the freedom of the native by forbidding any interference with the freedom of business transactions and we are now informed that this principle remains unimpaired who could have doubted it since the only articles on the Congo which can give rise to business transactions are the private property of the absentee landlord in Europe? Have we not been told also that the state has been at much pains to protect the natives from being robbed? The native is only required to work 40 hours per month for the absentee landlord and his partners. Let the reader peruse once more the preceding chapter. In the last seven years, King Leopold's African estate has produced 11 million pounds sterling of India rubber by claiming the labor of the African natives from the rising of the sun to the setting thereof and enforcing that claim via armies and the king's mandatory has declared that the amount must be increased under a law which demands of the native not every day in every year but only sixty days if this law were applied the revenues would decrease by four-fifths and i am afraid that not only with the effective control 
or the king's African army, to say nothing of the more complete administrative and judicial organization, be delayed ad infinitum, but the native witnesses in criminal cases would need to go wholly unfed and, still more terrible to contemplate, the next check for the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine might conceivably become overdue, while the chances of fruitful speculation in rubber shares on the Antwerp Bourse would be inconveniently curtailed. Personal sacrifice would clearly be too onerous a moral asset on such terms. End of section 18. Recording by Greta Bui.